When most people think about a haunted place, they imagine a house or abandoned building. But I believe that whole areas can be hotspots for paranormal activity. For me, it would be the land lying to the east of Snowflake, Arizona, and west of Concho, Arizona. Along the old Concho Highway, the landscape is that of red rock sandstone ridges and red sand. Ancient Anasazi ruins are numerous along the bluffs. Echoes of time when land wasn't so arid and dry. Gnarled and twisted cedars dot the land along the large dry washes where sparse groves of cottonwoods grow. My grandparents owned 80 acres of land, about 20 miles east of Snowflake. The locals in Snowflake refer to this area as Out East. My grandparents' mobile home sat on top of a slow-rising hill. About a mile south at the bottom of the hill, my aunt and uncle had built a three-level home where they lived with their two sons and two daughters. The house was a neat layout. From the front, it only looked two stories, but at the back, due to the slope of the hill, the basement was visible. A large wooden deck surrounded the middle section of the home. The home faced the west, and to the east, the hill slowly descended into a wash. From the back deck, there were views of the Zuni Holy Mountain and Little Colorado River Valley near St. John's, Arizona. This story is the account of the terrifying experience my older cousin Sam endured in the summer of 1991. It was late June. Sam was 17. While most people his age were enjoying their summer vacation, Sam was not. He had attended a huge graduation party and gotten drunk as a skunk. Unfortunately for him, the sheriff's department had also attended the party and he had received an underage consumption ticket, probation, a severe tongue lashing and a summer grounding. His mum even took the keys to his pickup he had worked all last summer to buy. There he was, stuck in the middle of the boonies. He had kept pretty busy though, helping out our grandparents who lived up on the hill. After coming home in the late afternoon, he noticed that their neighbour Jeff, from about five miles to the west, had stopped to visit with his dad. Bill. Jeff was one of those hippie guys. He was cool and all, but everyone suspected he probably partook in a little too much LSD in the 70s. Jeff had a place on top of the bluff, which ran adjacent to Stoddard's house. Bill and Jeff were on the porch bullshitting when Sam walked up. He said hello to Jeff, and Jeff asked him, if Sam would want to help him with a project on his property. He said he'd pay him a couple of hundred bucks for a week or two's worth of work, and Sam agreed. Some party money for when his parents left town next week for their trip to Nebraska with our grandparents. The next morning, Bill gave Sam his keys back so that he could drive over to Jeff's place. When he arrived, Jeff was loading up shovels and equipment into his truck. Sam hadn't asked what they were going to be doing, but assumed after seeing the shovels, they were probably going to be replacing fence posts. Jeff told him to hop into the truck, and they headed to the north, along the top of the bluff on a barely visible two-road dirt track. The top of the bluff had a good view of the surrounding area. You could see the outskirts of Snowflake, and the big dry wash dotted the cottonwoods to the west. The white mountains dominated the horizon to the south. To the north, 
mesas near Hellbrook were visible. To the east were a little valley along a smaller wash. He could make out the roof of Stoddard's house. Stoddard's house, the thought, sent a shiver down his spine and gave him goosebumps. He pushed the stories of what happened there to the back of his mind. They went around a small sandstone alcove, and Jeff stopped the truck. In front of them was a large ruin. Sam had grown up out east, and had seen many Anasazi ruins. It looked like a large pile of loose sandstone. But a closer look revealed pottery shards everywhere, like almost all of the ruins. This one had large holes where someone had used a backhoe to find pots at some time. Sam got an uneasy feeling. Jeff must have seen his face, because Sam said that he started explaining that his project was to excavate the ruin. He had a grand plan, that he was going to excavate the ruin and open a museum on his property of whatever items they found. He'd charge people about $5 to come and check it out. Sam argued that wasn't digging in ruins illegal, and Jeff told him, not if you own the property, it's son. Sam felt even more uncomfortable. What about angering spirits? Jeff laughed at this. Are you referring to Stoddard's place? Sam nodded. Don't get me wrong, Sam. Your aunt and grandma are nice, honest people but I didn't think it was Indian spirits. I think they heard rumors in town about what happened to Stoddard and they freaked themselves out. Besides, he said, this isn't a burial. There are no bodies here. Sam says now he should have listened to the feeling telling him to leave, but he said he brushed it off and started shoveling. Around noon, Jeff headed over to his house to make Sam and him some lunch. Sam stayed at the ruin. He said he didn't really think much about it at the time, but he noticed it was extremely silent around the ruin. There were no signs or sounds of birds, even no cicadas, which usually around this time of year never shut up. He said on the wind he swore he could hear faint voices but chalked it up to being freaked out by Stoddard's place, being only about a mile away. When Jeff returned with their sandwiches, he also brought a camera, so that they could document their progress and put the photos in the museum. Jeff had Sam take pictures of him in the room that they had cleared out and with the items. So they worked for a week. They weren't making much progress. They hadn't found a lot, a small pot, some beads, and half a matami. Sam was happy to have a day off. All during the week, he had fought the feeling that something bad was going to happen. He was glad to get away from the ruins for a while. He also hadn't been sleeping well. He dreamt one night that his bed had been shaking. After a pretty uneventful weekend, Sam returned to Jeff's house Monday morning. To his surprise, there was a backhoe parked in his driveway. Another neighbour had loaned it to Jeff. Jeff was excited, because now they could make more progress. They made a lot of progress. They uncovered three to four rooms and found some more artefacts. Tuesday and Wednesday go by the same. More rooms, more artefacts, all the while snapping pictures. After filling four rolls of film, Jeff takes them to town to be developed. This was way before camera phones and digital cameras, where it took about 10 days to get your pictures developed, by the way. It was now Thursday. They had come across a pretty large room in the Pueblo. In the middle is a large block of sandstone. This piqued Jeff's curiosity. The rest of the sandstone they had come across was small. Using the backhoe, he moved the sandstone to the side. There was a black hole beneath. Something about that black hole 
made Sam's stomach knot. Jeff was extremely excited. He looked into the hole, but was unable to make anything out. He grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the hole. It's another room, Jeff exclaimed. Sam didn't want to look. Something about that opening made his skin crawl. Jeff told Sam to run and grab a ladder. He did as he was told, hoping Jeff wasn't going to ask him to go in there. Thunder rolled in the distance as he headed back to the ruin. Monsoon clouds were building up in the south, and the wind had picked up. Jeff put the ladder down into the opening. Sam asked him if it was safe, and Jeff figured that since the room had been filled with dirt, and the giant slab of sandstone for a thousand years, he didn't reckon the roof would collapse now. Jeff descended the ladder with a flashlight. Holy shit, he heard Jeff exclaim. He called to Sam, who slowly made his way over. Bring the camera and come down. Sam felt terror grip him. He really didn't want to go back down there, but he also didn't want Jeff to think he was a chicken shit either. He grabbed the camera and descended into the black pit. At first, he couldn't see anything. It's black, very black. And then he saw the beam of Jeff's flashlight shining on a large corrugated pot. Even with the sunlight coming down the opening, it wasn't able to penetrate the darkness. Finally, it dawned upon Sam that the walls and floors were black, the air was stale, and it smelled strongly of soot. Jeff was excitedly moving around the room to see all the treasures it held. A long roll of thunder boomed in the distance. Start taking pictures, Jeff exclaimed, annoyed that Sam was just standing there. Make sure the flash is on. Sam began to snap photos. The flash illuminated the room briefly, and after about the third photo, Sam caught a glimpse of something that made him jump. A human skull. Heat pounding in his chest, he squeaked out, Jeff, there's a skull. Jeff, busily looking over there, didn't hear him. He snapped another photo just to be sure. Yep, definitely a skull. But he still didn't get heard. So Sam said louder, Jeff, there's a skull. What? Oh yeah, a skull. There's a few of them down here. Looks like there was a fire in this room. He kicked one across the room towards Sam. And Sam jumped. What the hell, man? Sam said, his fear turning into anger. Dude, this isn't right. You shouldn't be messing with bodies. We need to call the cops or something. Jeff laughed. Call the cops? And tell them what? We found a bunch of thousand-year-old dead Indians? Sam was now really pissed. Listen, Jeff, if you want to mess around with this stuff, be my guest. I'm done. There's something bad about this place and I'm leaving. Again, Jeff laughed. You're scared of a bunch of bones? Whatever, man, go. I'm not paying your ass to be a crybaby. Sam tossed Jeff's camera to the ground and climbed up the ladder and Jeff started cussing at the broken camera. Sam didn't care, though he started walking back to Jeff's house where his truck was parked. The wind was blowing pretty hard now. Black clouds covered the sun. Sam now saw flashes of lightning, along with the thunder. When he arrived home, he remembered that my aunt and uncle had left along with his sisters on their trip to Nebraska. His older brother Zach was also gone at work at Pizza Hut for the evening. He was tired. He lay down on the couch and fell asleep trying not to think about the black room full of bones. A loud crack of thunder shook the house and jolted Sam awake. The house was dark. He fumbled his way to the light switch and flipped it on. Nothing. A flash of lightning illuminated the room. Damn, the storm must have knocked the power out. The wind was howling outside. He fumbled around in the closet until he found the lantern, 
and lit it. He still felt extremely creeped out, so he went up to his bedroom where he had a joint stashed. He figured if he smoked it, it would help with his nerves. His bedroom faces the driveway. He opens up his window and goes to light the joint. A flash of lightning and something darts across the driveway and his heart skips a beat. The dogs start barking. He puts down the joint and closes the window. He feels terror gnawing at his gut. What the hell was that? He goes downstairs as a precaution and locks the front sliding door. He hears heavy footsteps running across the porch. Now he goes into full on panic mode. Shit, the side door. He bolts across the living room and trips over a chair. The dogs are freaking out, growling and barking. He catches a glimpse of something run by the living room window, illuminated by the flash of lightning. He gets to the door, fumbling at the lock. Whatever is outside has a hold of the knob. It starts to turn. He slams the deadbolt, locked. Shit, the basement sliding glass door. He bolts down the stairs. He makes it to the door, finding it already locked. Phew. Another lightning bolt. In the flash, he sees the silhouette of what he thinks is a man, covered with fur, with a coyote skin draped over his head. Red eyes, shining from the darkness where his face should be, standing at the edge of the yard. It's very tall. Looking into those red shining eyes, his breath caught in his throat. Panic wells up in him. Scrabbling, he falls backwards, knocking his head on a table. Crying, he gets up to his feet and bolts upstairs to the phone. Call 911. Call 911. His heart is hammering into his brain. He picks up the phone. Nothing. A large thud coming from the roof shakes him from his despair. The thing is on the roof. Shit. Gun. Gun. That comes to mind. He bolts to his parents' bedroom, where they keep a shotgun in the closet. The dogs bound in after him. It begins to start pouring rain. He can still hear the footsteps on the roof. He locks the door behind him. He's going into the closet, and the dogs follow him. He finds the shotgun his hands shaking like crazy, and he loads it. The dogs are quiet. He can't hear anything coming from the roof anymore. Where the hell is it? In the house? He sits in the closet and waits. The dogs huddled around him. What seems like an hour passes, and nothing but the distant boom of thunder as the storm marches on. He begins to calm down a bit in shock. At this point, the storm has rolled to the north. Suddenly, he hears the door rattling. Bang, bang. It's beating on the door. Boom. The shotgun goes off, blowing a hole in the closet ceiling. And someone's screaming. Don't shoot! He hears his brother Zack scream. Tears run down Sam's face. He drops the gun and runs to the door, unlocking it almost knocking over his brother. Zack is pissed. What the hell, man? Why are you shooting at me? Sam is in a daze. The story of what happened earlier in that day, and this evening, spews out of him. Zack listens, not saying a word. At the end, Zack asks him, Okay, Sam, what did you smoke? Nothing. I'm not high, bro. Zack laughs at him. Okay, but mum is going to be pissed. Not only because you blew a huge hole in their closet, but also all the mud tracks all over the place. You better get it cleaned up. What mud? And how did Zack get in? The house was locked. He asked Zack, and Zack tells him that the sliding glass door was wide open. The electricity had come back on at some point while he was in the closet. True to what Zack said, there were red mud bare footprints around the house. It wasn't him.
he showed Zack his shoes, bare feet, and that the prints were way larger than his feet. David agreed. I bet it was Jeff, Zack concluded. He probably came over to mess with you because he's pissed you quit and busted his camera. He knew you were freaked out, so he thought he'd mess with you. Sam wasn't sure, but it made him feel slightly better. Yeah, he tells himself. Jeff, that asshole. I must not have got the latch to the sliding door closed. The noise on the roof must have been the wind blowing shingles off the roof. It began to all make sense. He and Zack drank a couple of beers that their dad had left in the fridge. They cleaned the mud to the best of their abilities. And after getting buzzed, they decided that they were going to go over in the morning and confront Jeff. Zack says he needed to pay Sam. An extra, since they now needed to rent a carpet shampooer to clean the mess that Jeff made. Finally, they decide to go into town. One of their friends is throwing a party. I don't think either one of them wanted to stay out there. The party is one that's out in the boonies, with a big bonfire. There are about 20 teens there. Sam is having a hard time enjoying the party. He keeps feeling like something is watching him. The beer isn't tasting good, and he's not really socialising with his friends. They ask him what's wrong, but he just says he's tired. The full moon is rising to the east, casting its eerie light in the sandstone bluffs and cedars. Sam gazes past the firelight and catches a glimpse of something moving just out of the reach of the firelight. It moves behind a bush. Must be someone peeing, he thinks to himself. But his gut is disagreeing. Suddenly a strange throaty howl pierces the night. Sam jumps. He looks around, but no one else seems to have heard anything. They continue laughing and talking. He now hears heaving footprints behind him. He turns to see a large figure of a man standing just outside the firelight. He is paralyzed with fear. The man's face is hidden in shadow, but Sam can feel his eyes piercing him. He closes his eyes and starts whispering a prayer under his breath. When he has the courage to open his eyes, the man is gone. He's pretty freaked out at this point and just wants to get out of there and he tells Zack he's going home. Zack decides to stay. Sam doesn't really want to go home, and he also doesn't want to go back to the party. Mind racing, he heads down east to the old Concho Highway. Surely, he thinks to himself, he is just freaking himself out. Jeff came over and scared him, and that person at the party was probably just someone who was out there peeing. Yeah, makes sense. He notices something run across the highway. It's about 2am, so the highway is deserted. He slows down, thinking it must have been a deer. Crash! Something hits the back of his truck, jerking it forward. What the hell? He slams on the brakes, looking in the rearview mirror. He catches a glimpse of shining eyes. He is in full panic mode. He stomps on the gas. Sheer terror engulfs him. Too afraid to look back, he sees something out of the corner of his eye. He turns to look, and sees a man running next to the truck. He looks at the speed. 70. He looks again, and now the coyote-type creature is looking at him. At first, his face is shrouded in blackness, and then he said it transformed before his eyes. The only way he could describe it was that of a demon. Large red eyes, and a twisted smile showing long sharp teeth. It threw back its head and laughed. It took a long clawed hand, and scratched along the truck as it sped past, and disappeared into the darkness. So this, is what I remember. We lived about two hours away from Snowflake. I'm seven years old in my bed. At 3am, our family is awakened by someone pounding on the door. Of course, this wakes up everyone, including us kids, as we watch as my dad opens the door to see my cousin Sam. 
he's white as a ghost, shaking and crying. My parents, pretty damn startled, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. He starts babbling about demons chasing him, and my mum sends us back to bed. The next day, my dad calls another her friend, and they take him somewhere near Saunders to see a medicine man. After they return, Sam stayed with us until his parents returned from Nebraska. When he finally goes home, he never sees anything again. Years later, when I was older, and we became closer, I asked him what happened that night, the one that he'd shown up at the house, and he reluctantly told me. I later asked my parents about it, and they confirmed the same story he had told them, minus one final part. So the morning that Sam showed up at our house, Zack and his older brother went to Jeff's house to collect Sam's money. When he got there, Jeff wasn't there. The door to the house was wide open. The inside was trashed. Furniture was overturned and broken. Jeff ended up being gone for about six months. Everyone wondered where he had gone to. No one really knew anything about his family, just that they were from the Midwest. At one point, my grandma filed a missing persons report with the sheriff's office, but later the sheriff informed her that Jeff was back east. When he does finally return, he is gaunt and looks like he's aged about 20 years. Everyone wonders if it was the drugs. Fast forward to five or six years. My grandparents invite Jeff to Thanksgiving at their home. Sam has graduated and long since moved away but he is up for Thanksgiving. Jeff asks Sam to come to his truck because he has something to show him. Sam agrees. Jeff hands him a stack of photos. They are the pictures they had taken while excavating the ruins. Sam flicks through, not really wanting to think of what happened back then. In the last few years, he convinced himself it was just a bunch of coincidences and he freaked himself out over them. Jeff unhappily tells Sam to look at the pictures closer. Sam does. At first, he doesn't notice anything, but then he notices in the shadows on the picture, there are figures, small, twisted, and evil, with the same face of the demon that was chasing him. Jeff apologizes to Sam, but he says that he had to make sure he wasn't crazy. He tells Sam that in the six months he was gone, he was hunted by this thing. It followed him all the way to Oklahoma. Finally, he sought the help of a medicine man. He returned the artifacts back to fill the ruin, and Sam said he didn't know what happened to the photos, and he didn't want to know. I am 23 now, and the time that this occurred was my first summer out of high school. And me and my three friends, fresh off their freshman year of college, decided to live together. One of my friends, my best friend for years, Earl, had a long-time girlfriend whose father owned the property. It was a decently sized plot of land with several old cabins on it, their house, which was large and out in the back of the woods, and a few other scattered buildings. I think it used to be a campground before he bought it to live on it and run his business out of it. We live in southern Maine, and the property is heavily wooded. Pine Tree State for the win. The house that we lived in was at the very front of the property right on the road. The owner's house was at the very rear and could only be accessed by a dirt road with two ditches on the side. A one-minute walk towards the woods from our front house was a small little cabin across a clearing, and it was furnished and powered. In the house was me, Earl, John, and Chuck. We all had some different girls and girlfriend pals and partied through the summer. We would frequently come here to the cabin and the owner's house before moving in. Anyway, enough with the scene setting. Some of this story is from word of mouth from the others living in the home, but we have all been friends a long time, and I trust them implicitly. 
and I witnessed enough myself to know that this all lined up. So, the first encounter was at the very beginning of summer, before we even moved in. It was evening and dark, and everyone was at the owner's house watching a movie. As I slowly drive my car down the dirt path to the owners, something white and large in size ran in front of my car. It was a blur. It was too fast to really catch what it was. But being in the woods, I assumed it was some kind of albino fox. I shrugged it off and made my way to the house. A week later, we were all situated and moved into the front home by the street and things were great. I'll admit the front area of the property was spooky, despite being the most open and least wooded. The owner's mother had lived in our house and died years ago. We could see an old statue of Mother Mary off in the woods that was always kind of sketchy. Across the street was a small independent tire shop with a small dirt lot. Only thing in the house when we moved in was some kind of antique cheetah statue, which appeared to be from the 60s, tall and skinny in a sitting position, and went up to mid waist. So we put it in the corner of the hallway, thought it was neat and retro. For a few weeks, all was normal. Admittedly, some friends experimented with some different substances, like LSD and salvia once or twice, paired with the normals like drinking. I do not believe this impacted what happened though. We have some parties, invite girls over for some fun, jam out on the guitars in the cabin. It was a great time. But things slowly became tense and went downhill. A lot happens, and I believe that they are all connected, even though they seem disjointed and random. After a few weeks of fun, Earl had developed crippling insomnia due to some tooth pain that unfortunately he could not afford to fix. He would clock maybe one hour of sleep per night and slowly became more and more irritable, but nothing too serious. One night, John and Earl and some of their friends, who we will call Don, are out back in the cabin. They had done some slight drinking, but John was a straight edge who never touches anything of any kind. Earl is playing on his guitar and singing some of our original tunes. This portion of the story, until I came into play, is recanted by John. During the night, our fourth roommate Chuck is asleep in bed, while I'm in my room, as Earl plays his guitar, and he says to Don, Wow man, those are some great harmonies you're doing, since when can you sing? Don looks a little confused and tells Earl that he wasn't singing along. Earl starts singing again, but stops when he hears the harmonies a second time. He thought his ears were tricking him, but John and Don had heard them too. They put the guitar down and decide to investigate. They walked through the clearing briefly, startled by Mother Mary in the woods, until they reach the front of the road. From across the street, they see the biggest white cat they'd ever seen. Not just a cat but the size of a larger dog or mountain lion. They scramble to try and get a video with their phones, at which point I see them out the window and run down to meet them. As I hit the yard, I'm just stunned as they are and see this giant white bobcat sitting on a hill across the tire shop. It's massive, about the size of a German shepherd, but something was wrong, its tail. It had a gross, nasty, fleshy tail, as if it had the tail of a rat. It's long, so I can't see all of it, but it's definitely proportionally wrong and way longer than a normal cat, let alone fleshy and bald. Don picks up a rock and throws it at it. I kid you not, all four of us, too fully sober, watching this thing stand up on its hind legs and calmly walk into the woods, dragging its tail behind us, and we book it inside. Earl is more sleepless than normal, trying to drink himself to sleep. He is successful and Don does the same. 
I don't remember how John and I fell asleep that night. Every creak of the house petrified me. The next morning, we wake Chuck up and thoroughly scare him. We're all kind of on edge for the rest of the day, but with the sun out, the fun starts back up and we put it to the back of our minds. Today, Earl confides in me about his lack of sleep and how he does not expect this experience to help. Night comes again and everyone decides to have a low key evening after all the excitement from the evening prior. That evening, Chuck suffers from his first and only night terror of his life. He's awake in his bed, and he's in some kind of paralysis, and he hears the growls slash snarls slash screams of a cougar type creature or bobcat as a giant white mass runs across the doorway of his room. He slowly regains movement and comes into my room to tell me what happened. He doesn't sleep for the rest of the night. And the next morning, we bring the cheetah statue into the cabin from across the clearing. For another few weeks, nothing tremendous happens. We continue to be on edge and Earl slips a little further, but things are slowly getting better. I do a little research about what we've seen, cryptozoology, demons and monsters. Finally, I make a breakthrough. I find an article, nothing big, from an old book about main urban legends. The book was from a while ago and described something called the Ding Ball Cougar or Plunkus. It just sounds better as Plunkus. Anyway, I said Ding Ball was a cougar whose last tail joint was ball shaped and bare of hair and flesh. Ding Ball was fond of human flesh and would sing with a human voice to lure the incautious out of their cabins at night, where it waited in the dark to crack their skulls with its tail. My heart stopped as I read this, because it matched so well with our experience. Mind you, it said nothing of walking on its hind legs or being white, but the similarities still shocked me, and I kept this info on my chest for a while. A few days later, Earl's insomnia came to a head. It would be about 10pm and I laid in bed before I heard a massive crash. From the audible vantage point I was at, it sounded like someone had fallen down the stairs. I rushed into the hallway as Earl came from his room and I yelled, what the hell was that? Earl turned to me and raised his fist and said, shut up man, and ran down the stairs. I sat in my room for a minute confused, and after about 20 minutes I went to my car and drove to my parents to spend the night. I stayed the rest of the day with my parents too. That night, Earl called me to apologize. The crashing had come from his room where he had angrily kicked a chair due to oral pain. And when I came out, he thought I was angrily yelling, what the hell was that, to him. We made up on the phone, and then he asked me something peculiar. Hey man, did you come home today at all? No, why? He explained that he was the last one out so he had to lock the doors, as we had been for about two weeks since we all started freaking out. Earl had the only key. Okay, and? I asked. He sounded a little scared when he said this. The cheetah statue was on top of Chuck's bed. I told him not to touch it. Even later that night, when I got back to the house, Chuck's room was closed, and we went and took a look. The cheetah had been placed in the center of Chuck's bed, standing up. He had a lumpy mattress, and the fact that it had stood so straight was impressive and unnatural. It was not leaning, tilted, or anything. As soon as I touched it, it fell over and the next day I took it and hid it somewhere no one else could bother to look for it. In one of the older cabins, where they only use for storage. The thing is, the next night, it was back in Chuck's room. The bed was made up neatly, and the cheetah was placed under the blankets with its head out, as if it were taking a nap. We burned the statue the next day. I wish I could say that solved everything, but it didn't. 
Over the next few weeks, we continue to be stalked by white blurs in the corner of our vision, the rustling of leaves, and the occasional faint whisper of singing in the distance. At one point, the Mother Mary statue was even turned backwards, no longer facing the home. I'm not sure when, but we only noticed at this point. A few days passed and summer was up, and we all left. We still visit different spots of the property, but avoid that house. We hear the occasional rustle, but we don't watch for colour anymore, because we don't want to see the white blur. After all this, I don't know what the Plunkus is. A beast? A spirit? A demon? All of them? All I know is that Earl never got his tooth fixed. The pain just went away. Chuck has never had a night terror since, and I know that it's still there. And I remember how old and mysterious my state still is. Hell, Stephen King loves it for a reason, right? This story didn't happen to me, but I heard it many times when I was growing up. My grandparents owned 80 acres about 20 miles east of Snowflake, Arizona. They had moved to the land in the early 80s, after my grandfather had retired from the mine in San Miguel, Arizona. The land was pretty barren. I don't know why they chose to buy it. Red sandstone bluffs and dry wash cuts across the landscape, dotted with juniper and cedar trees and red sand everywhere. I suppose at the time, the land was cheap. They didn't have close neighbours. The closest was about a mile away, which was my aunt and uncle. The next closest neighbour was a man named Stoddard. I never got his first name, just Stoddard. He lived about four miles away from my grandparents, at the base of one of the sandstone bluffs. He was an asshole rancher, from what my grandparents said. He thought that he owned everything, and was entitled to do whatever he wanted. More than once, my grandpa had caught Stoddard cutting my grandfather's barbed wire fence to let his cattle onto my grandpa's land to graze. Now, this area is full of ancient Anasazi Pueblo ruins. Most of them have been destroyed by ranchers with backhoes trying to find pots to sell. I'm sure Stoddard was one of them. So the story goes one day, after losing a calf, Stoddard stumbles upon a cave sealed by a giant slab of sandstone against one of the sides of the bluff. Curious about it, he used a backhoe to remove the boulder. After going inside, he discovers it's an Anasazi burial cave. I'm sure he was delighted. He starts taking things from the burial cave and selling them. Well, from that moment on, he had some pretty shitty luck. First, he lost about a half a million dollars on the stock market. Then his cattle all got diseased and died. In financial ruin, he gets another blow, and his wife is diagnosed with an extremely rare disease, and dies. Then Stoddard gets thrown from his horse, and loses the ability to walk. This all happens within a couple of years. He tells everyone he knows that he's cursed from the Anasazi burial. They laugh it off. Stoddard puts all the artifacts back, and he seals the cave with the boulder. He abandons all his belongings and leaves one night. This is late in the 1980s. Fast forward a couple of years since Stoddard abandoned his ranch house. The land and house are bought by a man from California. He puts the ranch house up for rent. My aunt is pregnant with her first son, and decides to move from San Miguel to Snowflake to be closer to her parents. Stoddard's house is fully furnished, and so my aunt and her husband move on in. He finds a job working nights at the local paper mill. 
It is very creepy out there at night. At first it seems like a nice little place. Creepy at night, but not too bad. Then weird stuff starts happening. My aunt starts hearing faint chanting and drums at night. She brushed it off. She had a hippie neighbor that lived about a mile away on the bluff, so she figures it must be them doing hippie stuff. But she can't help but feel like someone, or something, is always watching her all the time. She starts having nightmares every night, but chalks it up to being alone and hormones. She finally tells my grandpa about it, and he loans her his dog to keep her company at night. She drives the dog out there, and he refuses to get out of the truck. The hair on his back, straight up and growling. She gets freaked out, but figures maybe he saw a rabbit or something and hauls him into the house. The dog just stares at the door and growls. That night, he growls and barks all night. The drums and chanting are louder. The next morning, my aunt finds human bare feet footprints around the house. So this goes on for about a week. The dog barks and growls at night. Nightmares when she finally does sleep and footprints in the morning. Then chanting and drums keep getting louder. She finally feels like she's losing her mind. So she asks my grandma to come over and stay the night with her. Grandma is more than happy. After finishing her chores, she heads over planning to make my aunt a nice meal. This is late in the afternoon. My aunt lays down for a nap, comfortable now that my grandmother is there. My grandmother decides to take a little walk at the base of the bluff. My grandma was a very religious person. She was very active in the church and devoted her life to Jesus. As she's out on her little walk, she likes to look for pottery shards or arrowheads. A little way from the house, she gets a very unnerving feeling that something is watching her. She said it made her skin crawl. She could sense something evil. So my grandma prays and walks back to the house, pleading the blood of Christ. She decides not to say anything to my aunt, who is awake because she is already frightened. She tells my aunt, Maybe it's better if they go stay at my grandma's house tonight. My aunt agrees. By the time my aunt gets her stuff together, the sun is about to go down behind the bluff. Grandma, aunt and dog all loaded up into the pickup. Grandma turns the key and nothing. She tries again, nothing. Not being very mechanically minded, Grandma goes into the house to call Grandpa, but he doesn't answer. She remembers he was going into town this afternoon. Dang. They unload and go back into the house, waiting for Grandpa to get home. It's night now. No moon. Pitch dark. The dog begins to low growl, and the sound of chanting and drums begins, faint at first, but growing louder. My grandma begins to pray in between calling grandpa. Remember this is a time before cell phones, and they heard something howl outside. Not a coyote howl, something more ominous and terrifying. Something is moving just beyond the reach of the porch light. Both women are terrified at this point. Finally, after turbo dialing grandpa, he answers. My grandma is frantic. Elvin, something is outside the house. Get here now. For what seems like hours, they wait for Grandpa's truck to come over the hill. Finally, they see the headlights. Before Grandpa flies into the driveway, something runs across the road in front of him. His headlights illuminate an animal, or something. Grandpa jumps out of the truck, yelling for the woman to get the hell in. He unloads a couple of shots in the general vicinity of the animal. They haul ass down the dirt road towards Grandma's house, and my aunt, against her better judgement, looks back to see red eyes watching her. The next day, my grandpa and uncle head over to the house.
Grandpa verified that all around the house, there were bare footprints in the sand, along with very large coyote tracks. Needless to say, my grandma never went back to that house. My aunt won't even talk about it. I made the mistake of staying up too late and listening to the adults talk. My aunt moved in with my grandparents. My grandma swears, though, that she would see those red eyes at night stalking the edge of her property. As far as I know, other people have tried living in Stoddard's house, but leave within a month. The whole area is cursed. I always hated going out there. It's an oppressive evil feeling even at my grandparents. I'm researching and talking to my Native American friends. I'm fairly certain that my family member had a misfortune of running into a skimwalker. According to the Native Americans in the area, they frequent burial grounds and graveyards, looting and desecrating the sites as they take pieces of the brains and bodies and grind them into a corpse powder to use in their curses. They're also known to terrorize people away from areas like burials and ruins. I must preface this with a few things. This encounter is second hand, but was told to me on multiple occasions by the person that experienced it. I am a natural skeptic and cynic, so I can't say that I 100% believe it, but his telling of it was pretty simple yet concise, and did not vary between the retellings. I've known this guy for many years, and his advice and input on just about everything is well reasoned and always helpful. So I'll just try to take his word on it, even if with a grain of salt. So let's get down to business. My friend Marv likes to go solitary camping on occasion, to be at one with nature. He is also an avid gun collector and enthusiast. I don't remember exactly when he said that this took place, but it was a few years back and he decided to go camping on a whim. He packed his gear, a few guns, a hunting rifle, and a .45 sidearm specifically, and headed out into the country onto a vast swatch of property owned by a friend of his. He had full permission in the works. This happened close to the Kisachi National Forest, in south slash central Louisiana. He liked to hike in pretty deep, and camp at specific spots that he found a few trips prior. These details are kind of sparse, as it's not really the meat and potatoes to this encounter. So he made his way in and set up camp in his usual small clearing for the night. Skipping ahead a few hours, it was now late afternoon, when he heard leaves crunching and twigs being stepped on. He assumed it was an animal at first, and got up from cooking something on the fire to try and get a look. He gazed in the direction of the noise, and saw a man approaching through the trees a good many yards away. He has described his etiquette for dealing with other people in very remote places as always being cautious, as more often than not, the people he comes across are armed like him. He tries to stay friendly, but he still keeps his guard up, looking for any ulterior motives, as you can never tell what some folks are up to in the middle of nowhere. He'll make chit chat with them, find out generally what they're up to if he can, and occasionally share a meal. He's never really met anyone nefarious as of yet, other than this situation, and maybe one other, but that's a different ordeal. So one thing that sets off small alarm bells for him is that he knows he's the only one with permission to be on this property. And secondly, this guy is not dressed for the location. He says the guy was wearing a white t-shirt, blue jogging shorts, and white socks and sneakers. Mind you, 
Marv is miles out in the middle of the woods, away from any paths, roadways, houses, or anything really. Nobody is going to casually stroll into his current location dressed like that, unless they are lost or confused. It was early fall, but not quite cool, very normal for Louisiana. So there's a ton of mosquitoes, ticks, and other insects aplenty. You're not going to have most of your skin exposed if you can help it deep in the woods. I know that all too well from personal experience myself. So Marv assumes something might be up and calls out, Hey, do you need help with something? He says it quite loudly, definitely loud enough to be heard. The guy, however, keeps walking, staring directly at him. Marv is starting to get unnerved. And as I said, I know this guy well, and he is as cool as a cucumber in a tense situation. Getting more uneasy, as the guy is closing the distance. He gets to his feet and loudly declares, Hey man, can I help you with something or what? The guy is now 10 to 15 feet away, standing at the edge of the clearing in the forest. The guy looking at Marv dead in the eye speaks and clearly says, Help me. Marv said he was already starting to actually get worried at this point, because he said the way the guy said this was as if something that didn't exactly know how to talk was saying help me. Or at least, that's how he first thought of it. It just didn't sound right. The guy still unmoving says, Help me. Again but this time more emphatic and just really loud. Marv said, this is when he was picking up on what was truly wrong about this. He said the timbre of his voice was more female and actually sounded like a recording being played back and that the guy's lips and mouth movements weren't matching up with the phrase. It was like he was just opening his mouth, emitting the phrase and closing it again. Marv asked, What do you need help with? Not daring to back up or move it whatsoever. The guy still standing motionless was staring directly at him and said, Help me, again, and repeated the phrase another three times slowly, but not louder in volume. Marv, now totally unsure of what the hell is going on, interrupts the guy by barking, All right. You need to go now unless you actually need my help. Do you need my help or not? He continues loudly and firmly in tone. The guy didn't miss a beat and started up with the help me's again and made it as if to take another step in Marv's direction. Marv told me that's when he did the only thing that made sense in the moment and drew his .45 semi-auto pistol and pointed it at the guy telling him that he needed to go. The guy started to get more animated and agitated, actually starting to say the phrase louder over and over, but not stepping closer or backing away. Marv did what he thought was right given his current predicament, assuming he was dealing with an unstable or potentially dangerous individual and discharged a round into the ground in front of the guy. Now this is where it gets crazy. I'm not kidding. As the guy stops uttering the phrase, he goes silent and is still staring at Marv Fallon. He backflips and somersaults into the woods and immediately out of sight. Yes, you heard that right, just like a gymnast. Now I know what you're thinking because I had the same reaction. This sounds completely made up for sure. But Marv gave me no indication of falsehood and told me this on multiple times each time in a dead serious demeanor. Yet, Marv said the guy backflipped away effortlessly, as if pulled by an unseen tension coil. He described it as completely humanly unnatural and totally out of place. The guy had just appeared and repeated the same phrase over and over, eventually almost becoming frantic before Marv shot at the ground, causing him to flee. 
in the most peculiar manner. Marv said he stood there focused on the forest where the guy just flipped into, and saw and heard no further movement. It was like the guy had never been there. He stayed like this as the sun began to set, and the normal night noises crept in. As I mentioned before, Marv is a pretty unshakable fellow, and actually stayed in the area for the night, and next night, before returning with no further incident. When he has told me, and some other friends about this, of course we ask many questions. We prod him to elaborate on the guy's speech sounds. He said the more he thought about it after the incident, the more he was sure it was definitely a female's voice coming from the guy. It was almost like he slash it had heard someone say it, and mimicked it like a parrot, or any other talking bird would. Almost like a lure. He doesn't know what it wanted, and didn't give any indication to follow or utter anything else. It reacted immediately to the gunshot, and you know what follows there. He's been back to the property since, with no other strange occurrences. The only other minute detail that I can think of is that he did remember hearing during the early morning of the first night what sounded like a gunshot off in the distance, and it did sound eerily similar to his .45. He thought he may have heard it again on the hike back. There are people that hunt in the area, and of course it could have just been that, so he couldn't be sure. Since this incident, and one other he had in a completely different location, he did some online research of the whole Kisachi area, and found many legends, stories, and supposed encounters dealing with skimwalkers, and other unnerving bits of Native American folklore in the area. Not to mention, mimics, and other similar supposed creatures. A lot of his encounters line up with these tales, but there's nothing tangible to prove it. But even as a skeptic, it does make me wonder about strange things in the remote, and untouched areas of the world that can't be explained. I'm a big outdoorsman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So of course when I decided to go to college, I had to keep in mind that having some decent woods nearby was a must. Upon checking a couple of places out, I decided to go to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania or just the borough. The biggest plus about going to that university is that my uncle Fred lived up there and was a well known name in the community. He owns to this day, a framing shop right in the middle of the small town area. This was a huge plus since knowing people like that always equals more land to put spots in. That's all I really needed to pick the college I would be going to. Edinburgh is really cool, because there are lots of old buildings and strange flat landscapes, as compared to the hilly land around Pittsburgh. So it was cool to figure out how to scout the game that I'd be going after once the season started. My main hunting area was directly behind my uncle's house. He has a beautiful log cabin that sits back off the road with woods on all sides of it. It was truly a thing of beauty. When he had the house built, he actually had the gigantic chimney made of flat stones that we found in the woods behind the house. As I was scouting the area for the first time, I came up on a few different circles of boulders in the middle of the woods. They were definitely very old. The boulders were quite big, much too big just to be moved there for some reason, like a group of guys came camping out. They must have taken at least 10 men to move, and only if they'd have had some kind of pulley system or something. There were also smaller rocks, and when I say smaller, I'm talking like somewhere around 300 pounds or more, making inner circles inside of the large boulders. I found a total of seven of these stands throughout the property. Some of the rocks that were now part of the chimney 
They simply had to be with the amount of rocks he used on them. Oh, and also these rock circles had made a much larger circle around the woods. After a few more days of scouting with my buddy Brandon, we were sure we had our spot picked out for our first day of archery. We couldn't wait to get out there. Perfect day too. It was great. The thing about Edinburgh is that it gets more snow per year than most of Alaska, due to the lake effect snow coming across Lake Erie. What happens is before the lake freezes completely over, the water which is warmer than the air pushes the clouds way up high into the atmosphere, too high for them to actually snow due to the low temperature all the way up there. The clouds then come inland and fall back towards Earth. It takes them about 20 miles to do this, and Edinburgh is about 20 miles from the lake. You see what I'm saying. Anyway, on the first day of archery, which is in the first week of October in Pennsylvania, there was a thin layer of snow. This is perfect for archery, because you can see deer in the woods much more easily, and you can also see if any animal has left any tracks. If they did, they were fresh, since the snow didn't happen too long before that. In our trees for about two hours or so, neither of us had seen anything. I had just gotten off the radio with Brandon, who was on the other side of the property, when I see some movement over to my right of the pine thicket. I then see a branch move a little bit, and see four deer legs underneath. I readied my bow and my stance, as to make a good clean shot at the deer. Around 15 feet up in a tree, I did this very carefully. About a minute later, as I was looking for any movement, I lost the four legs inside the thicket. This was expected due to the fact that where the deer would have been is a common feeding area for them. So I waited. Maybe another minute or so later, I caught movement again. It looked as if the deer would break through the thicket into more open woods. The movement I've been waiting for. As I brought the bow up into a full drawn stance, I was stunned by what I was seeing. Where the deer should have been, there was a man. A strange man at that. This absolutely should not have been. If there was a man anywhere near where that deer had been, the deer would have been long gone, spooked back into the thicket. I put my bow back down onto the hook that I screwed into the tree, and lifted my binoculars to my eyes. At only 35 yards away, I could now see in great detail his physical appearance. He was rather rotund, with his belly leading the way. A white, long-sleeved shirt, on with ruffles down the middle, just like the pirate shirt in that one episode of Seinfeld, if any of you have indulged. It was tucked into thick canvas brown pants, with pants being tucked into white socks directly below his knees. Further down where his shoes should be, there was absolutely nothing. He had no feet whatsoever, no calves, no shins, no shoes. And with my eyes wide open, I mouthed to myself, what the hell? Instead of walking, he seemed to float through the woods, going from right to left. This is when I started noticing other extremely strange things about him. I looked through the binoculars at his head. It was cocked back with his chin resting down on his lower neck. His very large, red, bulbous nose up in the air. A bit of a snobby overall look. The hair though. It was covered by a wig that judges in England wear. A white wig with three curls on the side of it, where his ears would have been. I noticed that he didn't seem to float through the woods. He was floating through the woods. His arms stayed tucked at his sides, unmoving as he traveled. He also never looked down. The way his head was cocked, he could have only been looking upwards. This is not any person or animal, as they'd be constantly looking down and around for obstacles that you might trip over. 
All of this happened within a period of about 20 seconds. He had come out of the thicket behind a medium sized oak tree. Then when he hit the next oak, he never came out from behind it. I watched in absolute astonishment for another five seconds waiting for him to break his cover so that I could see him again. This never happened. I told Brandon what had just happened and was immediately made fun of. I expected that was what would be coming through the radio after I got done talking. He was just saying I should have taken a picture of the only deer slash human or minotaur remaining in the world. I told him he won't be laughing when the deer tour came over to his tree stand and smacked his ass right out of it. Even though it was in the middle of the hunt, I had to get down and see what the hell just happened. I knew where he would have walked. Not only would I see his footprints in the snow, but it would have also been very easy to see even better tracks due to the fact the area we were in was full of muddy ground. A freaking hummingbird would have left tracks in this muddy mess. As you probably guessed, when I go over to the spot where he had been, there was nothing. I saw not a single track from him, nor deer, nor anything. I was utterly amazed. What happened later that night was just as creepy. So after I was done checking out the muddy snow ground where the man should have left some kind of footprint, I went back to my tree stand and climbed back up to the height that I'd been hunting from earlier. I radioed Brandon and told him I was back up the tree and secure. We always did this as a precaution. In case something happened while we were climbing the tree, or securing the platform of the portable tree stand. My old man's buddy, Bunky, actually saved his left eye from being completely blind and useless. He was practicing shooting from a raised platform when he slipped and fell off, driving a stick right into his eyeball as he hit the ground. This has nothing to do with the story, but all of you hunters out there should adopt this practice. You know, the more you know. Anyway. We're hunting the rest of the day, but not without periodic raging from Brandon, making fun of me and the deer tool throughout the rest of the hunt. I knew I'd be hearing about it for at least a week or longer. That is, of course, if the rest of the night would have been a normal one, which as it turns out, it was not. As twilight approached, I radioed Brandon and told him I was going to start getting out of the tree. Brandon was actually in a built stand that we found while scouting in the months prior. So I had him meet me at my spot due to the fact it was going to take me much longer to get my stand down and off the tree. Just as I thought, Brandon was walking up to my spot right as I was getting to the bottom of the tree. Once I got all the way to the bottom, I unhooked the straps that were around my feet jumped down to the ground and started feverishly explaining to him everything that happened. I took him over to the muddy area to show him that there were absolutely no tracks in the snow or mud. I definitely could sense he didn't completely believe everything I was telling him. I was able to sense this so easily because he looked right at me with his mouth agape and his eyebrows pushing up towards the middle of his forward and said, are you messing with me, brother? He was also able to tell that I wasn't messing with him. When I looked at him in what I'm sure are some of the craziest eyes he's ever seen and said, hell no. When he realized I was 100% serious, he started taking inventory of all the things that I had previously told him. And we went back and forth trying to make any kind of sense of what I had witnessed. While we were talking to each other back and forth, we had failed to notice that nighttime was already upon us. It was that Stephen King full dark, no stars kind of night too, due to the fact that we were looking for signs left behind from the ghost guy. We were in a patch of woods that we weren't very familiar with. We may have been pretty close to where my stand was, but once night falls in the woods, it's a whole new ball game. Still, the patch of woods we were in was enclosed by a triangle of roads. 
All we had to do was walk in a straight line and we could come out somewhere on one of the roads, then just walk that road back to my uncle's house. So we began walking. Walking in a straight line in the woods is almost impossible without a compass, which I didn't have. So we were both figuratively and literally in the dark when it came to where we were. A couple of minutes into the walk, we heard a loud scream as if someone were being murdered. Now I know what every animal in the wood around here sounds like, both normally or in panic mode making death cries. I see videos often on YouTube of people recording a sound in their backyard that they think is a person who needs help, only to be a rabbit screaming from being attacked by some predator. This was not that at all. After waiting a couple of minutes to see if the screaming would continue, we started walking again in the direction we thought we should be going. We didn't talk much about what we had just heard, probably because of the anxiety we were both feeling. We couldn't ignore it for long though, because we heard another long blood curdling scream. It was closer this time and sounded different. At first we thought it sounded like a woman being attacked. This new scream sounded threatening. Ironically, we felt like we were the ones being stalked and hunted at this point, And we still pushed forwards. After walking another hundred yards or so, we came across something very strange directly in our path. There were these weird clear gelatinous masses on the top of leaf litter. Now I'm at 32, which isn't an age that necessarily screams wisdom from my experience but I've been in the woods since as far back as I can even remember. My old man taught me everything there is to know about the wilderness around us. So take it from me, these clear globs should not have been there. The only thing I could think of was that it was tree sap, but it wasn't. I poked one of the masses with a stick, fearing what they were made of. I had read a story about a town that had clear gelatinous globs rained down on them. A lot of these people got very sick. And if I'm not mistaken, I think even a couple of them perished from it. So needless to say, I was taking precautions. Their consistency was that of a thick gelatin. Like if you made jello with only one cup of water instead of two. Once we started walking again, we came across a good amount of this stuff. It wasn't all over the woods. Instead, it was directly in front of us as we walked, almost like something or someone knew which route we would try and take and marked it with these globs. Then came another scream, this time even closer and with a little something added in. This time, not too far away from us, we heard leaves rustling and a couple of twigs snap something was definitely there. It could have been a deer, but this was unlikely. Whatever it was wasn't spooked at all. Not from us or the threatening scream. It's easy to tell when you've spooked an animal when they start running. On top of that, most of the leaves were still very moist, therefore not making as much noise as they normally would. This sent our anxiety level through the roof. At that point, the only thing that was on our mind was getting the hell out of there. We were no longer curious about floating men, screams or alien jelly. We just wanted out, which should have been very soon. The distance we walked should have come across a road by now, but we hadn't yet. Stranger still, we couldn't see any houses or street lights, but still we kept going, thinking we'd find our way out very soon. Our flashlights were now beginning to die. So we were definitely in a hurry, which by the way, is not what you should do if you were ever even lost in the woods. Cool heads always prevail in this situation. As we were walking, we started to see some pine trees. This was very strange because we had thoroughly scouted the land. The only pine trees were over near my stand where we started. After seeing a few more, we got that foreboding feeling, almost like a sick, anxious panic feeling. We stopped for a minute to check our surroundings and found that the exact spot that we stopped 
was the same spot we started. We were standing right next to a pine tree, with a dead pine next to it that had a branch broken off, and dangling still from the severed limb. How could this be? We had been sure we were walking in a straight line. But that must have been an impossibility, since we made a circle. We had no idea whatsoever how this happened, especially since we were in the exact spot we started from. Also very strange, we had seen my tree stand that was still hanging on the tree. It was very close to us, but when we started to walk out it was nowhere to be found. We walked over to it, and immediately found the trail that we had to take to leave the woods. It led directly back to my uncle's backyard. The trail actually went right past the live pine tree we had been standing under. There is no way we had missed that from the start. To add more to the strangeness, as we walked only about 20 yards down the trail, we see plainly my uncle's light that he had above his garage to illuminate his driveway. Our minds were blown, but at least we were able to get out. On the last hundred yards of the trail, we found more clear gelatin blobs directly down the middle of the pass. This was definitely crazy. They were not there when we walked in. We had both been on the trail when we entered the woods, and we would have seen them for sure. We heard no more screams after the time we heard the rustling of the leaves and the twigs break. But we had a strong feeling of being watched when we were still in the woods, and an even stronger version of the same feeling as we stepped onto my uncle's backyard. This is at the top of my list for scariest experiences in the woods. I've no explanation for any part of it. Not the floating ghost guy, not the screams or the globs, not the getting lost in the woods, and not the circle of boulders. I would love to hear from anyone who has had anything like this happen to them. There has to be some kind of answer, but at this point all I have is my story about what happened that night, and thankfully one other person who went with me through it. At least he's been able to validate what happened to people that don't believe this actually happened to us. Whether you believe it or not is up to you, but I can assure you this, it happened exactly as you heard it. I know it sounds crazy and outlandish, but it happened. And that's a scary thing to think about next time you guys find yourselves in the woods. Something incredible had happened back there. I'm thankful that we were able to get out of the woods without having anything bad happen to us. What it did was made my wanting to understand the paranormal even stronger. One day I'm going to go back there alone and camp for a night or two in the hopes that something happens again and that I have the strength to seek out whatever it was, and get some answers. This happened to me on the 27th of October this year. For some context, I'm a 19 year old male who is currently working in Finnish military, as it is mandatory for everyone over 18 years old. In late October, our company had a shooting camp. Pretty average stuff. We go to a shooting area, train for a week doing different kinds of shooting exercises, and then return to the brigade. This one was no different. Except during this particular camp, we put few guardsmen to some major roads leading to the area to make sure no unauthorized people would enter the dangerous area. This guardsman job was actually a real blast, since if you were chosen to do it, you were put to a booth that had heating, a bunk, electricity, a fridge, and all other sorts of luxuries that other troops could only dream of while laying in their tents. Well, on Friday evening of the 27th, I almost couldn't contain my joy when I heard that I would be the one getting the last guardsman shift on the guard booth. I would guard the place from the moment I arrived there until the next morning when someone would come and pick me up, and we would leave. I got one battle buddy with me to do the booth, so we could do shifts, allowing the other to sleep while the other guards. We arrive at the booth, 
it's late evening already. So me and my buddy just lay down our gear, heat up the booth and decide on our shifts. My buddy was to guard from 7 till 11, and I would continue to do it from 11 to 3, and then we would switch again and so on. I could have gone to sleep immediately, but I decided to keep my buddy company, since I didn't feel tired. We ended up chatting the whole four hours about life and stuff. You know, the usual thing young guys talk about. The time basically flew while we chatted, and no cars passed through the booth during the whole time. Finally, my buddy's shift ended, and my shift started. He said he was tired and went to sleep immediately, so I took my place as guardsman and continued alone. At this point, it would be wise to tell you a little bit about the place we were in. The shooting area itself was dozens of kilometers in diameter and pretty secluded, so no civilians usually bothered to come, even if it were by accident. The booth itself was located about five kilometers from our campsite, so me and my buddy were pretty much isolated from everyone and everything. The only form of communication we had was a radio that we could use to contact the security major if something were to happen. The place we had to guard was an X-shaped junction, one road going from north to south and the other from west to east. Everything south of the booth was off limits to everyone who didn't have direct acceptance from the security major to enter since it was dangerous because of the shootings and explosions that we practiced there. Now, back to my shift. The four hours I had to sit there in complete silence felt much longer than the four hours I had chatted with my friend, obviously. But I didn't complain. I actually quite enjoyed it. Looking at the snow-covered roads and forests lit dimly by one single street lamp, and the crescent moon from the cloudless sky, it was literally a perfect night for ghosts and monsters. There was no wind, no sound at all, and no cars passing during my whole shift. I loved it. I've always liked being alone, and loved silence. On top of that, I also liked everything creepy. So I kept myself entertained, imagining all kinds of scary beings lurking in the forest beyond the reach of the streetlight. Not that I believed any of it, though. But I had to admit that each time I stepped out of the booth, I got this feeling of being watched. You know, the one that makes your neck tingle and the hairs stand up on the back of your neck. I didn't mind it, though. It was normal. I was a guardsman in the middle of nowhere, basically alone in the middle of the night. It was normal to be a little paranoid, though there would be nothing to fear in the forest. I've lived my whole life near them and know really well what lies within them and what does not. That's how I kept my imagination from running too wild. Hours passed and my shift was nearing its end. I looked at my phone and decided that soon would be time to wake up my buddy. But before doing that, I would go out and take a whiz. I didn't want to go to sleep and then wake up minutes later with the urge to pee. So that's what I did. I stepped out, walked behind the booth and started doing what I came to do. All was peaceful and I had already started to plan what I was going to do on my next vacation, when I happened to lift my gaze from the ground and took a quick glance from my surroundings. As soon as I looked to my left, directly to the south of the booth, my heart skipped a beat and my stomach grew cold. Just a mere 20 to 30 meters away from me, in the forest, just barely lit by the street light, Something was standing. It clearly looked human, but the sheer size of the thing assured me that it was not. The thing had to be at least three meters tall. It wasn't in any way strangely shaped. It looked perfectly human. 
but it was just huge. By the looks of it, it was wearing a long green robe-like clothing, like Sniper's ghillie suit. Its face was pale, but I could not make out any facial features. It was too far away for that, but I could tell that it was staring straight at me, and I was standing absolutely still. I didn't move a muscle, nor did I make the slightest sound. That in particular gives me the creeps for some reason. One curious detail that I also noticed was that it was crossing its arms over its chest so that its hands were clutching its shoulders. That's the best way I can describe what I saw. And usually when I tell people this story, they dismiss it and I tell them what I saw and then I show them the evidence. I took a photo of the creature I saw. I may have been scared out of my mind, but I was still a guardsman, and my duty was to document everything that happened. After I had recovered from my initial shock of seeing this thing, I just continued staring at it, while silently I finished taking a whiz. I looked at the creature the whole time I pulled my pants up, closed them, and thought of what I would do next. The obvious answer was to pull out my rifle and confront it, but my careless self had decided to leave it in the booth together with my battle knife and axe. I was without a weapon, face to face against this towering behemoth for the humanoid. I weighed my options and decided to get the hell out of there, but not before I took that picture. After I had done that, I slowly turned around and walked to the booth. I sat in my chair, grabbed the axe, and waited. Now you may ask why I didn't grab the assault rifle. The answer is because this isn't the USA. This is Finland. And even though we are in a military shooting camp, carrying ammo with you is prohibited. Even for a guardsman. That's because... Here, average citizens can't just carry a loaded gun with them wherever they please. So having ammo with us, when the risk of running into a hostile armed person is really minimal, would just be another safety risk. Usually just the sight of a gun, let alone a assault rifle, is enough to scare violent people into calming down. But what I had seen was no human. It couldn't have been. So now I just sit in my booth holding my axe, ready to defend myself if the creature came. But it never did. The last couple of dozen minutes of my shift went absolutely silent. When my shift ended, I immediately woke up my buddy and told him what I'd seen. But apparently he was two days after he'd just woken up, that he really did not register what I had just told him. I, however, didn't care. The only thing I cared for was that I wouldn't set foot outside that booth again that night, and it was my turn to rest. So I laid down, heart still pounding from the stress, and tried to fall asleep. Needless to say, it was pretty difficult after what I had seen, but eventually I fell asleep, since it was quiet and peaceful again. Though my sleep didn't last long, I woke up before my next shift had even started, to the sound of footsteps coming from the outside of the booth. I thought that it must just be my friend carrying firewood from the outside, until I realised that he had fallen asleep in the front of the guard desk. There was someone, or something, outside the booth that didn't belong there. Someone that I feared I had seen earlier. I just laid there heart pounding. I was not going to stand to see what was on the outside. This went on for a minute, until I heard a sudden howl. At first it sounded like the wind blowing through the cracks on the wall, but then I remembered there was no wind. This howl was long and high pitched, almost like a moan. It made my whole body freeze from terror. I had never been this scared in my life. After the howl ended, the footsteps continued for a while, until they faded too. 
Whatever had been on the outside was now finally gone. Hopefully. Against all odds, I managed to fall back asleep and was awoken up in the morning by my friend, whose next shift had started. I immediately remembered what happened the last night and told my friend. At first, he didn't believe me but laughed a little. But his expression grew serious once I showed him the picture I took. When we went outside and I showed him the place where I had taken the photo, he was quiet. While we stood there, I took a second photo for comparison. My friend then walked to the spot where the creature had stood when I saw it. My friend was about 194 centimeters tall and he came nowhere near close to the height of this thing. Further proving to myself that I had not dreamt it at all. Sadly, I have no picture of my friend standing in the same spot. I didn't think of it at the time. And after that, I brought this case to the attention of my superiors and other friends, and they were all as confused as I was. No one seemed to be able to explain what I had seen. Someone suggested that it could be a prank pulled by the other troops. I thought about it, but refused the possibility. There was no way some guys would bother walking many kilometers into the dead of night just to scare some random guardsmen. Besides, even if they did, why would they be standing south of the booth where it was forbidden for anyone to enter? If I wanted to scare the guardsmen, I would go to the north side of the booth, where I would be detected eventually for sure. But the fact that confirms that it couldn't have been some random troops playing a prank was the sheer size of it. Even two people standing on top of each other could hardly match the scale of this thing, let alone stay so still. And then there were the footsteps and the howl. To this day, I have no idea what I saw and heard that night. Was it some troop playing a prank? Some abnormally huge civilian having a long night walk in the middle of nature? Or something that science cannot explain? Before this event, I've always been a bit of a skeptic when it came to the paranormal. I'd like to believe, but it's hard without any concrete evidence. But now, when I had seen something myself and even got proof of it, I don't know what to believe anymore. So, the Grok of Wonsaka, whatever you may have been, I hope I someday find the truth about you. Okay, so my first story is actually my friend's story. During the time these things took place, we were all high school students. This is all happening in Florida, by the way. I already knew about skimwalkers and the like, but when these things happened to me, I wasn't sure if it really was a skimwalker or something else. I've noticed that most of the people who tell me they've experienced the same phenomenon live in the area that I do, and my friend is no exception. My friend is called Jay and lives about 10 minutes away from me. She told me that in her bus, there's this one area they drive by to drop this kid off. She said she doesn't know why, but it gives her the creeps. Well, she told me that one early morning, so it was still dark outside, when they were driving in that area to pick him up, all the kids in the bus and the driver saw this weird ass deer running along the bus. It didn't run away from the bus, but ran beside it. She said it looked weird as hell. You all know the usual stuff. It looking like some humanoid deer because it just didn't look right. Like its limbs were bent in an awkward way. And she said its eyes were freaky. The thing is, my friend didn't know Jack about skimwalkers or any of that mumbo jumbo. So I basically got the chills. I tried being reasonable, because I thought that perhaps she'd just seen a regular deer, and since it was dark, there was a possibility that she got confused. Besides, it's Florida. I don't think we're even supposed to get that kind of stuff down here. However, 
Jay swore up and down that it wasn't like a normal deer. She said that they all saw it, and the bus driver even slowed down to get a better look, because everyone was weirded out by it, and it was basically pandemonium. After a while, it ran off and disappeared. Jay couldn't have made something like this up, because like I said, before she doesn't even know anything about Skinwalkers or the Goatman or whatever it could be. So anyway, I got freaked out here because I am knowing about these things and my friend is clueless, thinking she's just telling a regular story about some freaky deer demon. So I ask her, do you know what Skinwalkers are? And she looked at me and said, what is that? I googled them and showed her the description and she goes, yeah, that's what I saw, except it had the head of a deer. She kept on saying it didn't look like an animal or a human. Then after a while, the kid from that bus stop didn't come back. Although that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with this. Unless you want to go wild with what might have happened to him. So we were freaking out together because what she said reminded me a lot about what I heard one night, about it not being animal or human. See, a couple of years before she told me this story, I found myself one night in the backyard, like really early, perhaps three in the morning or so, because I was thinking about things due to personal reasons. I was just kind of chilling and enjoying the silence, when all of a sudden, I hear this really freaky ass echoing scream from really far away. The only way I can describe it is as if a woman and a cat were trapped together inside of a bag and screaming like they were about to get murdered. I know mountain lions, foxes and owls can make the weirdest mating call sounds and I've looked this stuff up trying to debunk it myself but it just didn't sound anything like those things. You usually would be able to tell if it's an animal, right? It's just common sense. Like my friends said before, that didn't sound animal or human. It sounded unnatural and weird. Now me being me, I was pretty unfazed at first. A little concerned, yeah, but at first it was really too far away and I just assumed it was a woman and I actually thought that they were killing people in the streets at three in the morning. The thing is, that thing traveled fast. It was freaky as hell, and the closer it got, the more weird and unnatural it sounded. It only took me a couple of seconds to realize that this was no woman and that it was no cat. Because while this was going down, I was going through in my head, what the hell is that? This thing went, from sounding like it was a couple of miles away to being in my damn neighborhood in under five seconds. It was weird because one second it was so far and the next it was right on my street. I almost soiled myself. The second I stood up to leave, the scream had just stopped. Like it just dead ass stopped. And I'm really thinking at this point it's in front of my house. So I walked as calmly as possible back inside, locked the doors, and the scream was back to being far away again. Weird as hell. I've also heard scraping and tapping on my windows some nights, usually around the same time. I'd say two to four o'clock in the morning, and I've seen dark figures that weren't affected by light outside of my house. To add detail to these things, so that you can get a feel for it. Basically, what happened is that I was doing a project for class, and since I procrastinate like a pro, I'm up till 2am. I go to wash my hands from all the graphite, and as the water is running, I hear scraping against one of the bathroom doors that leads to the backyard. Now, most of the door is made up of these glass panels that kind of make everything look like a bunch of blurry gloops if you try and look out of it. And for a split second, I thought I noticed something pointy and ash gray scraping against the window. It almost looked ghost-like. 
I turned off the water and waited a little bit, and it comes back to scraping against the window again. I'm trying not to freak out, but my hands are shaking. It's stupid, but I actually whispered, what are you doing? While my voice trembled. It stopped, and I didn't hear anything except what sounded like someone walking by the window in my room every now and then. It continued that way for some nights too. Off and on, I would hear footsteps by my window, and even a tap or two some nights as well. Sometimes I just ignored them, and other times I look out to see if someone was there, but there never was anyone. Another night, I had been outside in my backyard again, after having a rough day. It was maybe three or so in the morning, and I'm sitting outside on the trampoline just relaxing. I suddenly notice it's like absolutely quiet, like the kind of uneasy silence that almost feels like a vacuum. I get this kind of dread like I'm being watched, and I snap my head to my left and catch a glimpse of a humanoid, dark figure ducking under the other side of my fence immediately. I'm a little freaked out, because I noticed this thing was pure black. Like, the streetlight nearby didn't hit it at all. Almost like it looked cartoony, if that makes sense. Because it was like the law of physics didn't need to apply for this thing. See, the reason I'm ranting about this stuff is because I told both of my friends and my own story in my psychology class at the same school. A lot of these kids live around my area, I mean about 5 to 15 minutes away max, and they all started screaming at the entire class, and they all went crazy. When I finished, because apparently they've all experienced similar things. One girl told me that she also heard tapping on her window at night, and heard screaming. It freaked me out, because she explained it in the same way I did. She said it sounded like a woman or a cat, but not really like either. Another one of my friends who lives really close told me she saw dark figures in the woods and heard the screaming too. Pretty much everyone has heard the screaming. It sounded the same. That's the thing. In completely different time frames. That's what's weird because everyone's voice sounds different. So how could she be describing the same thing I did? You all know, like if people were really killing each other out there. None of us thought it was an animal either. We all agreed from that point on that our town was haunted as hell. But I don't know. I mean, if there are any animals out there that sound like that, I want to know. Because that didn't sound like anything I'd heard before so I want to be enlightened. The only person I've ever heard who's seen anything remotely specific is the first friend from art, who went on the bus, and apparently, it's like really bad to talk about skinwalkers, and even worse if you see them. It's like bad mojo. Those things are said to be able to travel very quickly. So thinking about that made it seem like what we experienced was a skinwalker. But to be honest, I hope there's a logical explanation that I'm not aware of. Today, I asked my co-worker, who was also a friend in high school and lives nearby too. He got all spooked, and said that he's seen and heard the same things. He's very spiritual, and often has visions. He told me that he believes they're doing dark magic in the woods, because of a dream that he had about some hooded figures sacrificing a woman and a cat, or something like that. Which is freaky, because it also turns out that behind our local park, there's a patch of woods which is very shifty. I was shown this by an acquaintance during my freshman year who lives a couple of streets the way. Down the path in the woods after some walking, there's this huge cross smack dab in the middle of the woods. It's basically raw, crooked, nailed together into a cross, with rope hanging from where you put your hands if you were getting crucified. It's huge too, and whenever I decide to check it out I always feel uneasy. Like this feeling, 
that if I stay for too long, something bad will happen. It doesn't look like a grave, to be honest, but who knows? Anyway, he says I'm not the first person that he knows who's told him about experiencing these things. He also had his own experiences with humanoid figures. He says he once saw one, and that it turned and looked at him directly in the eye, as if it immediately knew he was looking at it. So basically, we no longer mess around in the woods. Something about being in the woods has always fascinated me. I found myself on an expedition deep within the forest. To be more precise, High Peaks Wilderness, which is an area within the Adrian Dax. I brought along a buddy of mine, but you can call him Trailmaster, and a friend of mine who we'll refer to as Nymph. The trails here are endless. Beautiful mountain ranges filled with mile after mile of dense forest. A true definition of beautiful and dangerous. After hiking for most of the day, we must have traveled under three and a half miles. Trail Master found a good spot for us to settle down for the night. A slight breeze blew from the northeast as the sun was on the verge of setting. We estimated two and a half hours of daylight remaining. Trail Master went out to gather wood, a nymph went to collect water from a nearby creek. I worked on setting up our three tents for the night. All of a sudden, Nymph came running back to camp without the Countines. The sound of her panting, followed by her dropping to the dirt on her knees, was enough to leave me in awe. Believe me when I say I know Nymph. It's unusual for her to be panting that loud. Nymph? I did my best to calm her down, trying to get answers. What's the matter? I ask her. Just as Trailmaster returned with a bundle of sticks. What's wrong with her? He asked. This is what Nymph told us. She had just arrived at the creek and found a good spot. She was just filling up, and the cliché sound of a twig snapping was what she heard. The sound wasn't enough to startle her, but rather the events that followed. The sound originated from the other side of the creek. She brushed it aside as an animal, probably spooked by her presence, and kept filling it. Then she heard it again, except the sound was louder and seemed much closer this time. It caught her by surprise, and she was forced by instinct to look at the direction that the sound came from. What she heard next was an audible grunting sound, the type a white-tailed male deer might make. The feeling of dread washed upon her. She felt as though she shouldn't have been there. Followed by the sudden feeling of being watched, it made her extremely uncomfortable, almost to the point of disorient. She rose to her feet, took a few steps back, and what she then saw across the creek. Obstructed by trees, only a tall pair of antlers and what looked like legs, hind legs, followed by loud grunting. She thought it could have been a deer, but her better judgment kicked in, and she thought to herself, what deer isn't afraid of humans being so close? She ran back to camp, where the grunts became louder, and started sounding almost threatening. Are you sure? Trailmaster asked, with a hint of uncertainty in his voice. Nymph didn't even answer him. Instead, shot him a cold stare. It was most likely a deer. Are you afraid of deer? said Trailmaster. I, on the other hand, gave Nymph the benefit of the doubt. Nymph, even in her current state, was capable of describing what she saw, heard, and felt. It was her senses and a gut feeling that made her run away. Trailmaster opted to go look into the area where Nymph had previously been. Nymph was reluctant and said she would not be going back. 
so Trailmaster set out alone. Nymph stayed at camp with myself, who was debating on whether we needed to relocate our camp. I needed a report before the decision could be made. When Trailmaster arrived at the area of the creek where Nymph had been, this is what he observed. Footprints, which were most likely Nymph's, heading in the direction of our camp. Empty camp teens on the ground, and on the other side of the creek, there were prints resembling an animal, perhaps a deer. The only problem was the spacing of the prints, and how something about them appeared missing. A deer typically walks on all fours. Upon closer inspection, Trailmaster came up with the conclusion that this deer had probably been walking on its hind legs. The prints formed a trail. The trail seemed to have emerged from somewhere in the woods, continue for a few meters, and stop at the opposite edge of the creek, then turn around and head back in the direction from where they originated from, without overlapping the original set. Trailmaster later admitted that it did spook him, and he too had had this uneasy feeling. He arrived back at camp half an hour later, with our filled canteens. Even if we wanted to move, it would be nearly impossible, as the sun had already began to set. Fast forward two and a half hours, our tents were pitched, campfire lit, and dinner served. We decided that it was best for one of us to be awake at all times until first light. It was just too dark to move at the moment. My tent was only a foot away from Nymph's tent. There was a good reason for that. Trailmaster's tent had been pitched a good five meters away, because he was a light sleeper. We had to move his tent back closer to ours. The perimeter of our camp was set with a tarp, which would sound if someone tripped the wire. Some tin cans and fishing line, primitive but effective. Nymph didn't say much about the incident that night, and I don't blame her. She was still a bit shaken from the incident, though I would keep her safe. Trailmaster's findings at the creek only raised uncertainty. Thinking about what Nymph saw, and what the Trailmaster found, made me uneasy. The darkness around us, followed by the eerie silence of the woods, and the uncertainty of what was out there, was unsettling. The sound of burning wood was the only sound loud enough to distract us from sudden faint sounds in the distance. The mind can play tricks on you. That night, it seemed like a dark figure was always standing a few meters outside of our camp, beyond the reach of the fire's light. Every rustle in the bush was something trying to sneak up on us. Every sound had a source. It's those sounds that make a night in the woods so magical. Trailmaster and Nymph were asleep. I was on watch. The sounds of crickets at night is nature's lullaby, which was on the verge of putting me to sleep. When all of a sudden, it stopped. Insert musical cue. I had fallen asleep while on watch. Nymph said that she had awoken sometime during the early hours of the morning, around 4am. She found both myself and Trailmaster out. The air outside the tent was filled with a putrid smell. She described it as rotting flesh that just seemed to linger. A weak old carcass already in the stages of decomposition. It was that bad. Nymph, alarmed by the smell, woke both of us up. We obviously had not smelled anything hours before. I did a perimeter check and found nothing unusual. We did feel as if we were being watched, which is an overwhelming feeling. The smell faded within the hour, after we started making some noise. It was only during first light, about two hours later, did we notice it. Prints from what I assumed to be a deer just a few meters away. Trailmaster confirmed that these prints were identical to the ones he had found by the creek yesterday. It could have just been a random deer in the night, 
Trailmaster said, though what I found unusual was the way the prince had seemed to pace back and forth horizontally, then head in a vertical direction. Trailmaster said they seemed to be missing a pair again, meaning it was just hind legs from the looks of it. I have to agree, because these prints seemed odd. The prints were definitely of a deer. What bothered us was the zigzag pattern of the vertical prints, which was strikingly similar to how a human might walk. Trailmaster was tempted to follow the set of prints, which headed in another direction. Nymph was hysterical, and had no intention of doing such things. She said that the whole ordeal just seemed odd and downright creepy. A deer creature, weird prints, and not to mention the stench? Was this thing stalking us? We had no intention to find out. I urged Trailmaster to forget about it, that we needed to keep on moving. Third time's the charm, I told Trailmaster. Let's not be around for it. We were on the move for most of the day. Nymph still felt overwhelmed with dread, and Trailmaster did not experience the same feelings, hence why he opted to go investigate the prince before. He seemed fine being on point. Nymph admitted how she thought the creature was following us. I told her to stay close. I don't know what made her think that, but I knew better than to doubt her. If the creature had been following us, it probably followed at a distance. Nothing would be more terrifying than to suddenly turn around and see a pair of antlers sticking out from a tree behind, or for one of us to be singled out in the middle of nowhere. Despite all that happened, we managed to reach our destination unscathed. All seemed quiet. Any and all feelings of dread vanished as well, as well as the feeling of being watched. The atmosphere felt lighter as we moved out the area. Perhaps we were in its territory, so it felt the need to make its presence known. We no longer felt threatened, and nothing else significant happened that's worth mentioning. Reflection. We got lucky on that trip. Perhaps the creature decided to spare us. Maybe it meant no harm. We simply don't know. So many questions with very few answers. I'm not 100% sure what it was that we encountered out there, though one name does come to mind the more I think about it. The Wendigo. I've heard stories about the existence of this creature from folklore. I've managed to remain a skeptic until now. Whatever that creature was, I'd like to think that it's still out there, waiting for the next group of hikers who venture off the trail into the vast unknown. Be careful, next time you're out there in the woods. I am now in my late 60s. The experience I'll briefly relate here took place on the southern Gold Coast in Queensland in 1984. Our house was less than 10 years old, as were all the others in the area. At the time the event took place, I was divorced and lived in the house with my two young children. I am neither a drinker of alcohol, nor a user of drugs. They have never been a part of my life. I had no interest in fairies, goblins, gnomes, elves, or the like, nor have I been reading about them or watching anything about them on TV. If asked if I believe in the little people, I would have unhesitatingly replied no. In 1984, I attended a seminar in New Zealand, along with several dozen other Aussies. I'd recently developed a fear of plane travel, although previously I'd enjoyed it. A local chemist whom I knew had given me three or four tablets to take an hour before departure to settle my nerves. I took one prior to our departure from New Zealand. Consequently, I slept from New Zealand to Sydney, where we changed planes, and I slept from Sydney to Brisbane, then slept through the drive from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. The driver, a colleague, carried my suitcase into my home. He conducted a cursory check on the premises before departing. My children were all in the care of a neighbour. It was very rare to have a night to myself, 
Being well rested and relaxed, I was looking forward to spending a few hours reading or watching TV. First I made a cup of tea. The television was on, the front main door was open, but the security screen catch was locked. As I sipped the tea, I decided I may as well unpack. I carried an armload of clothes into my bedroom and hung them in my wardrobe. I noticed the light in the room seemed unusually bright. Something was strange about the atmosphere. I had no time to analyze it before I was overcome with exhaustion so intense that I only had time to stagger backwards into bed. I lay face up on the bed. I was concerned my shoes might make a mark on the bedspread. I looked down to make sure only my heels were resting on the bedspread, and that was that. I lost consciousness. Next I knew I could hear the sounds of several voices. They were argumentative voices that seemed to tell each other to hurry. I managed to lift my head and look down to the source of the voices. There were several small people. They were trying to pull me from the bed, feet first and into the wardrobe. The wardrobe was only half a meter approx from the foot of the bed, and I saw that the left hand side of the wardrobe was open. The wardrobe had two sliding doors. I'd hung the clothes on the right hand side, which had required both wardrobe doors to be pushed to the left. And now, the little people were trying to pull me into the left hand side which would have required someone to push both doors to the right. I should explain here that during the event, I must have been operating similar to a video camera in that I saw and heard only, and what I saw and heard must have been committed to memory. At the time, however, I did not experience normal thought process. So what I remembered after, and now, is the product of my mental video camera. At the time, it did not dawn on me that the doors had been moved. I simply saw several small people trying to pull me from the bed and into the open half of the wardrobe. I experienced no shock or alarm. Instead, I told myself I had lots of time to continue sleeping because I was far too big and heavy for them to move very far. Now, I am of the opinion those thoughts were not my own, but were in some way suggested to me. Whatever the case, I must have lost consciousness again, because the next thing I can remember is waking up to find several people crowded around me. They didn't speak as far as I know. I was now lying with my head at the foot of the bed, so my feet must have been at the head of the bed. Again, I was similar to a video camera. I have very clear memory of how these people appeared. There were males and females. I can't remember how many, but at least six or more. One, a male, was larger than the others and appeared to be their leader. He was closest to me. At first, he stared into my eyes with both of his. Then, a blank, and his position had changed, and he was looking at me with only one of his eyes. Something happened there, but I can't remember. I suspect he was imparting something to me. The creature appeared as the typical gnomes or peasants from storybooks. Based on the height of the bed, their height was perhaps two to three and a half feet tall. They were overdressed. Their clothing was suited to a much colder climate. I can remember that in considerable detail, possibly because in those days I did a lot of home sewing. They were Caucasian, their skin looked weathered as if they worked outdoors a lot, and their skin had a muddy cast. They had strong facial bones, wide cheekbones, wide jaws, strong chins and noses. Their eyes and mouths were long horizontally, but vertically narrow and seemed recessed between the strong facial bones. The best way to describe their faces is as squashed, as if a heavy weight had been placed on top of their heads, squashing them downwards. Their bodies were stout, robust, with deep cut chests, broad waists and strong shoulders. I couldn't see the bottom half too well, and I must have lost consciousness again, because when I saw them next, I was still in the same position, but they were now in the centre of the room looking at me. I looked back at them and still felt no fear nor alarm, I just looked at them and they at me. 
I had no thought process at the time. There seemed to be more of them than before. Among them were a couple of younger males who seemed a bit more nervous or unsure. The other men were impassive. The women, however, seemed to enjoy my predicament. Based on my mental video recording, I later regarded them as overworked, joyless, and not overintelligent. It seemed I was simply a job to them, and they seemed a bit nervous. Next, I was aware of their voices again. As before, querulously talking over the top of each other and arguing to hurry. I raised my head, and to my alarm I saw that they'd almost succeeded in pulling my legs from the bed. My body was now right way up on the bed, with my head against the head of the bed and my feet near the wardrobe. When I'd seen that they almost pulled all of my legs from the bed, a surge of adrenaline shot through me, and I grasped that it couldn't be much longer before gravity did the rest of the job for them. All they'd have to do would be to steer my falling body into the wardrobe. I yelled out and kicked at them. Then I jumped from the bed and into the centre of the room. The room seemed far too bright, and I remember standing there yelling at them. I still wasn't afraid, I was angry. They muttered between themselves, and they looked and sounded resigned and bitter. Then they fled into the open half of the wardrobe. They seemed to go in, then down, as if filing down a ramp inside the wardrobe. I stood there watching them for probably a few seconds. Then, still, with the light seeming far brighter than usual, I turned towards the only door and left the room. It was only a small house, the hallway was only three or four meters long, and I left the room, went through the hallway towards the living room, and that's when I became completely consumed with terror. Nothing happened between yelling at the creatures and making it towards the living room, but in those few seconds I was overtaken by sheer horror, which seemed to escalate with every instant. I've never known fear like it, yet there was no real reason for it. I suspect now that when the creatures departed, they removed whatever calming influence they'd subjected me to during the ordeal itself. After phoning the colleague who dropped me off earlier that evening, I stumbled out of the house and into the middle of the road. I was desperate to be with someone, and was moaning in the hopes that someone could come and rescue me. I was completely without shame, and must have been reduced to the level of a small child, but I must stress that I wasn't afraid, consciously at least, that the little creatures would return and attack me. There wasn't a real focus for the terror. It just was. Horror feeding into more horror. Not long after, my colleague returned and drove me to his house. He didn't speak to me. I didn't care. I was just glad to be with someone and to be getting away from my house. When we arrived at his place, I got into bed but couldn't get warm. He put a pile of blankets on top of me, but I was still freezing. Now I realize I was in shock. I wouldn't let him leave the room or turn off the lights. I must have fallen asleep. When I awoke, he wasn't there. Next morning, he wouldn't discuss any of it. I was anxious, he thought I'd gone insane, and tried to explain what happened. He didn't want to talk about it, but he did say that he'd never seen anyone as terrified as I had been when he saw me in the road. We never discussed it again. Despite that, we married the following year. When I asked him how long had elapsed between when he dropped me off, after our return from New Zealand and receiving my phone call asking to come and get me. It seemed the entire experience of the little people had been no more than 15 minutes. In approximately 2004, I decided to submit an account of the experience in the 20 years which had elapsed. I had searched in the hopes of discovering others that had had similar experiences without success. There was no internet then, of course, so I was reliant on books. I found only one mention in a book by Jenny Randalls, who said 7% of aliens had been described as looking like gnomes. It was a relief to discover. I was not alone in my experience, although I did not believe the creatures I'd seen to be an extraterrestrial. When I decided in 2004 to leave a record of my experience somewhere, 
I didn't know where to submit it. Finally, I chose an organization which was UFO Research Group in Queensland, the QLD. The QLD Research Group replied to say in response to my inquiry, they'd had no record of anyone else having an experience with gnome type entities. They asked if they could publish my account in their forthcoming magazine, and I replied that it was fine, on the condition that my identity not be disclosed. Some weeks later, the research group got in touch with me. They were astounded by the latest developments. They said the day before a woman in Melbourne had phoned them. She'd been close to hysterical and claimed that gnome type creatures had been running through her house for a few hours. Her adult daughter was present at the time and the woman wanted someone to go to her house to rid them of the gnomes. The Queensland UFO research group said they told the woman they'd contacted someone closer to her about the situation, which they did. Apparently, the QLD group had contacted the Melbourne UFO Research Group and had given them the woman's contact info. In telling me this, the following day, the research group said it was impossible for the Melbourne woman to have known about my experience, because the QLD group magazine had been delivered to their printer mere hours before the Melbourne woman contacted them. In other words, the QLD magazine hadn't even been printed yet, let alone distributed. The group said they couldn't get over the coincidence, nor could they understand why both the Melbourne woman and I, as I live in Sydney, had contacted a group in Queensland. I said I had most probably contacted them because of my own experience occurred in Queensland. I asked the group to forward me the details of the woman in Melbourne because I was eager to compare notes with her. She was the only other person I knew of who had experienced anything. But when the QLD group replied, it was to tell me that the Melbourne woman had told them she didn't want to be contacted, not by me or anyone else. The Queensland group told me this was often the case. They said people wanted help at the time, but once the situation was resolved, or they'd calmed down, they become afraid their experience will be reported in the media. They're afraid they'll be subjected to ridicule, generally, and particularly by those they know, such as neighbours and employers. My account was subsequently published in the magazine, in hard copy and online. My identity had not been revealed, and I've been identified only as C. Unfortunately, publication of my experience did not succeed in encouraging others to come forward This happened to my friend Devon and I, about five years ago. I don't want to release exactly where this occurred, for the sake of anonymity. You see, Devon and I had been close friends since we were kids. I remember me and my mum and my friends all hanging out at the park and taking pictures when we were younger. He was like a second son to my mother. We grew up playing video games, eating junk food, staying up late, climbing out the windows, and sneaking off into each other's houses, doing all those goofy things that kids do. We fought, made up, and have a long, long history of friendship. He was my best friend. We had spent all our childhood and teenage years together. We'd gotten relationships, and slowly drifted apart, as our lives, wives and priorities took hold. We were both about 35 when this happened. His wife Emma, and my wife Jane, were gonna go do their own thing with the kids, and it was just a man's weekend going hunting. Me and my bro. It was late in the night, we had already established our camp, and were making a plan of where we were going to go next. We were quite familiar with the terrain, as we had hunted here before, and were very excited for what tomorrow would bring, and what we could possibly hunt. The last time we'd come out, you see, our hunt was uneventful, and we returned home empty-handed. This pushed us further, to aim to get something good. As we were discussing our plan, did we notice a strange sound off in the distance? Sort of like a hum. A very low hum. 
almost magnetic sounding, if that makes sense. We both in unison stop talking and look up into the sky where the sound is coming from. There's nothing but a blanket of stars and our pale firelight illuminating our small camp. We listen attently. The sound is still there and very real. However, we can't sense exactly where it's coming from. We're getting a bit put off. Continue making our plan. And by the time we're finished, it's still there. It's really bothering us. We agree the best course of action would probably be to go to sleep. Perhaps we're just hearing things. It must be some strange animal we've never heard, we thought. Animals do make weird sounds. We both go to sleep in our individual tents and pass out. There's something though that bothered me. And a few hours later, the sound had changed. It was more powerful than before. And I swore I could see bright lights flashing over my tent. I thought he was messing with me. So in my sleepy haze, I open the tent and look around. Lights are coming from above, and I can see some sort of object floating just above. It is definitely the genesis of this strange noise, now louder than ever. All that I remember is passing out and waking up in the morning, far past the hour of which I should have awoken. My phone alarm didn't even go off. I wasn't sure what was happening then. So I picked myself up off the dirt and looked around. Our campfire had long extinguished. And I looked over to Devon's tent. He wasn't in there. I poked around, shouted his name, but there was no reply anywhere. I was quite scared. Had he started the hunt without me? I looked into his tent one more time and found his gear stashed underneath his sleeping bag, which was empty. I opened it up all the way, and that was it. It was completely empty, the bag. He was nowhere to be seen. I tried putting my fear aside, assuming that he'd probably just gone to the toilet. So I shouted his name into the wilderness and received no reply. I found this very daunting and I sat there for what felt like hours, and he didn't return. By this point, I was getting absolutely terrified that my friend had died in the wilderness. So, I left the camp after sending him a text and started to leave. I did all the necessary proceedings regarding a search and rescue to try and getting found because I was incredibly concerned for my friend. The weird thing was, when I called my wife and told her he was missing, she didn't know who I was talking about. I told her that he was my best friend, and this wasn't a time to mess around, especially with him gone. Note, I omitted everything about the lights and the noise last night. She started getting angry at me, telling her that I was just wasting her time and not to work her up over nothing, and that I sounded drunk or high, and that I should come home now. I was beyond pissed. What was going on here? I look through my phone and find the number of Devon's wife, give her a call, but she doesn't pick up. I send her a text asking if she'd heard from him. And a few hours later, I receive a reply. Who is this? What the hell was going on? Safe to say, they never found his body. They never found anything. When I got home, everyone I spoke to was acting like I was going insane. I learnt to drop the subject. I have no idea what's going on. It's like that night, he was erased from reality. Every trace of him, his wife, who apparently we don't speak to and don't even know, his family I'd never met. My mum didn't even know who he was, and the pictures of him and I together as children, 
I can no longer find, both electronically and physically. He doesn't exist, and I'm the only person that remembers him. Have I gone insane? Some people believe I fell on a rock, that's why I woke up that way, and imagined this whole thing. But that can't be real. Can it? Devon buddy, if you're out there, send me a sign. I think I'm losing my mind. This incident occurred sometime in the fall of 06. I grew up in a rural part of Ohio. My house had fairly dense wood located directly behind it. As a child, I had a passion for exploring. I especially loved exploring those woods. It was my favourite place to be. Prior to the incident, I had wandered through these woods many times, always with my mother's permission. There was one tree in particular that I frequently enjoyed to climb. Usually, about the halfway mark, I would perch myself on one of the heavier branches and just relax as I listened to the peaceful sounds of nature. Climbing that tree for the very first time was quite an accomplishment. From that position I could partially see the back of my house. On that day, after a fair amount of exploring, I carefully scaled my favourite tree. I seated myself on a sturdy branch and took in the view. Naturally, being late in October, the sun inevitably began to set within a few minutes. I always felt a little saddened to see the darkness approaching. The woods were like my own little sanctuary. I could entertain myself out there for hours. When the darkness began to fall, however, my mother would stand at the edge of the woods and call my name until I obediently returned home, so not to be stranded out there after dark. After watching the sunset until I could no longer see it, I began my descent down the trees. I was nearly at the bottom when I heard my mother's familiar voice calling my name. I thought nothing of it at first, as this routine had occurred plenty of times before. Then I realised something strange at my feet touched the ground. My mother's voice was coming from behind me deeper in the woods, rather than the entrance to where she always stood and where she called me home. My mother had never entered these woods before, at least not with me. I was eager to find her and show her all of my favourite spots before it grew too dark. That's when I realised something was off. How could she have got into the woods ahead of me? Certainly I could have missed her, but as I said she's never entered these woods. She continued calling my name, but there was something strange about it. She sounded absolutely frantic, almost angry. Fearing that I was in trouble for reasons currently unknown, I froze in place. As her voice drew closer, I squinted my eyes to see if I could locate her and determine exactly how angry or upset she appeared to be. However, I didn't see anyone or anything unusual. Suddenly I heard her voice calling my name from the direction of my house, sounding much calmer. Seconds later, from somewhere within the woods yet again, it wasn't an echo. I wasn't imagining things. I was literally hearing her beckoning me from the edge of our backyard as well as ahead of me. My legs suddenly turned to jelly. I couldn't quite comprehend what was going on. Come here right now. The voice that I originally believed to be her screamed from just ahead. I realised that whoever or whatever was mimicking my mother was drawing closer. I didn't question which voice was actually my mother's, as there was something about the way it sounded that unnerved me. Terrified 
of what I would see if I stood there much longer. I turned around and ran towards the exit of the woods as quickly as my legs could possibly carry me. It was amazing that I didn't trip over anything in my haste, even though my house wasn't very far away from where I had been standing. Those woods had never seemed larger to me than they did at that moment. From behind me, my mother's voice continued to call my name, now sounding desperate. Panic set in as my actual mother finally came into view, waiting patiently as she usually did until I returned home. In my frightened state, I absolutely refused to look back. As soon as I was out of the woods and in the backyard next to my mother, the other voice was suddenly gone. Rather than fading away, it seemed to stop the very moment I stepped foot into my backyard. I must have looked as frightened as I felt, because my mother asked me what was wrong. Slowly but surely, my panic subsided. I didn't say anything until we were safely inside the house, with our doors locked. I asked my mother if she had entered the woods. Appearing confused by the question, she told me that of course, she had not. With that confirmation, I hesitantly asked her if she had heard anyone else calling my name and yelling. The answer to that question was no. Although I was still very much shaken up, I managed to explain everything that happened as clearly and rationally as possible. My mother was surprised and nonchalant about the whole situation, explaining that I must have just imagined it, and that I was spending way too much time out there by myself. The incident in those woods have stayed with me to this day. I can still hear that voice as clear as a bell. Whoever or whatever it was calling my name sounded exactly like my mother, but I know it wasn't her. Not only was she waiting for me outside, but the voice also sounded strange in a way that I cannot fully explain. I didn't go back into the woods until I was 17 years old, and even then, I never hang out for very long. I've carefully gone over every possible explanation but none of them seem entirely plausible. It certainly wasn't my mother playing a prank. There was no way she could have pulled it off. Not to mention the fact that she's never been one to play pranks. I also highly doubt that it was anyone else, because as I stated before, we lived in a rural area. The closest neighbor was at least a mile away, and I wasn't personally acquainted with any of them. How could they have known my name, as well as where to find me? We have since moved out of that house, but my mother and I will occasionally discuss the incident. She still claims that she never heard or saw anything unusual out there. I know I probably shouldn't, but what happened in these woods continues to bother me. I spent many hours out there prior to that day, and never had anything out of the ordinary occur. The best explanation I have at this point is a doppelganger or possibly a demon. I'm not sure. If anyone has any possible explanations for what might have happened, I would love to hear them. In Mexico, my aunt slash grandma used to always tell us stories about people going to the hills at night, getting paralyzed in place by coyotes and that people would wear coyote hairs as magic. My mum and many others had been followed by large black dogs, and sometimes their paths blocked. My grandma used to always put scissors in the shape of a cross above our doorway. It was said to keep witches away. I have heard of many people talking about an Indian that lives in the hills past the mine. They say that they bring the guy food and he tends to stay away from people, and he speaks broken Spanish. Everyone talks about witches living out there beyond the village in the hills, that cartel members hire them to put curses on their enemies. 
I heard that the cartels would even kidnap kids and give them to the witches as payment. Near our village, there's an abandoned mine where people always go for hikes. One night, me and my uncle went all around the hills, past a lake, and through an oasis. This trek, we started at 11pm, and we got home at 7am. Nothing happened that night, and it was also the last year I saw my uncle the way I used to look up to him. He was an outdoorsy type with a missing finger, and always carried a large knife, a rifle, and was broad and unrelenting and I always compared him to Crocodile Dundee, and we used to always go on hikes when herding sheep. I had trouble keeping up with him, but he knew the land very well, and moved through the rocky hills with agility. After the years this happened, the following year I visited, he had become the laughing stock of the town, a drunk, skin and bones, teeth falling out, a weak man who was always shaky the heir to my grandparents' land. He had been respected before, along with my other uncles. Now even they looked down on him, and were embarrassed. Only last year had I seen him at his peak. When we went on that eight-hour hike to go hare hunting, the moon was full and everything out of the hills was illuminated. On our hike I asked him, what would we do if we saw a coyote? He joked and said that coyote hares are good luck, and he'd wear one on his belt to get better luck with the ladies. Then he followed it by saying they're more scared of us than we are of them. I'll skip everything leading up to it, but we have two dogs with us, both German Shepherds. One of our dogs went ahead to the mine, which was still a good ten minutes from sight. There were holes all over the ground, so we were going slowly. They both would occasionally get ahead of us and wait for us, or come back and repeat. They knew the path well, so it wasn't unusual for them to go ahead and wait for us near the mine. At this point it was around 3am. Right as we were reaching it, we saw a big white owl flying overhead, and my uncle joked that it was a witch. We still didn't see the other dog that had gone ahead, but Tambo, the one that stayed alongside us, wouldn't stop growling at it. It was growling like that earlier when the dogs had found a rattlesnake, so I didn't think much of it. I had a very uneasy feeling in my stomach though. I told my uncle, I said I was going to go check if the mine was flooded, while he was looking for Firulisi, the other dog. While I was inside with the flashlight, I didn't hear any bats. Usually you would hear them chirping away. It was eerie silent. I wanted to make it to the end, where there was some writing on the walls, but just as I thought, it was flooded a fourth of the way in, and I hadn't explored the other paths that forked out yet. This next part sent shivers up my spine, and I still remember my body tensing up. While walking, my shoes got wet, and they were making a squeaky noise as I walked. When I saw it was flooded, I turned around to head back, my flashlight began dimming. I wasn't worried because that happened when you went in deep. It was just weird that it hadn't happened earlier. Looking back at it, I hadn't even gone deep enough for it to start dimming yet. I stopped walking, but I could still hear shoes squeaking. They were coming from behind me. It was the exact same noise my shoes were making. It sounded squishy and rubbery. I was completely frozen in place for a split second, just to make sure it wasn't an echo. Nope. It was getting closer too, and coming from one of the forked paths. The wet squeaking sounded like my shoes. Then I heard someone say, Tambo? In an almost mocking manner. At least I think I did, because it didn't sound right. I flashed my flashlight towards it. I panicked. Only my uncle had a rifle on him. The one I usually used was lent out to someone. All I had was a slingshot. I grabbed it for the sling so that I could fling the whole thing and I didn't have a rock. I really can't describe what I saw because every time I try to remember, it just looks like a tall blur with a smile. 
I just remember it moving like it was jerking around. I don't know if it had yellow eyes, because it could have easily just been the reflection of the flashlight. But it looked like a person if they were out of focus. I threw my slingshot at it, and it just made a noise like a screeching tire. I ran, and ran, and ran, and rolled my ankles, and I kept on running without looking back. When I went outside, I saw Tambo growling at me. He kept growling at the entrance, and then I ran past him too. Tambo started following me, whispering. I wanted to go to my uncle, because he was like a mountain. I was tearing up. We were a good three hours from anyone else, and I thought we were going to die. I just wanted to get my uncle, because at the time I felt like he could take down anything. I really felt like it was the end. I saw my uncle about 50 feet away, kneeling down, and I could see the rifle on his back shining in the moonlight. When I reached him, he was crying. He was knelt over the body of Furulisi. It had a knife stuck in it. He said he found him like this. I turned my back towards him and looked behind me. I couldn't stop looking around. I talked with my uncle, with my back to him, and he was kneeling down over the dog. Tambo was licking the body, and it sounded like he was crying too. It was completely silent, but now we could hear coyotes howling all around us. I couldn't shake the feeling like we were being watched. We were surrounded by hills, and all I could hear was this nearby stream. Once all the howling stopped, my uncle put the body in a crevice. He also looked on edge, and it seemed as if he was constantly looking over his shoulder. At this point, we just began making our way home. We did not say a single word to each other the entire walk back. I didn't tell him what I saw until much later. He never even noticed how spooked I was. I am of Mexican descent, and in our culture, the dead and spirit are a big part of it, as you know by Dia de los Muertos. Now, as a kid, my family would always share ghost stories from the old country in Mexico. I would like to share a few, if you're interested. This one is from my grandma. She states that when she was a little girl, she saw the devil himself. Back then, circa 1940s, many families were poor, and I mean very poor. She lived in a poor village in Guerrero, and to go to the bathroom, you needed to take a nice trip into the forest, even at night, in pitch darkness, with only the stars and moon to guide you. She was peering, and when she walked back home, she heard what sounded like a parade of horses coming her way. Of course, that would not be possible, as it was pitch black. And no one traveled the roads at that time. That's when she saw a figure, mounted on one horse, and not many like she'd heard, and he did not look up. Just told her something and kept going, and then shortly disappeared. When she arrived home, her mother saw all her hairs standing on end. This, in her village, meant only one thing, contact with an evil presence. Another story she encountered was the famous weeping woman, La Llorona, in a similar situation while out in the woods at night. She said a woman, half white and half shadow, was walking down a dirt road while crying and giving out loud laments. You could not see her face, and she didn't seem to have any legs as she floated down the road. This story is from my parents. In Mexico and in other places in Latin America, there are many accounts of duendes, or gnomes, and evil-natured spirits such as nahuales, shapeshifters, which I suppose are similar to skinwalkers, and chaneques, forest imps, as well as hadas, fairies. My mother told me the story of her sister, who had a baby daughter. One night, my aunt was sleeping. They lived in a village where the forests are your backyard and she said she saw a little child walk around and making noise. She had a young son, but he was sleeping in his room. 
The girl was newborn and could not walk yet, so she had no idea who this child was. She called the child thinking it was her son, and it ran towards her room and darted under her bed. When she looked down getting ready to scold the child, as she thought it was her son playing into the late hours of the night, there's nothing there. In Mexico, it is believed that gnomes can take the souls of children, effectively ending their lives. This almost happened to my father. He was at his grandmother's house playing in the yard, and she had many trees. Bear in mind, this is when he was a kid, when suddenly, he saw a bunch of naked children on the top of a tree calling his name and gesturing him to climb up. He asked his grandma if he could play with the kids, but of course she saw nothing up there and held him inside because she knew what it was. She said some prayer, completely freaking out my dad, and said that he was not allowed to play there again. In another instance though, unfortunately, he was playing with his baby cousin, sitting in a baby chair, when suddenly his cousin just dropped her head like she had fallen asleep. But she hadn't fallen asleep. She had passed away. My dad called over his aunt, and when examining her, they found marks on her neck as if she had been strangled by an unseen force. My mother said that her father and neighbour were enemies, but there was something about this neighbour that scared the locals. There were many rumours and claims that he was a Nawa. This is because, when that home was sold, they found, hidden within, a book of spells, witchcraft, and Satanism, and had Nawal-related entries. The final story involves a ghost from the Mexican Revolution. My mother was a young girl. This is basically a repeat of my grandmother's story. She went out to use the bathroom in the late hours of the night, when she looked up and saw a man dressed in revolutionary clothing sitting upon a rock. No one was out at those times, and he had an old Mexican revolution type sombrero and just looked into my mother's direction, but he had no face. He was just a silhouette. She got up as fast as she could and ran back inside. It is said in her village that a Mexican revolutionary guerrilla soldier was executed in that spot, hung from a tree, and it was common in the times as most revolutionaries were either hung or had a firing squad shoot them as their execution. When I was younger, around seven or eight years old, I used to sleep with my parents in their bed. Their bedroom had a computer room with a window looking out to the driveway and up the cul-de-sac. One night, it was just me and my dad sleeping in the bed. I woke up in the middle of the night and looked out the window and saw a car with its high beam lights on, pulling all the way into our driveway. I awoke my dad and told him someone was in the driveway. He went to check, as well as I, and there were no cars anywhere. He said I just dreamt it. I know I didn't, but I didn't bother making a fuss. We went back to sleep. The same night, I woke up and saw a car out on the street with its lights on, illuminating the street in front of it. I got up and looked out the window, and someone was standing there. A very tall man was standing in front of the car, motionless in front of the headlights. I was so confused. I looked out the window for a few minutes before getting back into bed. I had no idea why the man was standing out there, and I had no idea why the car's headlights were facing him. Now this is where it gets weird. I sometimes sleep alone, admittedly scared because my parents weren't there. For some reason I was able to sleep in that eerie room sometimes, but it always made me uncomfortable. One night, I had my first and only experience with sleep paralysis. Funnily enough, I woke up, noticed I couldn't move, and went back to sleep. There were no demons on top of me or anything I could see in the room, and when I fell back asleep I had a dream of a tall, thin, purple figure standing over me. It had very large human-like eyes that were staring at me. I knew it wasn't human.
It stood there for a while, and I was confused and curious. The figure then leaned over my bed, and dissipated into the bed at the end of my feet. To this day, I think it was a form of an extraterrestrial being. It had to have been correlated to the first previous event, the car pulling into the driveway, the strange man standing out on the street. As I'm writing this, I'm not entirely sure if it was a car illuminating the tall man, or if that car was actually a UFO pulling into the driveway, which beamed lights towards our house. What I do know is that I think a lot about it. Now, this story takes a turn. I'm diagnosed with bipolar one disorder, which can switch over into psychosis if I become too manic. I've suffered from a psychotic break three and a half years ago, and lost my mind. During which I thought I could speak to aliens, and I couldn't stop reading religious texts. One day I was in my basement, going through the psychosis and could see pink, blue and yellow lights shining through my basement window. Now you might be thinking it was the sun reflecting through the window. It was a windy cloudy day, and the sun kept peeking through the clouds causing the visual perception of lights to flicker in the window. Right? Well, why were there colourful lights moving in swirls and showing geometric patterns? There was a thin piece of white cardboard covering the window, so I could see exactly where the lights were hitting. The cardboard was translucent enough to see these strange shapes shifting. I went to the window, took off the cardboard, and there was nothing. The lights had vanished. And all I could see were the clouds moving quickly due to how windy it was, and the sun peeking through repeatedly causing a flickering effect. I'm well aware that I could have been hallucinating, but there is another part of the story that makes it even more interesting. For some strange reason, I was making videos of myself joking around and being somewhat childish. But it was disturbing, because I was 18 at the time, and I rewatched one of the videos and heard a disoriented moan. I did not make that sound. It came as if someone had made a moan through the microphone. It sounded like it came from an electronic device. I later deleted the video after I came back to reality. The videos were so unimaginably cringy that I deleted the lot of them. Before the psychosis had begun, I went on a nighttime walk with my mother. As we turned a corner for about a second, I saw blue glowing light in the sky. It looked as big as the size of a dinner plate, that's how close it was. As I began to point to it, I turned to my mother asking her if she sees it. As my mother turned towards me and asked me what I was talking about, the UFO retreated into the night sky, like it only wanted me to see it. I told my mother what I saw, and she gave me a concerned look. I laughed at excitement, because my dad had recently told me about a UFO he saw when he was younger. After that experience, I went psychotic. These events I experienced as a child, and the UFO encounters I had are 100% real to me. I believe in aliens, and I believe I was contacted. I'm 21 now and haven't seen anything since. I'm properly medicated and attend therapy now. I'm more stable than I've ever been. If any aliens are hearing this, I hope you guys weren't the ones that gave me this mental illness. I am from Alaska. I was born into the Togatelli tribe in the center of Alaska in 1980. This is about 50 miles south of Fairbanks in a small town called Nenana. There are several other tribes in the immediate area, and long ago there were far more before Russian and American settlement. I don't want to identify myself on accident, in case anyone from here ends up hearing this, but suffice to say that paranormal experiences are natural and expected as part of my ancestral heritage. As a child, my grandparents told my father strange stories of the stickmen, who were eaters of men. They especially loved the flesh of children, 
and newborn babies were considered delicacies by these spirits of the forest. One time when Nanana was first being settled by Gusok, white people, there was a hunter who came from faraway lands to settle the wilderness of Alaska and hunt its bears and moose. He took a small party of hunters and native guides into the forest, deep into the countryside to the marshes, where moose and bear frequented. Far down the Titana they went, shooting every animal they saw, squirrel, moose, wolf, porcupine. The natives were silent and led the men on, afraid to question their violent, wasteful ways. Until late one evening, the hunter called his party to set up camp and rest. They chose a quiet spot in a field, where they could see all around them in case wolves decided to try and sneak up, and they rolled out their blankets after dinner and went to sleep, leaving some to take turns watching for animals. The hunter had fallen asleep quickly, content on his bed of furs and blankets. He had dreams of sunny days, perfect for hunting the famed grizzly. He was awoken by the sound of cracking sticks. He found this odd, as they were in a field, but perhaps it was the men rekindling the fire. He peeked out of his tent to check on the encampment. Horror of horrors. There were pools of blood on the ground, but no corpses. He watched as a man, bundled tightly in his blankets, was lifted up by what appeared to be many small moving sticks, and carried off towards the edge of the camp. The man woke up from the gentle rocking of his convoy and screamed, alerting the remaining hunters in the camp, who jumped up and reached for their guns. They were quick to draw but were confused by what to fire at, as mostly they just saw sticks on the ground moving in ways that were impossible. They decided to run because there was nothing clear to shoot at. But as they ran together, they were chased by giant animals that appeared suddenly from the tall grass. The hunter waited until the men were being chased by all the animals, then jumped from his tent and without looking back when he heard their screams, ran as fast as he could. A week later, he showed up in Nanana, crazed, exhausted, and on the edge of death. He related his story and then perished for he would constantly wake up screaming if he tried to sleep, and thus could not rest. A version of this story is common in my family, though some details change with the storyteller. My father has seen the stick men on a hunting trip, and like this apocryphal hunter, he has been crazed and terrorized by the memory ever since. It is said that though the stick men go by different names and come to people in different shapes, that there is some regularity to their appearance. They generally come as either sticks, which blend in with trees, or the ground, until you come upon them, or they can visit you as an animal. This animal is usually described as either a large deer or a small moose, which can move incredibly quick for how awkward it seems to be hunched on its legs. They appear as pale or white animals, and though they usually do this to intimidate men and women, they are hungry beings who feast on the unwary. Seeing a stick man, one may be haunted for years or their entire life afterwards, but in some cases it is considered good luck, as if a stick man is uninterested with you, it means that you have powerful ancestors surrounding you. You can usually anticipate the arrival of a stick man, as the entire forest will go quiet around you for as long as they are in the vicinity, and sometimes they will speak to you and to each other. When this happens, they sound like a raspy whisper, mixed with the rattling of dry willow branches, a light chattering. Do not camp where the forest is silent, and do not look into the eyes of the stick men, for they will drive you mad with fear. I have never seen these spirits personally at least, I can't be sure. My only experience with one potentially happened outside of Carson City, Nevada. I was driving alone in a big Ford pickup truck late at night, 
when I noticed what originally I took to be a deer on the side of the road. This was no deer. It ran like a dog or cat, staying close to the ground in a liquid motion, whereas a deer would bounce or gallop as they ran. It also moved upwards of 30 miles an hour, and when it turned and ran down the hill, I realized it was much larger than almost any deer I'd ever seen, yet lacked antlers. Please, ask your questions if you have, and feel free to share your own experiences below. In the traditional Navajo way, skinwalkers are seen as witches, but they weren't always seen that way. My late grandmother, who was a medicine woman that practiced the blessings way, told me the origins of the skinwalker. Being a skinwalker wasn't always seen as a bad thing. In fact, they were seen as people with amazing gifts. They could change into the form of any animal, run vast distances very quickly, mimic people's voices, and some were known to use magic. During colonization, skinwalker were used to relay messages between war camps and spy on enemies without being detected. Having the skinwalker abilities was a gift. When we lost, the good of the community took a stack back and people began to focus on themselves instead of sharing what you had. People began to look after their own families, claiming properties and livestock. And there were people that got the short end of the stick. Jealousy is a terrible thing. People became jealous of one another and wanted more fortunate people to lose what they had. They looked to skinwalkers, who had otherworldly powers to do their bidding. Now being a skinwalker is not a gift. You condemn yourself to a life of unhappiness and anger. In order to become a skinwalker, you must sacrifice someone that you love very, very much. This shows that you are indeed committed to depravity. The interesting thing is that you could have met a skinwalker and not even known it. They are people just like you or I that have chosen the path which will hurt others. Navajos want to separate themselves from death of any kind. We burn clothing and personal items of deceased relatives, and it is very taboo to keep anything that belongs to the dead. Keeping such items can make a person sick or suffer horrible events in their life. However, skinwalkers surround themselves with death. Skinwalkers have been known to grave rob and search through people's garbage. They use bones and hair from the dead and victims' personal items to create bundles. They place these bundles near a person's home and bad luck will fall upon them. So back to the story. My older sister marches to the beat of her own drum, and this story is about her. In her younger days, my sister was very much interested in the rodeo scene. My family actually had a pretty impressive legacy when it comes to the sport. My sisters didn't compete, but had plenty of friends and family that would let them go and watch. My two sisters would travel around the southwest following the rodeo circuit. The cowboy lifestyle isn't always glamorous, and it can be filled with alcoholism, drugs, and depression. Unfortunately, this took hold of my sister, and she got in trouble with the law. My sister was looking at jail time, and the family was very concerned about what might happen to her. This was very out of the ordinary. My mother went to a local medicine man, and they talked about the next steps and they decided to have a ceremony for my older sister. A few days passed, and it was time for the ceremony. The medicine man and his wife showed up a little past dusk. They came into our house, and we served them food that we had prepared. Everyone chatted for a bit, and when we finished eating and cleaned up, it was time to start. Everyone sat down in the living room in a large circle, the medicine man sat on the far west side of the room. My oldest sister sat to his left. 
In the middle of the circle was a large pile of sand that was smoothed on the top. My uncle got his coals from the fire and placed them on the sand. The medicine man prayed in Navajo and sang blessing songs. This went on into the night. At the height of the ceremony, the medicine man turned to my older sister and told her that they should go outside and pray in the darkness. He told her to not look around as he was singing and told her to keep her eyes on him. The medicine man, my sister, and my uncle went outside. The medicine man turned around and began singing into the darkness. My sister was watching him sing, trying to keep her focus on only him. Then she heard it. Off in the distance, she heard someone whistle. This made her feel sick to the stomach. Our elders tell us that our culture taboos start at a young age. One of the biggest things that they stress is to never whistle at night. They tell us the dead whistle at night. So when my sister heard whistling out in the darkness, fear gripped her heart. She was so scared that tears began to well up in her eyes. The whistling got ever louder, as if whatever it was was moving closer and closer. My uncle was also outside during the prayer and he admits that he was scared too, but he wanted to be there for my sister. What my uncle saw was even more miraculous. He claims that as the medicine man sang, a bundle came from up above. The eagle feathers that the medicine man was holding opened up like a hand. The bundle gently floated down into the feathers and the feathers closed around the bundle. The medicine man stopped singing and the group went back into the house. My sister stumbled in, clearly shaken by the experience. The medicine man could now see how my sister was. She asked him what was whistling. He told her that it was a skimwalker and that he was trying to call the bundle back. We gathered around to see what was in the bundle. The medicine man opened up to see what looked to be a leather pouch. Inside it was a bone about an inch wide and three inches long. Upon closer inspection, the bone was hollowed out and more items were shoved inside of the bone and placed inside the bag with twigs and dirt. He dissected the bone to find hair on a piece of shirt both belonging to my sister and a very tiny drawing of a woman behind bars. Whatever was calling out to this bundle had very ill intentions for my sister. Fortunately, after the ceremony, all of my sister's charges were dismissed. I asked my sister what they did with the bundle and she says that she wasn't really sure. She says that she vividly remembers being very scared when they were standing outside. My sister controls her emotions very well and so I can't even begin to fathom how scared she must have felt in that moment. Personally, I find it hard to believe that these events are merely coincidental. I had pet rabbits as a kid. They lived outside in a cage, a really big cage inside a bigger shed, which was pretty nice for rabbits and it had heating and everything. I got home late from something, maybe a family party. I went out with my older sister to feed them, and at the time we were about five and seven. On the way to the cage, we both saw what appeared to be a really tall, thin man running inhumanly fast through our backyard. We live in what is basically a swamp, and he had to have cleared this giant down tree and run through mud and ferns. But regardless, he seemed to be going over 15, maybe even 20 miles per hour. We both dropped what we had and bolted back inside. At the time, our parents were able to convince us it was a deer or something. We wanted to believe it, so we convinced ourselves that it was. I convinced myself for over a decade of what we saw. But fast forward to a few years ago, I was at a park near my house with a friend late at night. I pulled into the dirt road drive in my outback 
and parked facing the old practice field. It was far too foggy to see across the field, except for a split second, where we could see what appeared to be a very tall man running across the field. We drove as fast as that Subaru could take us, drifting out of the park. Now, a year or two ago, I was at the same park, under similar circumstances. This time it was clear but very windy. From across the field and into the field, we heard a crash and a scream. Not a crash, then a scream, they were simultaneous. It was the most shrill, terrifying, god-awful screech I'd ever heard. More human than a fisher cat, but far louder and more shrill than even a woman. We noped out of there as fast as we could. There was also one other thing that happened. Anyway, this was when I was a sophomore in high school, around the same time of the first encounter at the practice field from the previous story. I was at my friend Nick's house, with a couple of other friends, and we were all staying the night. It was just the four of us high schoolers there at night. That same night, there was a severe weather warning due to a storm that had the potential to create tornadoes, which it did closer to the Connecticut River Valley, and parts of Massachusetts. I think there were somewhere around three small tornadoes that night, pretty wild for New England slash New York. The wind, even without the tornadoes, was intense, and we were just glad that this house had a good-sized yard with no tall trees to fall. It was pouring rain, there was lightning, and the classic backdrop to your spooky story. We're all set up on the second story of the top floor. One of our friends was asleep and somehow managed to sleep through this entire ordeal. The rest of us were all awake, talking about how we weren't in danger of tornadoes, except one of us was convinced that we were all going to die that night. Mid-conversation, there's a loud bang, and the entire house rattles. Is that even supposed to happen? What could it be? We come up with some theories. Is there a tree down? No trees? Earthquake? No reports online? Maybe wind? No trees downed outside? We're down to the bulkhead just slammed the door shut, and we grab a few knives and head downstairs. In the living room, we all notice for the first time how many porcelain dolls Nick's mother owns. We check every room to find nothing but those creepy dolls, but nothing that could cause a bang. There are two rooms left, the basement and the closet, that is barely enough to hold folded linens. We decide if the bulkhead isn't locked, then we forgot to close it, and there'll be water in the basement, and the sound we heard was the wind knocking it shut. If the bulkhead is locked, we remembered to close it. The bulkhead was locked shut, and the floor was bone dry. The sound wasn't the bulkhead. There's one room left, and it's the closet. What could be in the closet? It's only big enough to hold Houdini himself. We open it up, and instantly something falls and we hear the sound of glass shatter. Looking at the ground, it's one of the dolls. What was it doing in the closet? Why would it be propped up that easily to let it fall? We couldn't care. We just went upstairs and did our best to fall asleep. It's something that we all try not to think about, but every once in a while we hear a murmur or a grunt, and we'll never know what it was or where it was coming from. We also don't know whatever happened to that broken doll. I am 16. This happened the 8th of July, 2016. I live in Massachusetts, which is where this happened. The day started normally. I went to school, had a test in vet tech, as I go to a technical high school, and one of its classes is vet tech and I took the bus home. Both of my parents were at work like normal, but after three hours when my mum should have been home, I got worried. About 5pm I got a call from my dad, who told me my mum was in a car accident, and that they are both in the hospital, and would be there for a while. 
It got very late, almost 10, and my parents weren't home. So I decided to put my younger brothers to bed. I stayed up, waiting for my parents to get home. And I spent my time reading and writing an essay for school until around 1am. I got a call from my dad who said he wasn't coming home. He was staying in a motel that was closer to the hospital. I got off the phone and finished the part of the essay I was on. I gathered my stuff and walked through the kitchen, heading towards the stairs that led upstairs, when a moaning sound reached my ears. The moaning came from outside. It was really loud and stopped occasionally, like whatever was making the sound voice was cracking. It sounded pained. I turned on the outside light to see an ugly sight. Sitting in the yard just a few feet from the house was a coyote. It was horribly injured. His head was partially caved in on the left side. Its paw was bleeding. And this was evident by the pool of blood with the paw in the direct middle. It appeared that it had a long deep gash all the way down its back and all of the wounds were bleeding. I reached for my pocket, trying to get my phone, only to realize I had left it on the table I'd been working on. I turned and rushed back to the table. I was planning to call a local vet clinic that I knew was open 24 seven. When I reached the table, the moaning got much, much louder and more pained. Then it stopped. I grabbed my phone and ran back to the window. At first I was confused. The coyote was gone, replaced by a common tabby cat. It was odd. The cat was sitting directly in the same place the coyote had been. After the initial shock, I noticed that the tabby cat had the same injuries, same bleeding paw, same caved in head, and the same gnashes down its back. Something was different, however. I couldn't pinpoint the difference for a good three minutes. Then I realized that the right shoulder blade was kind of pointing out at a completely unnatural angle. It looked deformed and painful, and I dropped my phone as soon as I noticed this. When my phone hit the floor, the cat began meowing loudly. I stared at it as it meowed and stared right back at me. It was looking directly at me. I'm blinking. After a good while, I slowly picked up my phone off the floor. I straightened back up and looked out the window and the cat was gone. I had only looked away for a few seconds. And in that short time, the horribly injured cat had vanished. Some unknown feeling made me go outside to look for the cat. I don't know what it was. Worry? Perhaps curiosity. Hell, it might have been something the animal made me feel. I have no clue. Now outside, I first walked to the puddle of blood and looked for a trail of it. I found it and started to follow the trail and found that it ended as soon as it passed the gate. To make sure that I could see it in the dark, I pulled out my phone and illuminated the ground around me. I looked around for five minutes, but didn't see anything. Just like the cat, the trail had also vanished. I called the veterinary clinic and they sent out a car and they looked around, but the trail was gone and they couldn't find it. At the time, I didn't think of this until afterwards. But I realized that there was no trail of blood leading to my house. I have no idea what the hell this thing was. None of my searches have turned up any results close to what I saw. I am completely convinced that the coyote and the cat were the same creature. And that it is neither a coyote nor a cat. Afterwards, I asked around and there were no records of dead cats or coyotes turning up with injuries. The creature couldn't get far with those wounds that it had. Does anyone have any ideas of what I saw? This happened 10 years ago. My parents agreed not to tell me about it because they knew it would terrify me. I only found out recently because my older brother let it slip. To preface this story, both of my parents are extremely rational people. 
both scientists and skeptics. But they don't like to talk about this, because they can't explain it. They won't admit it, but I can tell it scared them. And they will change the subject whenever I bring it up. I've gone to great lengths to try and find a reasonable explanation for the following. But all I have are scraps. My mother has admitted to me, despite her non-believing nature, that if there's anyone who could have had contact with the supernatural or extraterrestrials, it would be me. She tells me that sometimes as a baby, I'd look at her and she'd get chills down her spine, like there was something I knew. From a very young age, I had an innate and irrational fear of the classic alien image. My dad, being a bit of a prankster, used to get a kick out of hiding a little glow-in-the-dark plushy green alien on my shelf, because he knew that I would start screaming in terror from my crib the moment I saw it. Recently, I was going through old home videos and found footage of me, three years old, sitting at the foot of my little bed, wordlessly staring at the toy across the room. Before I could get up and pace back and forth to the window to peek out the blinds up at the sky and pace back, in the video, my dad asked me why I wasn't scared. I told him it was because it wasn't dark outside. My family used to spend summers at our cottage home in the middle of nowhere, Nova Scotia. By middle of nowhere, I really mean it. Our road is unpaved, and the land itself used to be a cattle farm run by my great-great-grandfather, before it was sold and overgrown. We have very minimal internet connection, as it's a recent development too, that we have to get via radio tower from the next town over. There have been nights when my dad and I have been outside stargazing, as he fancies himself an amateur astronomer, and we've seen satellite-like objects moving low in the sky in a zigzag, unpredictably and impossibly smooth in motion, before it disappeared. There's no flashing to indicate a passenger aircraft or helicopter, and it's always far too fast. My dad's reaction is usually just, Oh, that's weird, and we forget about it. One night, my mother woke up to the phone ringing. You know that state of being half awake, where you take a few moments to process anything, and you're not sure if you're in a dream? That's how she described what was happening. She picked it up, and heard no dial tone, only the continued ringing of the phone before she realised it wasn't ringing in the regular pattern of long, short, short. More like a completely irregular sequence of half rings and drawn out ones. This happened a few more times before she'd woken up enough to sit up in bed and notice that she thought it was daylight outside, and was actually a sky so solidly bright purple, it was luminescent, accompanied by the sound we can only describe as the noise made by the TARDIS in Doctor Who. She said this half laughing. The electric radio clock next to the phone flashed something around 3.15am, but it was clearly broken, as if the power had gone out despite the phone ringing, and needed to be reset. By this time, my dad had also woken up and confirmed that they were both seeing and hearing the same thing. Somehow, and without any further memory, they both went back to sleep. The next morning, there was no evidence of what happened, except the radio clock needing to be reset. No other appliances in the house were affected. My bedroom is an attic-style space on the other side of the house, and the only way to get up to me is to climb up a ladder as I like being high, as it makes me feel safe. My mum asked me tentatively if I had any weird dreams, and apparently that night I dreamt I was flying. My dreams have always been surreally vivid. There was a period of time after learning about this story, I was seriously worried I may have been abducted, 
and I'm starting to worry. They're going to come back for me. So I used to live in northern Arizona, in a town called Page. The town is on Lake Powell, and nearby Horseshoe Bend, which are both massive tourist attractions recently. It also happened to border the Navajo Reservation, and has a population that is majority native. I'm currently 18. I moved away less than a month ago, so I lived my whole life in the town essentially. I've heard stories, many stories from my friends and their parents as well, but these two stories are my actual experiences. The first story happened about a year and a half ago. Since Page is a 60 mile drive from the next closest town, the nearby area is very popular among locals for jackrabbit, coyote and bobcat hunting. This particular day, I was out on my own pretty far back on some of the local dirt trails, pretty recently after I had started hunting myself. My target was coyotes. This was before I had a call, so I had to look for them or bait them. And my firearm was a Springfield Saint AR-15, loaded with American Eagle 5.5 grain AP shells, which yes, is an important detail. It was probably around noon, and I had wandered down into a wash that ran up and across the bottom of one of the sandstone cliffs of the area. While walking through the wash, I scared probably the biggest coyote I had ever seen up the side of a cliff face. As it was scaling, I took three shots at it, and I was able to hit at least one, because it started bleeding quite profusely as it made its way up and over the top of the cliff. I gave pursuit and probably scaled the face in three to four minutes of winded climbing. At the top, the cliff turned into a flat mesa, covered by shrubs and dried up bushes, probably about knee height at most. I'm five foot ten, so not very tall, but there was no coyote in sight. I started to follow the blood trail, and after about 20 minutes of following, I was very confused and somewhat concerned. The blood trail was still thick. Too much was being spilled to allow the coyote to continue for a straight sprint for that long. And I was hunting with a round that would drop a mountain lion in its tracks. After about 10 more minutes, the tracks from the coyote met up with tracks from what I'm assuming were goat tracks. This is where I turned and got the hell out of there. Both tracks were recent, deep, and the sand was still loose enough to fall when I knelt down and looked at them. The tracks split from each other, the coyote going far off to the left, and the goat going to the right. The blood trail, though, no longer followed the track of the coyote, but instead indicated that the goat had been shot. The tracks led down to another wash, known in the area for being bad news, so I got back to my truck fast after that. The second story took place near the outskirts of town, and has a video that comes with it. We and my friends were out at around 10 at night, near one of the local jogging trails. At the edge of these trails, a storm drain tunnel opening sticks out. We always used to joke about skinwalkers using it to hide from joggers or bikers, but we'd never paid it much attention. This night though, we decided to go into the storm drain to see for ourselves. I of course was the first one in, but had five people behind me. We were probably about 300 feet in, when I heard what sounded like claws scraping against concrete ahead of me. I could only see about 50 feet in front of me with my light, so I shushed everyone behind me. As soon as we got quiet, a moan resonates through the tunnel. I've never backtracked on all fours so fast in my life. The storm drain leads to a nearby road, which the people who were too scared to go into the tunnel were looking at. 
but they were not on the road or anywhere near the opening of the road, and were even taking snapchats at the time of the noise, showing us that one, it wasn't them, and two, there were no cars on the road at this time. I can't prove that these were skinwalkers, but they definitely weren't any person or animal that I have ever encountered in my life. If you'd like to see the video, the link is in the description. During the 1970s, before I was born, my dad worked as a trail guide in California. He'd lead groups of tourists on horseback across mountain trails and such, and he met a lot of people during his time there. He met this Native American guy, who started out as a regular customer, and eventually became an employee. He came from an Indian reservation, although he never said which. He also didn't explain why he left, but he was a cool guy, so my dad never really gave his origins much thought. He always figured that he'd left for personal reasons and didn't want to be bothered about it. So my dad never brought it up. One day, my dad, his brother, and his Native American friend were out on the trail with a group of people. It was a pretty ordinary day. My dad and uncle told jokes back and forth, their friend laughing and jeering, and the tourists took pictures with their bulky cameras. Nothing unusual. As they were moving along, someone shouted, Coyote! And pointed into the little valley on the left side of the field. Again, nothing strange. This was in the grassy chaparral of central California, and coyotes are a very common sight. My dad and his companions stopped their horses so that their guests could have a look at the creature. My dad and his friend got chatting, but my uncle kept staring at the coyote, with his features all scrunched up, like he was trying to get a better look at it. My dad asked him what was up and he said, this coyote, it doesn't look healthy. The coyote had very long and thin legs and didn't walk normally. Most dogs walk by lifting a front leg and then lifting the opposite back leg. But this coyote walked by lifting both legs on one side of its body, sort of like a camel. Its snout was also a good three inches longer than normal, and it held its nose high in the air, as if it was sniffing for something. My dad said that it was probably just deformed, and my uncle agreed. Their friend, however, was silent. He was slightly shivering and staring directly at the weird coyote. My dad put his hand on his shoulder and said, What's wrong? With a shaking finger, his friend pointed at the coyote and said, The tail. Look at the tail. My dad looked and said, What do you mean? It has no tail. My friend said that he'd explain everything when they get back to base camp. So my dad led the guests down to the trail. The coyote followed them. It didn't come up from the valley but it followed the group. The tourists thought it was fun to have a little companion, but my dad's friend never looked at it. He was silent the whole way back. When they were just a couple of hundred yards from the base camp, the coyote leapt out of the underbrush about 20 feet in front of my dad and his companions, freaking the hell out of them and the horses. The coyote stared directly at my dad's friend and smiled. Not a panting smile like most dogs do, but a full-on, teeth-bared smile, which showed off its yellow and brown stained teeth. The friend stared back, and produced a small piece of wood with an arrow burnt into it. He showed its face to the coyote, which looked away. Then the creature howled. Coyote's howls are usually high-pitched, but this one was very low-pitched almost baritone. It sounded like the thing had fluid in its lungs, as if it were drowning, unable to make one final scream. Then it ran back into the bushes. My uncle, ever the jokester, turned to the stunned tourists and said, Well, I hope you got your money's worth. At camp, my dad's friend 
wouldn't give them the whole story. Only vague statements like, it killed them, and now it's going to try and kill me. He said that he did this to protect my dad and uncle, because the less you know about it, the better. He gave them each a small piece of wood with an arrow on it, saying that it would protect them from the thing. He made them himself, and he said that he was glad that he got to test them out. He drove out at eight, and my dad never saw him again. My father always used to tell this story when I was younger, especially during camping trips. He's a high-spirited kind of guy, so he always tells it in good spirits. But sometimes he says that on cold nights, when the wind is blowing and there's a rustling in the trees, he can hear the low howl of the thing that was not a coyote. The Giant Bird, as told by Miguel Ángel Becerril. This story took place near Mexico City, in the mountains of Xochimilco. It all started during my sleep. I began having nightmares. Something evil was watching me. The devil was lingering, bothering me. When morning broke, I had to go for a run. I was very disciplined back then, and used to go running the same mountain where the lizard man had been seen previously. I used to go every day. So I got up that morning, prepared myself, but something was off. I had this strange feeling, telling me that on this particular day, I shouldn't go on my run. Anyway, my sense of responsibility was stronger, and I forced myself to go. I always took one of my dogs with me, but that day the weird feeling was so intense, I decided to take another dog with me. I chose a pit bull and my boxer. They made me feel safer. I've always had a lot of dogs. We headed to the mountains, and as we took the path into the woods, my mind started to flash a lot of images of demons, something that had never happened to me before. I had been a regular to this place for years, and such a thing had never occurred. But that day, it did. I started running with my two dogs on the leash, not feeling well at all. I've always believed in God, only back then, I wasn't really convinced. Anyhow, I started praying because I had this horrible feeling, a presence of something, and the demonic images which I'd just seen. So I prayed during the first three kilometers, and kept watching my back, because I felt this sharp sensation of being watched. As a matter of fact, I felt it since I woke up, and I kept going, and continued with prayer. But at some point, I heard some kind of call, something like a parrot, only much louder. Then I remembered that flocks of parrots were usual around this time of year. So I got curious, and began to look up to see where their nests could possibly be. Some parrots make their nests on the ground, and for a moment I forgot how I had been feeling all the way up, and I tried to ignore them. My dogs were losing it by then, and running straight ahead of me. But as I heard the sound again and again, I got obsessive with it, and started to run so fast I ended up leaving my dogs behind. The sound started to come from everywhere, and it became compulsive. It was winter, so most of the trees were without leaves, and all you could see were the branches. From afar I noticed something move, not very high, because all of them were oak trees, and the feeling had grown stronger. As I keep following the sound through the branches, I saw two huge wings open, and a giant bird glide into another tree. But as soon as it reached it, the bird closed its wings and disappeared. I can recall, it was of a very similar colour to those branches. It was a bird, but one I'd never seen before. I've always liked animals, so I can recognise all the animals from the region. Not this one. I started to follow the bird frantically as it appeared again. Its wingspan was easily more than two metres and a half and it was coloured in a distinctive yellowish-brown. I saw it again, trying to follow it, 
and every time I kept going, I kept getting deeper into the mountain. So much so that I forgot all about my dogs. I don't know where all that strength came from, because that's a really difficult area to run in. It's incredibly steep. My dogs followed behind, panting with their tongues out, but I kept advancing, thinking that I have to discover what it is, and that I have to see it. See its head, and see its tail. But I never got to. I kept following it as it flew, but every time it stopped at some tree, it would disappear. Those are really low trees, only about three meters tall, or three and a half at most, and you could see everything very clearly, except this creature. This creature was also very tall, at least one and a half meters, and each time I got near, it would fly away. Then I heard some dogs barking at the bottom of the cliff, as if they barked at something passing by. They hadn't seen me. This was the point when I just popped out of my trance, just as I reached the cliff. The bird flew away, but I stopped and thought about my dogs, which could be attacked or get into a fight with those dogs down there. So I stopped chasing it, came back to reality, attached their leashes, and started to descend and got calm. I had strayed really far from my usual trail. Nevertheless, I could never see the head of the bird nor its tail. So to this day I cannot say what I saw. It was a very strange experience, and I hope to never see it again. I live in Russia, and my encounter happened around a year ago in February. I was walking by the embankment at 10pm. It was already dark, and nobody was around. There is a road which has three levels, a big street. Then it goes down into a smaller one, and finally the embankment, which turns into a small path through thick snow. Just imagine, you're walking through an industrial area which barely has street lights, no people, and on your left there is a little forest, and on the right, there is a river. So I was walking on the path when I saw this man. His whole appearance alarmed me instantly. He had skis on, but was trying to walk as he was without them. In the deep snow, it was around his knee level, and I saw how much effort it took for him not to fall and carry on moving. There was no way to avoid this person, because it was a tiny path through the snow. He was staring at me, smiling. I'm unsure if it was in a predatory way, but something was strange in the smile. I thought, well, if anything happens, I can push him and run, and carry on moving. When I was right next to him, this happened. Everything took place in about three seconds. I was watching his every move with my side vision, and in one moment, he vanished. There was nowhere to hide. The trees give you at least a hundred meters worth of visibility, and hiding in the snow isn't an option. You would be visible regardless. He was gone. I slightly turned my head to that direction when I captured something right behind me. A stick man. It was absolutely black, around my height, maybe a bit taller. Very thin, with a big head and no neck at all. It was standing in a very threatening position, with its arms set apart like an animal preparing to attack. This figure looked like a picture printed straight onto the air. I thought the 2D object should be material at some point, with the thickness of a sheet of paper for example. But no, this looked entirely different. I turned my head away and started running to the second level of the road. When I got there, I looked back. This thing was peeking out of a tree, and when I spotted it, it hid behind it. At this point I really thought that I was going to die for sure, and when I got to the third level some cars were driving by, so it calmed me down a little. I looked back. The stick man was standing in the spot where I was a second ago, right in the middle of the road. 
The whole landscape looked so unreal that at some point I questioned my sanity. This time, I kept the contact and tried to examine the thing. The stick man was slightly moving back and forth, but its whole body had a very stable dark black figure. I got a feeling, the feeling saying that I shouldn't be seeing this. Then my survival instincts were blurring out of my mind that were telling me to flee. And it was also a feeling like he's found me. Imagine the feeling when you play hide and seek and your cousin is very slow finding anyone. So you sit somewhere for 20 minutes. At first you feel the pleasure from the game, but then as time drags on, you get bored. And when they finally find you, it's almost like a relief. I think that something tried to stop me from walking away because at some point there was a little desire to approach it. Anyway, it was obvious that it was following me. And the thing is, I lived very close to that area. I didn't know what to do, either to wander through the streets so it would lose me or go directly home. But this thing would know where I lived. I decided to run to safety immediately without looking back. And yes, that wasn't the end. That night, I had sleep paralysis. I remember laying in bed listening to the sound of water from my aquarium when it suddenly stopped. I thought someone was trying to grab my attention. So I opened my eyes and right next to the bed was the same black figure. This was it. The end of my life. I literally saw my entire existence flash before my eyes. It stood three feet away from me. And then it turned in a fog and started to fill my lungs through my nose and throat. When it was entirely inside my body, I awoke or I didn't sleep at all. I don't know. The thing is, I haven't noticed any difference with myself since this whole encounter was very different from anything I've seen in my life. There are things you've never experienced before, so you don't actually know what to think or feel and are filled with curiosity. I am low key disturbed. Would I one day find myself in the middle of nowhere approaching a random person with the skis on and disappearing next moment? Did that dream mean anything or was it a dream? I barely remember that man's face. This has been a terribly odd and confusing experience. And if anyone has encountered anything similar, I'd love to hear about it so that I know I'm not the only one. This is a story relayed to me by my father. Many years ago, he was doing a road trip of the States. He was driving along one night determined to stay up. He'd been driving for about five hours and it was approaching midnight. Exhaustion and fatigue from the day had been getting to him and he was starting to feel the strain at the wheel. Every moment was another fight against sleep. And he kept his eyes open, determined to stay awake for his destination lied only a half hour away. He thought it best to pull over for a brief respite. So he pulled over on the side of the road. It was a fairly desolate place and there were no other cars. He stopped, looked about, and it was pitch black. The moon was high in the sky. But other than that, it gave very little light for this surrounding area. He got out of his car, reached a hint to his pocket, and fumbled retrieving a cigarette box, pulled out a cigarette and lit it while sighing deeply. He really needed to make it that next half hour. As he stood there, thinking about what he was going to do tomorrow, and dreaming about the comfort of a bed for the night. Did he hear something in the distance? He turned his head and didn't see anything and just ignored it, assuming it was the sound of the wind. He finished his cigarette. He stood on the ember. And just as he was about to open the car door, did he look around again? That's when he saw it. 
the moonlight was reflecting, and there was something in the trees, something vaguely humanoid shape. He tried squinting. Was it a person that needed help? Why were they not approaching? But moreover, why were they standing there creepily, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night? When he realized just how odd this was, did my dad quicken his pace, threw open the car door and closed it, feeling safety within his vehicle. He didn't even do his seatbelt up. He tore us out of there quickly and started making his way to his destination to get some sleep. He looked in his rearview mirror after a few seconds and didn't see anything and a surge of relief washed over him. As he carried on with his drive, did he occasionally glance in the mirror? And after a few minutes, he noticed it. It was following him. It was matching his speed. He was going at nearly 60 miles an hour. How could this creature be keeping up with him? My father thought he was going mad but dared not stop to pinch himself and verify this. He put his foot on the accelerator and pumped that machine harder. 70, 80, 90 miles an hour. His car was now really suffering, yet this creature seemed not to stop. Its speed matched the whole time. And as my father was putting his foot further and further, to the point where it wouldn't speed up anymore. He swore he thought the creature was gaining on him. My father was absolutely bricking it. Fear, panic and terror all consuming him within his mind. His glances back to the mirror were now frequent. His fear was overcoming him. His heart was racing and he didn't know what to do. And just as quickly as it had started following him, did the creature vanish. It must have run off into a bush or something, or realised my father wasn't worth pursuing. He didn't stop. The speed he maintained he carried on for several hours. He decided to forget about his little hotel for the night, and kept on driving until he reached his friend's place. He passed out when he reached his house, about 8 a.m. the next day. The fear fueled him all night. And he told me that he would never visit that part of the States again. And warned me that if I were to find myself down a lonely road in the middle of the night, to keep going and to be wary of my surroundings. Who knows if that creature, whatever it might be, is still out there. How it could reach those speeds, he doesn't know, and he doesn't want to find out. He's just grateful that he got out with his life. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five minutes to tow down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird too. I've never really been in the main house, after all. But the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep from all the noise, the floorboards creaking, the thumps and knocks. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but it was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered about. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you might imagine a fairy make. It would come from a different location each time I sought it. 
and I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks, or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians, but this was different. It was dead silent out there in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and from by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, deer on away and crush about doing it. These steps were like something or things running swiftly around me. It's like it would cross the trail ahead, and then behind me, and then alongside me, but I would never see it. I was a big time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork into 3 or 4am. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh 20 inches or so. Decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks, and see if I could locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get me, not frantic or anything. I let her in, and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky, and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call a night too, and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24am. I can still see it on the top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out, noted the clouds were dispersed a bit more, and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette, and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods, when something caught my eye. It looked like a silhouette of someone leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see someone with a palm planted against the wall, with one arm straight out leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or if the lighting is funny or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped onto the fresh snow, there it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on the tree put the thing at seven feet tall. It ran along the border of the fence, and back off into the woods. It was hairless as far as I could tell, and completely naked. Otherwise though, its form was just that of a skinny tall man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up a set of what had to be at least a size 14 or 15 barefoot. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard as if heading into the woods. But then the tracks ended about 20 inches short of the wood line. I don't know if they managed to jump to the tree line. Probably because there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It's like it just completely vanished after that. Wyoming is one of the largest states in America covering nearly 98,000 square miles. Despite its size, Wyoming has less than 600,000 residents, making it one of the least populated states in the US. Its history is rich, and is as dark as the coal that fills the endless stream of boxcars winding their way across the western plains. Many battles, and a great deal of blood has been shed, by both the white man and the Native Americans in the fight over the lands and its resources. So as you can well imagine, many residents believe the land is cursed. There are countless stories of paranormal activity, from ghost encounters, Bigfoot sightings, to skimwalkers and cryptids alike, not to mention stories of UFOs and alien abductions. This story, however, it's not about spirits, or anything of that nature. As a kid, my family would often go camping at Lake Desmet, just outside of Buffalo. 
These camping trips often included taking the boat out for some water skiing, and or fishing. On one particular trip, my father and I were fishing in the middle of the lake. The water was so calm and still; it almost resembled glass. The glare from the midsummer sun's reflection off the water was nearly blinding. Still, we talked lazily about everything and nothing. I recall my father commenting on the fact he thought it was rather strange the fish were not biting at all. He stated it as if something had scared them away. I didn't give what he said much thought, as I was preoccupied by the sudden ripples that began to dance across the water, giving the lake's surface a funhouse mirror effect. I recall thinking it was rather odd for this to be occurring, considering there was no boat or anyone in sight for that matter. My heart began to pound in my chest, as the ripples soon turned to waves that slapped against the side of the boat, with enough force to cause it to rock back and forth. Judging from the look on my father's face, I could tell he too was feeling uneasy about the current situation. Dad. Are you seeing this? I asked, trying to keep the fear from creeping into my voice. I am, is all he could say, his eyes nervously scanning the lake. I should point out that the lake is said to have a depth of seventy feet on average, and a hundred and thirty feet at its deepest. Others say no one knows how deep it truly is. There are countless stories regarding a creature known as Smetty. Descriptions of the cryptid are as varied as the sightings. Some describe it as a giant eel with a horse-like head, while others say it resembles an enormous alligator. Most witnesses describe the monster as a classic Loch Ness monster-style creature. Now keep in mind, I had heard all of the stories and truly believed they were just tall tales. However, all the doubt I had was blown out of the water. As I watched what looked like the head and neck of a massive sea monster rise out of the depths, about fifty yards from the boat, as we watched in silence, the creature lazily drifted across the water as if it didn't have a care in the world. Needless to say, my father and I were peeing ourselves with excitement and fear. It was my father that first broke the silence. Well. I'll be damned! It does exist. Yeah. Neither of us had thought to bring a camera, so there was no way to capture a picture of the encounter. To be honest, even if we would have, we were both so shaken. I doubt either of us would have gotten a decent picture at all. We just sat there, staring in awe and disbelief for what seemed like hours. In truth, the whole encounter lasted maybe all of two minutes, before the lake creature disappeared beneath the lake's surface. My father and I looked at one another without speaking, and quickly began reeling in our lines. Well, I guess I know why the fish weren't biting. I pointed out. Indeed, my father replied, with a slight shiver. I think it's time for us to get the hell out of this lake," he suggested. I nodded my head in agreement, and without another word to my father, cranked the boat's motor, and we hauled us back to shore, cautiously keeping an eye out for the monster. I've been back to Lake Desmet many times since, and have yet to see the creature again. However, sightings and stories continue to circulate. Although there is no actual proof that Smetty exists, I know without a doubt that it indeed does. If any of you have seen it or heard about this elusive creature, I would love to hear from you down below. Somewhere between June twenty seventh, nineteen eighty, and April twenty third, nineteen eighty one, I had a strange experience. This experience is the one that I have the most difficulty discussing with people. Part of the difficulty is that it was an experience that still frightens me when I think of it. The other part 
is the fear of people thinking I'm crazy. Of course, by sharing it with all of you, I am defeating that fear. We were living in Aberdeen, Maryland on an army base. Not quite sure what a Marine was doing on an army base. We lived in military housing on the base. The house was a two story brick townhouse and all of the houses on the base looked the same. I had a large bedroom and a king size bed all to myself. On this night, I was sleeping. At the time I slept with the light on, but dimmed because I was afraid of the dark. I woke up in the middle of the night and had an urge to play my kid sized electric piano. I crawled out of bed and quietly walked to the piano across the room. I turned it on and sat back down on the bed while it warmed up. When I was certain that it was ready, I walked back to the piano and pushed the two lowest keys. I believe that Topher, my husband, told me a few weeks ago that these are usually A and B notes. The notes let out this low depressive moan. I held the keys down for a while, not sure how long. And when I let go, I turned and looked at my closet. Standing there in my closet and reaching out for me were four beings. They had pale, slightish gray skin. They had large black eyes, two slits made their nose and non existent ears and small mouths. They were all reaching out to me with their four digited hands. They wore black jumpsuits and on the front of the jumpsuit was a metallic silver triangle logo top pointed down and emblazoned across the triangle was a blue metallic lightning bolt. They didn't move towards me. They just stood there at the door of the closet reaching towards me. I ran towards the bed, hid my head under the covers and began to scream. Instantly, my mom and dad were there asking what was going on. I explained to them that the cone heads were coming after me. I'm sure I had seen the cone heads on Saturday Night Live at some point and they were the only things that I remotely related to what I had seen, though they were nowhere close. I told them that I had played my piano, and then all of a sudden the cone heads were reaching for me from my closet. Mum stayed in the bed to comfort me, while Dad walked over to the piano and pushed a key. Sure enough, the piano was on. As the key made the note, I told my dad to stop or they'd return. I don't know if I even went to sleep with my parents that night, or if I managed to fall back asleep after they spent some time with me, assuring me that there weren't cone heads in the closet. The next morning, my dad took the piano outside and smashed it with a sledgehammer. In hindsight, I find that to be a rather odd reaction. It wasn't until years later, while I was in junior high, that I was watching Unsolved Mysteries that I happened to see an illustration of what had appeared in my closet. These illustrations were from people who were abducted by aliens. My mom and sister were asleep when I was watching this show. And my dad was deployed in Kuwait for the Persian Gulf War. Upon seeing the images, I dropped to my knees and began shaking and crying. The images were exactly what I had seen, except most of the images of the greys didn't have clothes on until finally there was one image, a drawing of a grey wearing a black jumpsuit, and on the jumpsuit was the triangle insignia. No lightning bolt though. From time to time, I mentioned that night to my parents, and they have absolutely no recollection of me screaming my head off about the cone heads. They do remember the destruction of my piano though. Was I abducted? I don't know. Why did they come to me? Did pushing the lowest note on my piano call them? Or was it just a coincidence? Will they come back? Originally, I would tell you that I hope the hell not. But maybe if they did, maybe I could get the answers that I have been looking for. I'll preface this by saying my approach to paranormal things in life is to be open minded until proven otherwise. So for full disclosure, I do believe in almost everything paranormal. 
but I've never actually seen anything worth noting myself, other than when maybe we saw a Bigfoot in Oregon back in 2012. But I was pretty far away, and it could have just been a distant bear or even a tree. Anyway, I am a single dad. My son was born in 2010. I like to think of myself as a very dedicated father. He is by far and always the best thing in my life ever. And as such, where he's involved, my memories are usually clear and more profound. Since the first time he ever slept in a bed with me, I can recall odd things happening during sleep. And it's every time that he sleeps in bed with me. Noises, blurry visions, and I wake up from such noises. A window or a door open that I knew was closed. A nightlight unplugged and on the floor. Stuff like that. Well, yesterday. He was sick, and I let him sleep with me in my bed last night. I recently switched to overnight shifts at work. So, when I'm off now, I've become a very light sleeper during normal sleep hours. The last thing I remember before dozing off was that my son had kicked off his blankets. He prefers to sleep that way, and I think this detail may be important and that his pillow had kind of shifted towards the headboard, and his head wasn't on the pillow at all. This morning, a little before four, I awoke to a noise. Only this time, I actually saw something. As I sat up, I noticed my bedroom door is open, and I never leave it open. As I'm noticing this, my focus becomes clearer, and I swear that along the door frame, I can see four very long fingers, not claws, fingers. As I move to get out of bed, the hand moved away, and I see what I can only describe as a fleeing tail. As soon as I get to my door and look into the next room, there is nothing. I searched everywhere, nothing still. All doors were locked, as were the windows. When I go back to check on my son, the pillow is back perfectly under his head. The blankets were pulled up onto him, and the fever he had had broken. He was sleeping peacefully. I have never, including this morning, felt threatened by what I have seen or heard. In contrast, I've probably felt more at ease than I should have in this situation. A couple of notes. I've always had, and still do have, dogs who sleep in the room with me. They never even barked or growled. I do have a history of sleep paralysis, though I can always tell when it's been an episode just by how terrifying they are. I don't think this is what the situation was. And finally, I don't drink at all, and if I ever do anything, it's maybe smoke a joint when I go camping with my high school buddies. The question is, should I be concerned? Are there such things as sweet cryptids that watch over your children? Does this sound like something any of you have heard? Or is this some sort of subconscious thing I'm experiencing? Any information would be valued. Let me start off by saying that this is not my story, but it was such a crazy encounter that I have since asked each of my friends throughout the years to recount the events. This happened around the year 2000. About a year after this took place, I started dating one of these friends, and that's when I first heard about this dog-slash-wolf story. I have since asked each friend over the years, and miles apart, and they all remember the encounter the very same way. Before my ex was even my boyfriend, he and our other friends were all about 17 to 18 years old. 
At that age, I remember it being an adventure to find a place to smoke. Let's hike to this place and puff. Ah, the good old days. The four of them decided to drive to Mount Pisgah, a beautiful wooded area outside of Eugene, Oregon. It's more of a hill, but it's nature in its prime form for sure. I've been out there many times growing up, and I know exactly what trail they were on. It was Jay, my ex-boyfriend, and his best friend, Barry and their girlfriends, Sarah and Mary. They had driven in Barry's little white sedan, parked in the parking lot, and hiked the trail to the river where they smoked some bowls. The group spent the day out there swimming, puffing, puffing and swimming, just being typical teenagers. I can imagine the hunger is what drove them to go home after a few hours, as the sun began to set. Either activity alone is bound to get someone hungry let alone both. So they walked along the well-worn main dirt path to the parking lot. This has since been paved, and it doesn't take not 20 minutes for them to get back to the little footbridge by the parking lot that they had crossed when they hiked in. When they reached this small footbridge near the parking lot, Barry looked out into the vast fields between them and the wooded area and noticed a huge dog. The dog was just sitting there, not looking scary, just looking like a humongous friendly dog, about 70 yards away. It was starting to get dark, but from Mary's description and the drawing she did later for me in 2005, it was very shaggy and furry. My friends continued to walk across this small wooden bridge, and one of the girls screamed. The big dog was now on its hind legs, standing much closer than when they had seen it a few seconds earlier. It had traversed most of the large field in the seconds it took them to get past the 10 foot long bridge. Whatever this thing was, it was fast, quiet and stealthy. My four friends ran to the car and they had the classic cliche, I can't get the key in because Barry was fumbling madly for the keys. At this point, the dog was just standing at the very edge of the parking lot, looking at them. As my ex Jay had said, every time they looked up, he would be closer, but not moving. All of them recounted how surreal it was to see a dog standing on its hind legs. I don't know if it ran for a few ticks and then stood up again at intervals in the field, but that's the way they describe it. Many times I asked them, are you sure it wasn't a bear? Nope, it was definitely a dog standing on its hind legs, a big dog that was stalking them. This is in the Lane County, Oregon in the year 2000. There are few, if any, bears out there. It would be odd, but then again I wasn't there. The kids got in the car, sped off, leaving the pigs at dog to do its own business. I've never had any reason to doubt any of their stories, in fact, Sarah doesn't like to talk about the incident because it's just too creepy for her to recall. When I took the plane to Istanbul with my classmates in 2012 or 2013, I saw somewhere over the route from Germany to Turkey, a weird black round object in the sky. When I told my female friend who was sitting next to me, we both started freaking out and filmed the entire thing. But you can't see it on our cell phones since there were too many water droplets on the window and that black thing was too far away. It was something small and round and some other round object was flying around the main object surrounded by black smoke. It was so beautiful. I was sure it was some technology from the government I regret not screaming inside the plane and making everyone aware of it. Imagine everyone if they'd have seen it. They'd have freaked out, and our plane would have probably gone missing. What if it was top secret? But jokes aside, I'll never forget this incident. When I told my aunt, she told me that I was too stressed and needed to take a break as I was imagining things. My next two encounters where I saw something strange, I can't explain either. 
I was in elementary school, sixth grade. I was outside going to our PE classes with my female friend in tow, when I wanted to get inside this building. I saw in front of me some kind of small white cloud passing by. As weird as it sounds, it was flying by really fast. I told my friend, and she also saw it. But we didn't talk about it again until later. I remember I saw this kind of cloud in my young age again. I don't remember where it was, but I remember I saw this cloud twice. I believe that we were living in a dimension where we can't see everything. For example, that cats and dogs can see things we cannot. Perhaps that cloud was from somewhere where we weren't supposed to see it. I tried finding information on Google regarding both incidences, but I have found nothing. There is one final entry. When I was a child, I slept next to my mother. One night, someone came and put my arm up, which hurt me so I screamed. The person ran away, and my mum asked me what happened. She told me I shouldn't be scared, that it was my dad. Until today, I can't believe this. When asking my parents, they tell me it was my dad who came and tried to change my bad sleeping position. I can't believe this, because why would he run away when I started to scream and cry? He's not like that. Not to mention the person or thing I saw looked scary. It was dark, and he was pitch black looking, and I could only see his eyes. All I could see was a silhouette. Believe me or not, since then I've had bad dreams of this person every night when I fall asleep on my left side. I remember my mum told me once when we were sleeping on our left side that we have bad dreams. Maybe she was joking, but it left a big impact on me. Every night, I tried to make sure I didn't sleep on my left side so that I wouldn't see that person again. I saw him several years later. It was a real trauma for me, and I really don't think it was my dad. Finally, there's one more. I was with my family in the living room. All my cousins were there. They'd come from the Netherlands to visit. In the evening, we were telling each other creepy stories. After that, we went into the living room, watched some TV and talked. Suddenly, I saw the other room, where lights were still turned on. I could see on the wall the shadow of a water bottle, but there was something round and huge flying around it. Actually, I kept staring at it and wondering what it could be. Then it stopped. It was very strange. I wish I knew what it was. My fiancé and I are hugely into camping. This particular season, where the incident happened, we discovered the perfect little hideaway clearing way out in the Crown Land, about an hour west slash north of Cremona. We had made about six trips out there already, some with large groups of friends, and some with just a couple of us. So we were starting to become quite familiar with the area we were exploring. This specific trip was a bigger one. We had about 10 people with us, one of whom is my lifelong best friend of 18 years. To add a little bit of context to this, my best friend and I strongly believe in extraterrestrials and paranormal events. So much so that we successfully signaled a UFO on a beach when we were 12. But that's a story for another time. My best friend and I, Kaylee, were talking about the UFO on the beach around the campfire with everyone. A choice few people were more interested than others. Five of us decided it would be a really cool and super smart idea to try signaling something again. Before we used a flashlight to create a specific pattern of flashes into the sky. So why not try again? I remember the pattern and after all, we grabbed a few flashlights, laid down near the beach, and began flashing lights into the sky. 
The first few minutes consisted of nothing but our half inebriated giggles. But then Kaylee spoke up and asked if we were seeing what she was. We all focused hard on the sky. And lo and behold, there was a flickering light twice as prominent as the other stars, even Venus. I staggered in all directions for a few seconds before setting on a steady trail over the tree line until we couldn't see it anymore. Thoroughly spooked, we jogged back to camp to tell everyone else what happened. Of course, most of them brushed it off as us acting like little drunks. But we all saw the exact same thing. Strange lights in the sky forgotten, we spent the next few hours around the fire with everyone. One of the more skeptical guys in the group went off to pee, but stopped right at the entrance to the clearing and said something along the lines of, uh, what is that? Which caused the rest of us to see what he was looking at. Just a quick pause to set the scene. Our clearing that we camped in is smaller, only about 30 feet, set back into a tree line roughly 15 to 20 yards from the dirt road that runs through the crown land. Directly across the road from our spot is a small river backing out onto the thick forest and low mountains for miles. When we got to the entrance, we saw a massive brilliant spotlight shining over the highest mountain peak across the road. It almost looked like the sunrise, except it was 1am and entirely in the wrong direction. Someone's immediate reaction was to say it was a truck, but that was quickly discounted because we knew the roads and the trails around there and they certainly didn't go up the mountain. Another theory was that it might have been a combine since there are plenty of farms around the area. More likely, except this light was so big it looked like the source would have had to have been as big as a medium sized yacht. As we were arguing about the possibilities, the light started to slowly beam across the mountaintop, like it was moving sideways, definitely not a combine. The light would have had to have pointed in the direction it was moving instead of focusing on our direction the whole time, just slowly riding left and right. We all started staring at it in awe, at this weird light for about 10 more seconds until it darted back across the ridge to its original position. All the while still shining towards us. It moved way too fast for a vehicle or farm equipment and we no longer had any theories of what it was coming from. A very few short seconds after it stopped, it faded away so slowly you couldn't even tell it was dimming unless you looked away for a second or two. Eventually it disappeared completely thoroughly creeped out and chilled to the bone from the early September weather, we quickly made our way back to the fire. None of us can explain the light we saw that night, but it definitely left us all with a very uneasy feeling. I had nightmares the remaining two nights we were there, but there were no more unexplainable events after that. The following stories are from an uncle on my mother's side. He's a considerably conservative man in his approach to most things, from political to taste in film, as he generally considers any cinema post 1950s to be absolute garbage. And I feel I should mention his disdain for the genres of horror and science fiction in entertainment before I continue. That said, I was surprised when a few years ago, I made a passing comment regarding alien abduction. For the life of me, I have no idea what prompted this. And he spoke seriously and mentioned two encounters of his own. He seemed excited to share the stories and enjoyed me listening to them. The first took place inside of a flat he rented in the mid eighties. The location was Stretford Road, Manchester, UK. Apparently, my uncle looks out of his bedroom window when a flying saucer appears directly opposite and sits still in the air. There are a row of windows separating the top and bottom of this saucer and inside are the shapes of people moving around. The saucer idles for around 10 seconds and then 
completely disappears. To this day, he claims the story to be genuine. Then, around the mid 80s, somewhere in Manchester, UK, my uncle used to be a mechanic. He was working at a friend's car at home, and needed a particular part, as the one he's looking at is severely damaged. He takes the part to another garage, hoping to negotiate price on a replacement, and asks the only guy working there, if he has one. The guy smiles, takes the part from my uncle, and then returns 10 seconds later with the same part, and one completely identical. By identical, I mean that my uncle described it as a duplicate of the original, damaged in the exact same places, with the same blemishes and tells. Confused, my uncle takes the part from the mechanic, and as he studied them, the mechanic bursts into hysterics. Thinking it's a prank, my uncle calls Bull, and asks where he got the part, to which the mechanic replies that, he made it. My uncle left the shop with both parts, dumbfounded as how the mechanic had produced the identical part. Without reason, my uncle insists that this mechanic was an alien or something otherworldly. But I always thought his mind was tilted towards this explanation, as per his alleged saucer experience. As for a possible explanation, it makes sense that car parts would be subject to similar examples of damage, and perhaps the mechanic in question noticed my uncle's part looked uncannily similar to one of his own, and saw room for a prank. Certainly explains the laughter. I'll have to apologise for the sparsity of detail in this one. I regret it was hard to find these out. I always thought of this story as its best to be weird, and at its worst to be casually explainable. I live surrounded by the forest, about a mile away from a haunted lake. I have recurring and painfully vivid nightmares of what I always assume are wendigos and skimwalkers, staring into my window or coming out of the woods, or coming into my home, almost weekly. Prior to these, I haven't had any nightmares since I was perhaps seven or eight. I never ever knew of the idea of humanoids before these nightmares began. They're actually the reason I've been researching everything the past few months. I've heard some creepy stuff at night as well. Notably when I'm outside in my hot tub at around 1 to 3 a.m. and can hear large branches snapping closer and closer to my house, and scuffled steps. I always assumed it was an animal, but now I'm not so sure. July 13th, 2017. My friends and I went to get ice cream at night. Snapchat says it was around 10 p.m. when the photos were taken. So it was within the 9.30 to 10.30 time frame. I live in a heavily wooded mountainous and desolate area of southern Pennsylvania. I'm actually in the Lycan Loop, an area where humanoids and supernatural creatures are often reported in Pennsylvania. I also live about a half hour away from both Camp David and Raven Rock Mountain. Fun fact. I've been to Camp David, and it's a pretty creepy place. Some believe that humanoids could be due to the government, which is why I've included it. Anyway, we were driving back home from getting ice cream, and just having fun, and I decided to take photos of my friends in the back seat. I was probably snapchatting someone, and just sending photos back and forth. I took two photos and in the first one, something creepy appeared in the rear window. I immediately saved it, and looking back at the window, but neither me or my friend in the back could see anything. I took another picture for good measure, but it was no longer there. I took these pictures in total darkness with flash on. I highly doubt 
This could be some sort of reflection or glare. There's no glares or reflections on any of the windows or any of the photos. In any other circumstances, I take photos like this. I see no glares or reflections. That being said, why is the face so bright and easy to see? Was it just a trick of the phone? So as a kid, I loved to burn spiders. It's something that now I think of, and it sounds horrifying. But at that age, I didn't even care. So as soon as I found a spider, I let my mother know, and she would burn it with an enormous lighter. I don't really know how many times or how many spiders we incinerated, but my bet is that it's an enormous amount. It's worth noting that when you burn a spider, it gets stiff, and the legs get rolled in, and at the end, you get a sphere-shaped spider, and if you pay close attention, you will hear the crunching of the poor little thing. This was the main procedure whenever I found a spider, and it was fun for me and my brothers, except for the one spider, the last one we burnt. I remember that I was playing with my brother. We were running all over the house, and we suddenly saw a spider. It was the most ugly thing in the world. Thin legs, yellow, with black and green stripes all over it. It was the biggest spider I have ever seen so far. Not that big to be a tarantula though. So we run back to the kitchen where my mother was. We told her that we had found a spider. At this point, she knew what to do already, so we didn't have to tell her. She picks the lighter and goes with us. The spider was standing on the corner of a room. My mum uses the lighter, and as soon as the flame touches the spider, we hear this extremely loud scream all over the room, and only inside that room. It was like a baby screaming. Remember that I told you it was worth noting what happens to spiders when they get burnt? Well, this spider was different. It literally turned into dust, black and extremely thin, and there was no trace of the spider. I mean, not even a half burnt leg, it just completely turned to dust. From that day on, if I happened to find a spider, let's say that I'm at my friend's house, I kind of feel something in the corner, and guess what? There'd be a spider there. There's also a lot of spider activity in my bathroom. My father finishes his shower, and he actually checks to see if there are any insects before. And after the experience, I can't stand spiders, and I get paralyzed whenever I see one. And after he would check, he'd go out of the bathroom, and when I would get in, I'd remove the curtain, and there would be a spider in the middle of the tub as if it were waiting for me. Here in Mexico, there are legends of Nahuales, which are humans that can turn into animals and insects, and that there are some people who believe that I may have burnt one. Since it was like a baby screaming, people say it might also be a baby that was turned into a spider by a witch. What do you think? As for my fear of spiders, I can't do much. I have also seen some experts, and they do not believe this story, so their therapies don't seem to work, which I understand, and I also accept the spider sighting like a punishment, for having been so aggressive with them in the past. The spider thing only happens with me, not my brother or my mother. I think it was because I was the one who enjoyed it the most, but I will never know. I was visiting my cousin's house. I have four cousins, two twin girls age 10, and then the older brother age 21 and 26. I was sleeping in the room with the cousin of age 21, and we heard stuff falling in the girl's room, right next to where we were. We assumed that it was just them playing, but then one of them started talking to the other, and they were across the room. So my cousin stepped out of the room to go check, and I watched over his shoulder through the doorway. Right as the girls were explaining that stuff was falling without provocation, a sort of humanoid thing came bursting out the closet. 
It looked human-esque, but was much longer and thinner, and ran on all four legs. It ran out of the house, broke the front door hinge, and straight through the screen by the door. We called the police immediately, and they were there within five minutes. They looked in a five mile radius and nothing was found. They gathered DNA from the door, and apparently, this thing was cut by the shattering wood on the door, and there were small amounts of blood on it. They ran tests, and it was determined to be inconclusive. They said it was similar to human DNA, but not in the way ape DNA is similar. It wasn't a human though, they knew that. So to this day, we have had no incidents with whatever this thing is. They still live in the house and have had no problems, but we have zero explanation for what happened and what that thing was and how it got into the house. I am of Navajo descent. I'm only one quarter. My grandfather is pure. This was quite a while ago, but every summer, we used to go and stay at my uncle's house. He has three floors, and the basement was pretty much the living room, and had a slope that went above ground. So it was only half underground, and had windows and everything. So for some odd reason, they leave these huge windows open at night. I've seen skinwalkers snooping around pretty often and mainly as distant silhouettes, or six foot tall coyotes. Could you just be normal? So I knew exactly what to expect when you voluntarily leave a window large enough for a person to easily climb through. Let's go off on a bunny trail real quick. This situation made me uncomfortable because of stories about when we were babies. My family was staying in my Nali's trailer and she had these individual square logs, and they woke up in the dark hours of the next morning to find all the locks on the floor and the doors wide open, and my brother missing a lock of hair. My Nali had to do some ritual or prayer or something to save him. It worked, by the way. He grew up to be successful and is currently following his dreams, but back on track. So we're all getting ready for bed, my grandma is sleeping on the couch, my brother and his friend are sleeping on the other couch, and me and my aunt were sleeping on a mattress behind the couch that my grandma was on. Everyone else went camping outside to skinwalker hunt. Everyone got settled and went to bed, and my aunt stole my pillow. Around one or so, I woke up feeling uneasy. I sat up and looked around. Everything appeared normal and nothing was in the windows, but the distant flashlights that we did often see, and I went back to sleep. So here it happens, 4 a.m. I roll on my left side and see my aunt sleeping peacefully, despite having rolled off our mattress. Her hair spread across the floor, and she was completely wrapped up cozy in her blankets. Everything is normal, until I realized that my aunt was on the right side of the bed and whatever this thing was, is not my aunt. This long black hair was not hers, and her knee, that was somewhat exposed, was some joint. It was not human. Nonetheless, you know if you get greatly injured or afraid, you either become incapacitated with fear or filled with adrenaline, right? I filled with adrenaline. I reached up my arm and grabbed the couch and flipped myself over to the other side. I woke up my grandma in doing so, and I told her to stay awake but to stay quiet, and it began to move around the couch and back out the window. It was so odd though, the way it moved so smoothly, it was kind of like the Heartless from Kingdom Hearts, very snake-like. It must have been 20 years ago, when my brother-in-law saw what we can only describe as a lizard or reptile man. This happened in the mountain towns of Xochimilco, Mexico City. I remember it was the time when he was still dating my sister. 
and one night after hanging out with her at our place, he went back home. I recall it was a few minutes past 11, and he used to drive a Volkswagen Beetle. And that night, he headed uphill for San Francisco where he lived. He had to take a road surrounded by trees, pine trees. To his left side was the hill, and he told us that when he got around the curve, he reached a dark, rocky place. The rocks were huge and it was pitch black. He was driving very fast, as he was used to, and so he turned on his high beam headlights. After doing it, he could see some movement from the corner of his eye, and within a few seconds, right in front of him, he saw a huge creature crossing the road in just two steps, which immediately reached the other side of the road, where a tall wall made out of stone was built. He couldn't say if the creature went through the wall, jumped over it, or went down some kind of ditch, but the animal disappeared. He only remembers that it was pretty tall with a humanoid form, two arms, two legs, a head, but had a tail. He said that if it had been someone in a costume, he would have dragged his tail, but he recalls that it never touched the ground. Instead of a mouth, it had a turtle-like beak, and since he had his high beams on, he could see it very clearly, and described the skin as greyish. I used to make fun of him for saying he'd been smoking too much weed or something, but later on, we found out that other people living nearby had also seen it. That was just about the time when two of my dogs went missing. One day one of them got lost while we were walking in those woods. He was walking ahead of me, and went out of sight while running downhill. I heard him whimper once, and never saw him again. When I heard it, I ran to the place I thought he had gone to, but I couldn't find him. There were houses down the hill where some dogs lived, but I never heard them bark or anything had passed by. I looked for him everywhere on several occasions. He wasn't hit by a car, and I have no clue what happened to that dog. Those were the times when we had no idea why the army used to go up into the mountains very frequently, and wouldn't let anyone else in. They were supposedly training, and a lot of soldiers camped there. And every week, new soldiers would arrive to replace the ones from the past week. We thought it was a strange coincidence, and so that's what happened. A lot of people have claimed to seeing this creature, although I never saw it. Nonetheless, whenever I went into the hills, I had this strange and weird feeling of being watched. My husband and I recently moved out of Georgia, but before we left, we were staying at his parents' house. His parents' house is newly built, so it doesn't really seem like the type of place to be feeling like something is out of place. At his parents' house, they have cameras everywhere. They both are police officers. Like I said, it doesn't feel like the kind of place something would go wrong. Around three days before our move out of state, it was roughly around 9.30 at night, as I was using the restroom and craving a snack. So after I went into our bedroom where we were staying, which is a finished basement, I persuaded my husband into getting a snack with me. I walked out of the room first, but as I got to the door of our bedroom, I got the feeling like someone was behind it. So I slowly opened the door and looked behind it. Nothing was there. So I shrugged it off, closed the door, and continued into the kitchen. A few minutes later, my husband came into the kitchen and asked if I was hiding behind the door before he opened it. I told him no, but that I felt like someone was also behind the door as I opened it. I forgot to mention this earlier. His dad was on duty and his mum was with one of his siblings at one of their football games. 
So essentially we were alone. We both felt uneasy, but let it go. His siblings and his mum came home 15 to 20 minutes later, and we forgot about it. Fast forward to us living in our new apartment. I forgot to mention, but we have a dog, Alex, who's a pointer, and we have a cat, Freya. And just a little insight by apartment. It's basically a townhouse. We have a garage and an upstairs. No one is below or under us. We've been living in the apartment for about four months, and every now and then, Alex will look up into the attic and slightly turn his head, and sometimes all the hairs on his back will stand up like no tomorrow, and he will get in this defensive mode. Freya's eyes will go wide, and she'll creep around to wherever Alex is staring. Some may think this is completely normal for a hunting dog and a domestic cat, but not to me, as I'm the one who's been with them since birth, and have a little more knowledge on how they normally act. And since I do, I'll give my point of view on how they normally are. Alex, he's the sweetest, most gentle dog you'll ever meet. He loves Freya and small babies. He lets dogs rough him up at the park because he's just too gentle and will not fight back. Freya is laid back and doesn't care. She acts like a 20 year old cat, but barely a year old. Anyway, continuing on. The other day, my husband was in our home office and he thought I'd snuck up on him and was hovering over his shoulder. But when he turned around, I wasn't there and he realized I was still at work. I just want to know what we've experienced and what it could mean. A number of years ago, I was coming home late at night. I was driving and minding my own business. I had just been seeing a friend. It couldn't have been past 11. And as I was making my way across the road, doing the 15 minute journey back home, do I notice something in the distance? Lights flickering in the sky. Bear in mind, this is the 1980s. And I understand it to be a plane and think nothing more of it. As I continue my journey through the winding countryside, do the lights start to become a bit brighter? I wonder if they're getting closer, which is slightly concerning, but I try to put it to the back of my mind as I'm nearly home. But within a very short amount of time, the lights shoot ever closer towards my direction until I think they're gone. And finally, I look up and notice that they are above me. It's at this point, I just about crap myself. I have no idea what's about to happen. I keep driving, unsure of what to do. And the lights are completely silent, flashing down on my vehicle. I try driving faster, but they noiselessly and effortlessly keep speed. I'm starting to get terrified. What is this? Who are they? What do they want? I drive home as quickly as I can. And just when I'm about to round the corner to pull into our driveway, the lights are gone. I pull up, exit my vehicle and look out into the sky. I can't see anything. Was it all in my head? I try and hope that it is. I try and dismiss the whole event and forget it ever happened. When a few days later, I'm meeting up with my friend and he looks at me and is rather pale. I ask him what's up and he tells me in a confidential tone that something strange happened to him. He says he saw lights in the sky and that they chased him while he was driving. I look at him in incredulity and confess the same thing happened to me. I asked him what noise the thing made, and he said it was completely silent, and it was one of the scariest encounters of his life. Upon realizing we both had the same event, we kept it quiet. We didn't want people to think us crazy. We tried not to speak of it again, but it's always played on my mind what we really saw 
and what was following us in our small town. The Navajo Reservation is the largest reservation in the US. It goes into New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, and Arizona. This story takes place in the northeastern region of Arizona, near Indian Wells. This was told by people from around that area. If you're heading west on State Highway 15, out towards Dilken, you come to a stretch of road that goes into a small valley. I remember going down this road in my youth. If you looked at the horizon, it would seem as if the road kept going. Then suddenly, your car would be pulled down by gravity as you followed the road. It would always give me butterflies when we would go down this slope. When I heard this story about this road, it made my stomach feel different. A man was driving home one night, and it was very late. It was a drive that he had done before, so he wasn't too bothered by it. When you are driving on the reservation, sometimes there isn't any way to keep cattle from getting on the road. No fences means that you need to be extra aware. I was always told to look for the black horse. If you see a black horse, then you'll be able to see anything else that may wander in front of the path of your vehicle. So this man is driving home, not paying too much attention, and he drives down the slope. But as soon as he gets to the bottom of the valley, he sees it, but doesn't have enough time to react. Suddenly a horse comes out of the darkness, he slams on his brakes, but is unable to stop and hits the horse with his truck. The impact was not enough to deploy the airbags, but the man was tossed around quite a bit by the incident. He turns on his emergency lights and gets out of the car to assess the damage. The front of the car was crumpled and one of the headlights was destroyed. He cursed out loud. This was one of the worst places to have an accident, and he didn't have a signal to phone for help. Then he remembered the horse. The man went into the cab of his truck, got out a small keychain flashlight, and started shining around looking for the wounded animal. He heard noises, but they didn't sound like a horse. He was positive that he had hit a horse. As he approached the sounds, he could see the animal's fur moving from its ragged breathing. As he got closer, he began to realize what it was. It was a naked elderly woman, wrapped in a large pelt. She was moaning from pain. The man stopped dead in his tracks and got weak from fear. He stumbled back to his truck and although he suffered plenty of damage, he was able to get it started and drove off. Once he was able to get signal, he called the authorities. An ambulance drove out there and recovered the woman. She was driven to a local healthcare facility due to the fact that many of the healthcare staff were Navajo. No one wanted to touch her. The woman was known in the community and she was thought to be bedridden. This was shocking, because she was so far from home, and the state she was in was immensely off-putting. She still had on her attire when she arrived at the hospital. The nurses called her family to come in. When the family got there, they removed her pelt and her jewellery. The staff were very frightened, but there were some non-Navajo staff that still provided her with care. The elderly woman only had bumps and scraps. Other than that, she seemed fine. She was able to get up and walk around that same evening. She went home with her family that night, but after a couple of days, she had passed. In the Navajo culture, if you find out who a skinwalker is, you have the power to destroy them. After the community around Indian Wells found out who, or more fittingly, what 
this woman was, it was for certain that her time was at an end. Out on the Navajo reservation, we don't have the city come and collect our trash. So we burn our trash in these huge burning barrels. Not very eco-friendly, I know, but that's what we've got to do. If you don't light the trash properly, the fire will go out and sit in the barrel. This is important because we are told to dispose of personal hygiene items correctly. If you removed all your hair from your brush, make sure the trash burned. If it was that time of the month, make sure that trash burned. If you changed a baby's diaper, make sure the trash burned. They tell us these things because skinwalkers have been known to dig through the trash in order to find things that they can use against us. They use the things that we were briefly connected to, to bring misfortune to us using these items. Some of my family members take part in the sport of rodeo. So to practice, they have a roping dummy and take turns roping it. My two male cousins were enjoying themselves outside and taking turns swinging the rope at the fake calf. The elders are always adamant that we shouldn't stay up past sundown, especially on the res, where it's pitch black and no one is around for miles. But my cousins aren't the superstitious type, and they were under the streetlight. My cousins are joking and laughing, having a great time, and that changes when my eldest cousin looks over to the burn barrel. A dark figure is bent over and rummaging through the garbage that failed to burn. My cousins devise a plan that they're going to grab a weapon, sticks and rocks and go chase whatever it is. They move strategically so that they are able to flank the figure. They run at full speed at it and begin yelling and swinging their sticks and throwing their rocks. My cousin stated that they kept up with it for the most part. That was until the figure ran under the streetlight. What my cousin thought was it was probably a person or a goat. Why would they think that it was a person though? Because the goat was running on its hind legs. They stopped running and fear ran down their backs as the figure ran off into the dark. Feeling nervous and not entirely accepting what they'd just seen, they began roping the dummy again. There was an awkward silence amongst the boys now. They just saw something unnatural, but talking about it now would make it seem real. Were they crazy? Did they really see a skinwalker? The boys roped the dummy in silence until one of them looked over to the tree. There was a head peeking out at them. If they didn't pay attention to it, whatever it was would poke its head out from behind the tree and stare. When they would look in the direction of the tree, it would quickly move back and out of sight. This was the final straw, and my cousins ran back into the house. They told their parents, and my uncle came out to look. It was still there, poking its head out and going back behind the tree. My uncle loaded his gun, and started walking towards it. He aimed and pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. The gun jammed. Whatever it was began to run, but it was so fast, like a blur, as my cousins describe it. When it left, my uncle came in and gave the boys a thorough lecture on staying out late. The next day, my cousin told my uncle that whatever it was had been digging through the trash barrel. They went to investigate, and the creature had pulled a lot of things out the barrel. What was odd was the tracks. Goat prints were all around the area. They followed the set of tracks, and they found a baby diaper several feet away from the barrel. Whatever they saw that night had a very malevolent intention. My cousins say that although the sight was ungodly, they know what they saw and stand by their claim. I've worked the night shift for a long time. One of the scariest experiences I had was when I worked at an abandoned factory. Now, apparently, the owners of the factory were waiting for some permissions to tear it down and build something new on the land. But in the meantime, 
it had to be protected. The job itself was simple enough, and not very creepy, as we hardly ever had to go into the building. We simply had to patrol the perimeter and ensure that no doors had been opened and that no one was about. Now, something that was always a bit of an inconvenience was the fact that the toilet was about a five minute walk from my station. But I am a guy and the station boarded woods, woods that extended for miles. So oftentimes, assuming all I needed to do was a whiz, I'd just go and do my business in the woods. It's not like anyone was around to see what I was doing. Anyway, on to the story. It was your typical night, and I believe it was sometime around 4am. I was just scrolling through Reddit on my phone, seeing if I can read anything interesting, perhaps immerse myself in a spooky story. When nature's call urged me to get up, and I approached the tree line, a way I had done hundreds of times. I always carry my flashlight, but the light from the small hut was enough so that I could just walk out into the darkness and do my business quickly and privately. However, upon reaching the tree line, did I hear something? Now, it isn't the first time I've heard something. Most of the times it's just an animal moving around in the brush. So I ignored it as I did my business. As I'm just zipping myself up and turning around to leave, do I notice something in the tree line? Eyes. At least, I think it's eyes. I hear twigs cracking from underneath the weight of whatever this thing is, and I stare at it blankly for a moment. I whip out my flashlight and shine it directly at this thing. I don't even know what it was, but it was about eight feet tall, brown fur, standing on two legs, and it was just watching me. The moment the flashlight hit it though, it covered its eyes and ran back into the tree line. I noped out of there and back into my station, locked the door, and occasionally would peep out the window to make sure it wasn't looking at me, after of course, switching off all the lights. I waited in the dark listening, and didn't do any more of my rounds until daylight. I quit after that. No way did I want to encounter that thing again. I was there for a while, so I feel myself lucky to not have encountered it sooner. I live in the woodlands part of the upper panhandle near Pittsburgh. While some of the town is buildings and restaurants, when you leave town, it gets pretty scary. We have what I think is a natural reserve called Tomlinson Run. They have hiking and camping trails. To set the scene, it was a very muggy summer day around mid-June with heavy rain. I was out with my friends going on a camping trip in the woods. We were going to go into the woods, but it was easier just to get a small cabin. They provide you with a fire pit around the back near the tree line. We were sitting at the fire having a few beers when it started to pour rain. The heavy brush of trees over the top of us hid us from the rain for the most part, so we stayed out near the fire. Once it started to fall off the leaves, we decided to call it a night. While packing up and being pretty tipsy, my friend Alex went to take a whiz. The only bathrooms in the park are at a building about a mile away, so it was common to just do your business by a shack. Keeping the fire dimly lit while we were packing proved to be a challenging task. All of a sudden, while peeing, he turned around and started yelling to go inside. Him, not being one to joke around and having a serious tone, persuaded us to move our quiches. We grabbed all of our chairs and firewood and hauled it into the cabin. He came in about 10 seconds after us and locked the door. 
He explained that he saw a wolf along the tree line off to our right stalking us, maybe looking for an easy snack. Now, to make sure you get the layout of the cabins, I'll explain. Each cabin had four beds and one platform in the roof that someone could sleep in. The two beds are bunkers, and each had a window above the first bed and below the second. There was also a window on the top bed. The cabin was designed like an old Indian cabin, with a round room and squared off walls. Being a cheap $50 a night cabin, there were no lights or power outlets in this one. We expected this, having been there several times, so we brought flashlights and portable chargers. Once we got inside, we all kind of just laid there planning out our next day, since there were four of us. I decided to sleep on the second floor bed, and took the ladder up and pulled it to form a railing. We all dozed off as it had been a long day. About halfway through the night, what I would guess to be around 2am, I woke up to find my friend James sprinting into the room screaming. Apparently he had been outside peeing when he thought he heard a wolf howl, but in a deep tone. This was strange, as we had never seen many wolves around, and they usually had high-pitched howls. When he went on to say that when he turned to look to where he heard the noise, he saw something standing on two feet, with claw-like hands looking back at him. This freaked us all out, and we decided not to go outside until the morning. We all got back into our beds, and I turned over and tried to fall asleep. I had a very uneasy feeling in my stomach, and felt as if someone was watching me. I rolled over and looked out the window, and that's when I saw it. It was crouching down facing away from me, but its head was turned, staring at me. As soon as I realised I was looking, it stood up and sprinted away. Not like any sprint or person I'd ever seen. It was about eight feet tall and ran like an Olympian. I tried to brush it off as a hallucination, but I knew that what I had seen was real. The next day we all agreed to leave, and I told my friends in the car what I had seen. Alex then said that's what he saw when he was peeing, but didn't want to freak us out, so he stayed quiet. I wasn't sure what it was until I researched it some more. To this day, I haven't been back to that campsite or into the woods. Sometimes, when I'm walking at night around my neighbourhood, I can feel eyes on me. And I know exactly what is watching me. I had just gotten out of my boyfriend's car outside my house, and had walked around the front of the car to kiss him goodbye. Two houses down, there was a street light, and all I saw from the corner of my eye was a black figure that was around six to seven feet tall. Keep in mind, when I went around the car initially, it wasn't there, but in the little time it took me to say goodbye, it had showed up right near the street light. From where I stood, it was two houses down. I was terrified, and asked my boyfriend if he saw the deer too and he told me it wasn't a deer, and to slowly back away towards my house. Neither of us stopped looking at it, because we were scared it was going to move. What I saw was a six to seven foot, solid black figure. It had the body of a wolf, tall but not overly wide. It had what looked to be antlers on its head. It was a dark shade of black, to where even in the light you couldn't really see major details, just an outline. The thing didn't move much, or fast at all, but when I first looked, it had its head down and turned away from me. But as I was backing away, it turned its head, facing straight towards me. Like I said, it was hard to see details, but its eyes were a deep blood red. I was absolutely terrified. It didn't move, just held its gaze in my direction, and I made the mistake of staring into its eyes. 
It was almost like a trance. I couldn't move away or walk anymore because I was petrified of moving. It didn't move or turn its head until my dad opened the door to ask what was happening. I kept my gaze and it turned and ran off into the woods behind the house two doors down. It ran very fast and seemed to sway while running. It ran like a big cat would, where it sways and runs low. Not like a wolf or deer would run tall, bouncing up with each step. I went inside and asked my dad if he could go over the video surveillance, since we have cameras pointing outwards from all directions except the backyard. When we went to watch over it, we saw a dark shade of something tall and big. It seemed like a blob of black, which was weird, since the cameras are night vision and heat sensitive. They picked up on cats and dogs at all times of the night, and they showed up in white. However, this huge shade moving in the same direction as where I saw the figure showed up as black. My dad deleted the video. Because of his views on subject retaining to paranormal or supernatural. When my current boyfriend brought up the topic of skinwalkers, and explained to me what it was, we looked into it. I never cared much about what it was or why it was here. Just seeing whatever the thing was terrified me. But even to this day, just over two years from seeing it, my dad won't even talk about it. And until now, neither would I. If you have any answers or ideas, I'm open to hearing about what this thing could be. My cousin lived in the Eastern Agency of the Navajo Nation, in a community known as Crow Point. She was still living with her parents at this time, and was a good girl. She had good grades, a nice ride, and was very popular and played on the basketball team. When she told us this story, it was very out of the ordinary, and the events that followed would also deepen my beliefs in the traditional Navajo way, and the taboos associated with the Navajo culture. My cousin was coming home from basketball practice, which ran past sunset. It was during the colder months, and so it was dark by the time she pulled into her neighbourhood. She pulled into the small housing community that she lived in. It was far from a fenced community, but there were streetlights, and the neighbourhoods weren't too far from each other. And, as she neared her home, she saw a group of dogs. This wasn't unlikely, as there were a random pack of stray dogs that roamed rural communities. These dogs didn't belong to anyone, and they get food wherever they could get it. As she got closer, she noticed that something was off about the dogs. There were four dogs, and they were sitting in a circle all facing each other. This really didn't faze her, until she spoke about the event later. Because this was a housing community, my cousin couldn't barrel down the road, so she drove slowly past the group of dogs and kept going on her way. As she continued to drive, she noticed in her peripheral vision that something was running alongside her car. She turned her head to see that a brown dog from the group was trotting alongside her car. She didn't mind until she was hit by a strategically placed speed bump. The impact of the bump made her entire car wobble. She looked over at the dog again, still casually keeping pace with the car. She tried to ignore the dog and tried speeding up, keeping in mind where the speed bumps were placed. The dog continued to keep pace. My cousin had to eventually stop at a bus sign. She began to feel immensely uncomfortable and tried to keep her eyes forward, but curiosity got the better of her. She looked over at the dog. It was facing forwards. She continued to stare. And that is when the dog turned its head. Instead of the face of a dog, there was the flat face of a man covered in hair and smiling from ear to ear. Fear shot through her body. My cousin pushed the pedal to the floor, not daring to look back in her rearview mirror. She reached her house 
and barely pulled herself into the door, weak from fear. My aunt came to her, and my cousin began to sob. She told my aunt everything, and they scheduled a meeting with the medicine man the next day. That night, when my cousin was trying to get some rest, she was tossing and turning, and felt very ill. She could hear people laughing outside, and speaking in Navajo, but she didn't think too much of it, because she lived in a community near plenty of neighbours. At the medicine man, he told my cousin that she was very fortunate. The skinwalker wasn't meant for her. She just happened to spot it, while it was out to bring another person misfortune. He also told her that the laughing and the talking she had heard in the night was the skinwalker talking to his friends, letting them know that someone had seen him and that he had scared her. The medicine man told my cousin that if the skinwalker had been there for her, and she had seen him like that, it could have very well killed her. After that encounter, my cousin suffered from many ailments and had to stop playing basketball for a while. She had many ceremonies and eventually got back to her feet. My mum told us this story on the many nights that our electricity went out. When I asked my cousin about it, she confirms it to be true although she doesn't like talking about it much. When I was 13, my mum decided I would be going to military boarding school. It was located north of Mexico in a place called Durango. Durango is known because it is home to many creepy things, drug cartels, the zone of silence, ghost towns, UFO sightings and the like. I was in that school for around six years, and one day a friend invited me and other students to go to his hometown to have some tacos with his dad, a well-known rancher. When we arrived to the town, we were on his house having some drinks, and eventually he decided it was time to go. We hopped into his pickup truck, and he began driving right when the sun was setting. After about half an hour, everything was dark, and he had to turn on the headlights. I was on the front seat with my friend, and we've just arrived to the place. He slowed down his car, and we could hear the nocturnal wildlife and some scratches on the car from branches and plants. The headlights allowed us to see just enough to distinguish shapes. He stopped the car right in front of a little lake and we could see some bushes and trees around the water. A few meters in front of the right headlight, we could see what we thought was a rock. The guys started unloading the truck while they joked around. My friend and I were still in the front smoking, when all of a sudden he said, Did you see that? While he pointed to the rock in front of the car with the tip of the cigarette. That just moved. Since I've always wanted to see something paranormal, I remained still. We were both looking at this rock, when all of a sudden, the thing turned its head to face us, with, I thought, what looked like the face of Gollum. Big, round, yellow eyes, an arched back. And I turned to my friend, he grabbed his gun, and quickly got out of the car and fired two shots into the sky. All of this while people are still unloading the truck, and making a fire for the grill and such. I heard a few scream. I saw how this creature looked up to the sky, turned around, and hopped into the water. Right after that, everyone began asking, what happened? My friend told us that it was actually a common sight. He explained that his father and grandfather often saw the creature when they were hunting. He said that they called it Hombre Rana, or Frogman. Just a few of the guys saw the thing. We still had the tacos and everything. We were a little creeped out, but we assumed that the Frogman was probably more scared of us than we were of him. I saw many terrifying, creepy and odd things in Durango, but the frogman takes the cake. To this day, 
I keep wondering what happened to come across my sister. It was winter time here in the suburbs of North Virginia. I live with my family in a neighborhood not too far from Washington DC. So that's not to say we're in the middle of nowhere. Although our home is very close to a few decently large wooded parks. One night, I was at my then girlfriend's place up near the city. I got a phone call from my sister around seven, which in winter makes it pretty much nighttime here. I didn't think anything of it. Usually she calls me for random things she needs my insight on. I bet I'm up my sister. Ever since she was little, she loved horror movies. Growing up with her, I can tell you firsthand that she isn't easily scared and loves the paranormal. All right, back to the call. I picked up the phone and first thing I realized was her voice was breaking up. She was sobbing and could barely talk clearly. Instantly, my mind started rushing with horrible thoughts about what could have happened. She kept trying to tell me to come home as soon as possible. I asked her why and if everything's okay, and she wouldn't say. She just kept asking me to come home. Obviously, I got in my car and rushed home. The neighborhood is very dim. There aren't many lights on, only the few solar panel garden lamps from surrounding homes. And as soon as I got home, I ran inside and asked her again what happened. And she finally began explaining. About half an hour before she called me, she went outside to grab a few things from her car again. It was dark out, but when the car is unlocked, the headlights turn on. When she opened the door to the car, the light was shining from the driveway onto the roof of the garage. And she noticed it from the inside of the car, a short, bipedal human looking thing standing on two jet black muscular legs. At first she thought it was a raccoon. But this would have been obvious to her. But this thing, it scared her to the point of crying. While she was in the car, her view was obstructed from the rest of the creature, which was crouching. And from what she described was scratching at something on the roof trying to get in. Maybe but she wasn't going to just stick around to find out. She got out of the car pretending to not have spotted it. This thing, it acted in a seemingly intelligent way. She thought maybe if I act like I didn't see it, it would just stay up there and not try to attack me or anything. But as she walked behind the car, she heard it stand upright. Startled, she looked directly up at it. She gave me the following description. It was jet black, smooth, dolphin like skin with arms and legs, five digit hands and no claws, dead looking, very dirty and hair covering its head and body. The face is what was disturbing. The face had two shining yellow eyes that glowed from the car's headlights, no nose, just two slits and a very wide mouth with no lips. She took off when she made eye contact. And as soon as she was indoors, she called 911 and an officer was dispatched to our house. He looked around back to try and see if there was any damage or any sign of someone climbing on the roof, but there were no footprints nor damage. It was all in place. The officer just told us to lock the doors and windows and left. It's not like my sister to be terrified to the point of calling the police. Whatever this thing was though, I can only imagine what it was actually like to witness something like this in real life. To this day, both me and her get extremely uneasy, arriving home after dark, thinking that something might be waiting there for us. I saw an alien. No joke. To this day, I still wonder if I was somehow tripping on something I ate. I was about 10 years old and was playing in my room by myself. It was about 11 PM. I had a sliding glass door in my room and the blinds were pulled back. Out of nowhere, the automatic spotlight behind my house turned on. I looked to the sliding glass door and a figure started approaching the door. At first, I thought it was my neighbor, who was older than me, and about the same height. But as it got closer, I realized it was something else. 
I remember it approaching the door slowly. It stopped at the sliding glass door for a few seconds, and just started staring at me. It felt like an eternity passed by. Like, I remember specifically how long it felt, when in reality, it was probably only a few seconds. I remember it was dark black. It had a rounded head, just like you see in the movies, and was about six foot tall. Two arms, two legs, really skinny. The only thing is, that it was so close to me right on the other side of the glass, that there's no way I could have mistaken it for a human. I know what I saw. After a few seconds of staring at me, it just turned to the side and walked away. Long strides. It went out of view, and I immediately ran out of my room and screamed for my mum. She didn't believe me. I had to sleep in my room that night, knowing I had seen a legit alien a few feet away from me earlier. I'm now 23, and to this day I still get chills when I think about it. My eyes always start watering when I do think of it. I know it was not a dream. I know what I saw. But alas, no one believes me. The thing that creeps me out the most was its demeanour. I remember it coming slowly up to me, and walking slowly away. That's what scares me the most. Like there's no rush, it was just watching me. I believe in aliens, but I don't really believe in aliens visiting Earth, so it's been quite hard to cope with. I think what I saw is what people call a grey. If anyone else has seen anything like it, I'd love to hear about it. This is a story my family told me when I was growing up. We live in a rural community, on the Navajo Reservation. My aunt and her two brothers were home alone, while my grandparents had left for the evening to attend a chapter house meeting. They were in the house, and like many people from the reservation, they didn't have electricity. It had been dark outside for about an hour, and my aunt and my uncle were getting ready for bed. Outside they heard noises, as if someone were moving things around outside. My oldest uncle went to look out the front window, and saw a figure out by the trunk. This was immensely out of the ordinary, because the closest neighbour was miles away. Whatever it was opened the truck door, and began to dig through the personal items that my family had left out in the vehicle. My aunt and uncle were frightened by this sight, and knew that they should take action. They took out their rifles, and all steadied themselves to hold it up. They flung open the doors, and aimed the gun at the dark figure. The figure turned and walked towards them, totally unfazed by the weapon. My uncle pulled the trigger, but nothing happened. The figure drew closer, and my aunt began to smell something like a rotting corpse. It was so strong, it made her gag. My uncle continued to pull the trigger with no luck, and the figure came closer and closer, off in the distance. Headlights were coming up the road. My grandparents were returning. The figure looked towards the lights, and started to move away, and tucked itself behind a tree near the house. My oldest uncle ran towards the truck with a gun. My grandfather got out the car, and pointed at the tree. The thing was poking out its head to observe what they were doing. My grandfather ran into the house and over to the stove, and grabbed a handful of ashes, rubbed them over his gun, and placed an ash-covered bullet into the chamber. He walked out onto the porch, fired towards the tree, and whatever that thing was didn't expect the gun to go off. The gunshot echoed, and the dark figure began running. My grandma chased my aunt inside, 
and my uncles and my grandfather went after it. There weren't many roads or paths, and so my grandfather and uncle chased after the figure. The truck was bouncing, and the headlights were not fixed on one particular spot. My uncle swears that whenever their headlights would hit the figure, he saw a woman. Not only that, whoever it was running, ran on all fours like a bear. My grandfather eventually stopped the truck, and as they neared the ditch that dropped about 20 feet, he got out and began to yell in Navajo. My uncle says that he was yelling about a local woman. He yelled that he wasn't scared, and that he knew it was her, and to leave his family alone. A few days passed, and there was news that the woman that my grandfather was yelling about had passed. I've always been told if you know who the skinwalker is, say their name, and it will kill them. When I was younger, I lived back in my home state of Maryland, home of many things unexplainable, archaic, and supernatural. Of course, the Amish and Mennonites you see are nice, but even they fear what's out there in the primeval darkness of a full moon night. It was a cool autumn evening. The sun began to set, and the moon rose to meet it, embracing one another in a brief twilight before going their separate ways. The wind stirred the dying leaves from their branches and scattered them through the air, disturbing the stillness of the water as it glided across the lake's surface. Foxes rushed about through the tall grass, hunting muskrats and gophers alike, rabbits and hares as well. Birds sang sweet nightly laments as squirrels jumped from tree to tree, giving a playful chase as they scaled up and over the branches. Off in the distance, howling coyotes called to one another, barking and yipping to themselves as the stars dotted the sky. The final remnants of the daylight had faded. The moon rose to its ebony twinkling throne and cast down its light, pale and serenely beautiful. My family was inside having a good time, laughing, drinking and being merry overall. But I preferred solace and solitude over such, at the time, loud barbarity. There I sat, alone on the porch, staring at the moon's reflection on the lake, watching it ripple from the breeze, when a deep snarl from below the porch brought my attention back to reality. I paused and listened, hearing another deep snarl from below the porch, and was shaken, as whatever this thing was started to loot and shift through my grandfather's tools. Metal clanks against metal. Wooden beams were tossed about, and from what I could hear, nails were being dragged across brick. Heavy steps made their way into the backyard, and whatever belonged to them stood tall in the pale moonlight. A creature with auburn brown coloured hair, pointed ears, and a wolf like head, atop a lean and lanky body, with sharp claws as it stood in the backyard, basking in the moon's radiance. Nothing had happened for a few minutes, but then its ears perked up after my family got louder, and it turned to me on the porch, sniffing the air. My heart sank a little, and just as I thought something bad was going to happen, the beast puts one clawed finger to its curled snout and shushes me. After that, it slowly turned and walked closer to the tall grass, entering the woodline soon after, never to be seen again. My grandma was a practitioner of native medicine and ceremonies. She was what Navajo people call a crystal gazer, a hand trembler. People would often come and visit her and ask for healings or causes of their ailments. At times, people would ask her to help with protection from being attacked by evil entities. My grandma used to teach my aunt and her granddaughter the rituals and ceremonies, much like an apprenticeship. My cousin 
was one such person that my grandma had chosen to teach her shamanistic rituals. She would tell me the weirdest and scariest stories ever. One story she told me was about a pesky skinwalker that was attacking a neighbor of my grandparents. This skinwalker would go over to their homestead and tap on the windows, open the horse coral, knock over water bottles, and just be a pest to the family. It was thought that the skinwalker was sent because of a jealous man that was infatuated with a girl that lived there, and she had refused to date a certain person. That family had visited my grandparents and asked for help, but my grandma was reluctant. A few days later, the skinwalker returned. This time it harassed the sheep herder. Its attacks were relentless, and the sheep herder was frightened and ran over to the family house in the middle of the night. The father of the house told the sheep herder to calm down and go back to his house. The sheep herder kept saying that it was calling his name and he wanted it to stop. The father walked the sheep herder back to his house and walked around the house. He didn't see anything unusual. The next morning, the sheep herder didn't come over for breakfast and the father went to check on him. He didn't find him there and the front door was wide open. The father started to look for the sheep herder and it wasn't long until he found him. He had been strangulated by a barbed wire fence that was used as the sheep coral. The sheep were also gone, more than likely because the barbed wire had been taken off the fence. The family was distraught and visiting my grandma for help. My cousin told me about the ceremony they performed to get rid of it. She said the next morning they gathered some ingredients, a Navajo ceremonial basket and a crystal arrowhead. And she said that early in the morning before the sun rose, they began the ceremony. She held the basket and the arrowhead and they were buried under the ingredients while my grandma was singing. The arrowhead started to rise and levitate above the basket and it flew out of the basket and they kept singing until the sun came up. My cousin asked where the arrowhead had went and my grandma told her that the arrowhead took care of the skinwalker that was terrorizing the family. My cousin told me that the family had been freed from the skinwalker's curse and that they would not have to worry about it again. I live in Mexico, a country well known for its rich culture. However, many foreigners don't know about Mexico's paranormal scene. I work as an English teacher and sometimes I include conversation topics as part of my activities in the class. It is very common for Mexicans to start talking about paranormal stuff at school. There are even teachers who share their experiences from time to time. So, I decided to include a conversation about the paranormal in my class. As I expected, participation in the class rose, and everyone wanted to share their own experiences. Seeing that this activity was amusing and highly effective, I decided to repeat it in many of my groups. I got experiences about ghosts as usual, but something new came across. Now, Alice. Some people declare that things happened to them, and others claimed that some things happened to friends or relatives. Now, Alice, are people who can transform into animals or maybe animals who can transform into animal humans. Who knows? An experience with a Nawal is pretty much the same as always. People are having fun at night, might be at a party or just outside their home, and then someone comes seeking problems. It looks like a drunkard who just wants to fight or steal things, but after feeling threatened, it changes its shape. The most common animal tends to be a dog, I'm shocked by the fact that many people just told me this. This isn't on TV or over the internet. Bear in mind, my students are old folks who are engineers now, and I go to their companies and teach them English. 
So I have the opportunity to speak about this with people from different backgrounds of all walks of life, who certainly don't know each other. Even one of my students told me about how a friend got traumatised after seeing a man transform into a dog, and how this friend couldn't speak for three days, because he was in shock. Let it be known that a lot of crazy stuff happens within this country. This is one of the things that I remember almost as if it happened yesterday. I'm from Mexico. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of folklore slash legends from around these parts. This event happened a year ago. I don't remember my age, but I was probably around eight, and I am now 19. As a kid, I was very scared of the paranormal, and I can recall a couple of times something of the matter happening to me, but I have no proof, only vivid memories. At the time, I was quite friendly with the neighbour's kid. I even stayed in their house a few times, and did some travelling with them. There was one time we went to a little village called Chelma, that is known for being very religious, and having religious migration there. So we usually went to pray and then wash ourselves with the water from a special kind of tree, an awete. Either way, on the road to the village, there's a fairly dense forest of pines, and being the shy person that I am, I usually just look out the window. And after a few minutes just watching the trees, I saw a big black silhouette that was about two metres tall. It had red glowing eyes like a canine that you would expect from a werewolf. At first, I thought I was seeing things, so I just kept turning my head and checking my vision. The road we were going on meant that we were travelling at about 50 miles an hour, and going at this speed didn't make things look like we were travelling very fast. I kept watching it for two minutes, then it turned its eyes at me, looked at me, and as soon as I did, I reached for my friend and told him to look that way. He said there was nothing, but when I looked back, it was there. This happened at least three times until it just disappeared. I didn't tell anyone this story until years later. I thought it could be a Nawal, or something like that. But there's the absence of proof. I'm kind of sceptical about this, but I'd love to hear anyone's opinions on what it could be. It's been a couple of months since this happened. I live in a quiet village in the south of Germany. Next to our village is a rather large forest, with loads of hiking and biking tracks leading through it. When I was little, either my aunt or my dad took me there for walks, almost every second day. It became a habit for me to keep on going for walks throughout the forest later on in life, but that changed a couple of months ago. I usually went on walks with music on during the daytime, but one night, during the full moon and a clear sky, I felt a little brave and bored at the same time, and decided to go for a stroll. I grabbed a flashlight just in case, and my phone before I headed out. Halfway through my usual route, I was feeling happy and enjoyed my music until I came across a little bridge that led to the forest. One of my songs faded out, but before the next one could play, I heard the most blood-curdling scream I'd ever heard in my entire life. I took off my headphones, thinking that maybe a boar or another forest critter stepped into a trap, since that happens from time to time here. But once I took a step closer half over the bridge, I heard it again, this time closer. I turned on my flashlight and saw among the trees next to the entry path a snow white, skinny as hell, pitched black eyed face staring straight at me. I've never felt this horrified in my entire life. My insides told me that if I were to take another step, I'd be dead. 
I didn't care for what was to happen, as I turned around and ran in the other direction, and went straight home, with a constant feeling of dread in my neck. Ever since then, whenever I am home alone, I feel watched and uneasy. On several occasions, I have even heard footsteps outside on our porch, and garden chairs pushed around. I have no clue what I've seen, or what to do about it. Any explanation on what the hell that thing that was hunting me was, will certainly be appreciated. My family moved from the Maryland Mountains to West Palm Beach, Florida, when I was seven. Waterbeds were trendy at the time, so everyone in the house had one. On a few occasions, I would wake up to this odd smell in the air. I couldn't put my finger on how to describe it as a kid, so my folks didn't think much of it, and said it was the plastic waterbeds I was smelling. One night in particular sticks out in my mind, where I woke up to that weird odour, but there was someone with me. I thought it was my dad, because he told me he would be in to check on me. When I rolled over to look, I was caught completely off guard by snake people. Three of them. Their faces looked like a snake-human hybrid, and they had big, slitted eyes. I doubt they were more than three and a half feet tall, and they were watching me. I was frozen in fear staring back at them, while my waterbed sloshed from me rolling over. Next thing I know, it's morning, and I'm eating breakfast. Years later, my mother and I are out taking a walk. It looks like it's going to storm any minute, and there's a strong smell of ozone in the air. She looks at me and says, that's the same smell from when the aliens took you. And she tells me about when we first moved to Florida. Three little lizard men took me to a saucer in our yard. She wanted to stop them at first, but they convinced her I would be okay and wouldn't remember anything. So she went back to her bedroom and watched the saucer go into the sky from the window, leaving that strong ozone smell. After that, she went back to bed and apparently never thought to tell me until I was 30. Now, every time I smell a storm coming, I get the willies. I live in the country, and usually love it. I'm a big Pokemon fan, and have been for a long time. Last summer, I was playing a lot of Pokemon Go. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's a mobile game that requires you to walk in the real world to catch Pokemon. Post offices and town offices are usually places where you can get new items. Well, I had been busy one day and didn't get a chance to go out and play. It was dark before I had a chance. I decided to go ahead and go for a little walk. It is about a mile round trip to the post office, and I've done it before and felt pretty safe about doing it again as it's a very safe neighbourhood. I grabbed my phone and headed out. It's a heavily wooded area with a few houses and fields. I had just passed the neighbour's house when I heard it. There was a shuffling in the woods near me. I quickly got to the other side of the street. Deer were pretty common here, and I didn't want one to jump out and run into me. I expected a deer to run out and cross the road, but none came and the noise got louder. I raised my phone up to see if I could use the light to see what it was. The light, however, was far too weak to illuminate everything, and I started walking quicker, and I thought it would just go away. I reached my neighbour's house that has rather overgrown fields, and could see the top of the grass move as whatever it was moved through it, but I still couldn't see it. Whatever it was stopped making noise. I reached the post office and checked into my game. Playing helped me relax, and I forgot about what had scared me. Then I turned and headed home. As I passed my neighbour's house within the long grass, 
I heard the movement again. It had waited for me. Mind you, I was at the post office for about 20 minutes because there was a lot to do on my game. And as I walked along, I kept my eyes on my feet and did not dare look into the woods. It was clear that whatever was there wasn't going to hurt me. It would have done so already, and I didn't want to risk seeing it. I was terrified, and I could hear it crashing about the woods. I thought about calling my husband to come get me, but part of me was scared to make a noise. What if my silence was the only thing that had kept this thing from attacking me? Finally, I reached a neighbor's house that had a big open yard. Whatever was following me stopped making noise, and it seemed like it was going away. I quickly rushed the short distance home and was shaking. I don't know what it was that followed me, and part of me doesn't ever want to know. My husband thinks it's just a curious bear or a coyote. That doesn't really make me feel any better. Before I was born, my mum would dream about aliens. More specifically, she would usually dream about the spaceships. After I was born, my mum started to dream that the aliens wanted to take me. She would always be upset in the dream, but apparently the people around her would tell her it's okay, she has to go. Fast forward a few years and I'm around 12. My mum wakes up in the middle of the night, feeling like she can't go back to sleep. She goes to the window and stares out of it. I wasn't there, so I can't corroborate this. But she says she saw a light in the sky, zip from side to side, making no noise. Then it hovered over the house across the street for a while. Supposedly, it was there long enough for her to wake up my stepdad, so he could come and look. He admitted seeing it at the time, but didn't want to talk about it later. He was very no-nonsense, very skeptical. Anyway, it eventually shot up and out of sight. Maybe this is nothing, who knows? So then a few years later, I have the first alien-related dream that I can vividly remember. I was at my grandpa's house in this clearing, staring up at the night sky, waiting for something. Then the sky turns purple, and a massive spaceship comes over the clearing. It's all black, with light coming from windows around the sides of it. I run to my car and the dream ends. Maybe a year after that, I wake up and there were two perfectly cut triangles in my sheets. These were brand new flannel sheets I had been given at Christmas. I still keep that sheet because it freaks me out. Maybe there was a flaw in the fabric from the beginning and it just ripped. It felt odd though, especially when I learned that many people report triangular body marks after an abduction. Then the strangest dream happens. I was about 19 or 20 years old. I was walking downtown when all of a sudden I was lifted into the air and my body starts to vibrate violently, kind of like a cartoon character. When they get electrocuted, I flew through the air like this for a while and then I was dropped off back at my porch. I was yelling but no sound came out and then I looked down at my hand and there was a piece of metal and some wires sticking out. So I ripped it out of my hand and the dream ended. Although there was no specific alien contact in the dreams, I woke up thinking, my goodness, aliens. It felt so real. It was as if I was conscious through the dream. The last odd occurrence was three years ago. My mum started dating a guy and they were talking and one night he said, I think I know what one of your fears is. And my mum was like, okay. And he said, you're afraid your daughter will be abducted by aliens. So my mum is obviously shaken. And he says to not be afraid that they always bring her back. Don't they? My mum still to this day has not shared the whole conversation with me. It was our second year in our new house in the suburbs, specifically in the Philippines, Cagayan de Oro City. I was eight years old when I first discovered that the thing I thought just exists in stories 
was actually true, and I experienced it. It was a Sunday afternoon when we were told to get our butts moving because we were going to go to the mall. I was excited and happy that after a long weekend, I could go to spend a day at the mall playing at the arcade. So normally I would get too excited and active. I took a shower and was so loud and noisy and little did I know stuff was about to hit the fan. I was asking my babysitter if she saw where my shirt was and she pointed it out to my left side. And when I tried to look towards where my shirt was, my head slowly tilted to the right. I didn't bother it at first and naturally I tried to move my head straight, but to my inconvenience, a very sharp pain took my neck, slowly and slowly. I couldn't do anything but tilt my head to the right. I shouted to everyone in the house for help and my babysitter rushed to me. At first she thought I was joking till she realized that I was in pain. So what we did was go to my grandma's sister to check on me and she replied, Itim na duende. She was annoyed by my antics, that I was too noisy, so slapping me was enough to make me realize my rudeness. A duende is a dwarf-like creature in Filipino folklore. From what I remember, there are two types of them, the ones that are mostly good and the evil types. And to my stupid luck, I pissed off one of the bad ones. After we visited my grandmother's sister, we eventually went into the mall. I ate KFC, and I specifically remember what I ate. It was spaghetti. I think they only served that in the Philippines, by the way. After that, we went home. A few days later, I can tilt my head a bit further to the other side and look like a normal person again. My mum heard what happened to me and told my babysitter to offer a black native chicken as a peace offering for my misdeeds. Then the day after, I was back to normal. After the encounter, we let our house be blessed by a Magnamont, a witch doctor, but specialising in healing instead of hurting. And nothing bad paranormal ever happened there again. Around 5pm on the west coast of Sweden today, with it being pitch black outside, me and my dad went for a walk in a forest about 10 minutes from civilization, without any lights, trails without street lights and no flashlights. We saw the trail fairly clearly, and we would often take walks together as we were talking about fairly mundane stuff. We were right next to a lake, and we noticed a big group of maybe 50 ducks just chilling in the water close to the beach. Out of nowhere, maybe 25 meters in front of us, a creature ran across the trail from right to left and continued down towards the lake. It quickly disappeared out of sight. I'd say it must have been about at least 150 centimetres tall on all fours, although the front legs looked a lot bigger than the hind legs. Like a bipedal creature running on all fours, it was beige or brown and running really fast. It made no noise except the sound of running and all the ducks in the lake freaked out and started flying and screaming. Which feels like weird behaviour if it was just a deer running past, although I'm no wildlife expert. Just after the creature ran past, a very heavy smell of iron and blood permeated the air, and both of us could smell it. I've never experienced a smell like that before, and I work in a hospital and deal with blood often. Personally, I'm fascinated by these kind of events and definitely believe in different possibilities, but my dad's a hardcore skeptic and realist. He grew up on a farm in the middle of Sweden's forests and is very familiar with Swedish wildlife. He said he'd never seen that shape before or anything go that fast. We don't have many big mammals here at all. The closest possibility is a deer but they usually never come out that close to people, and have never seen one move that fast. And all their legs are roughly the same size, of course. Not like this one, that seemed to have a significantly larger upper body. Part of me thinks it could be a goat man. 
if not, another kind of humanoid. All thoughts are welcome, and I'm still shocked by the events we witnessed. My mum, my sister-in-law and I are all lying on the ground, watching the Perseids meteor shower. I see a plane in the sky, only its lights aren't blinking like they normally would in a plane. Hey guys, I think that might actually be a satellite. And since this is the age of technology and instant answers, my mum pulls out her smartphone, looks up a list of visible satellites passing over our location that night, and it turns out that plane is actually the International Space Station reflecting sunlight back at us, which is totally wicked cool. And there's supposed to be another satellite passing over in about an hour or something. So I'm like, hell yeah, let's find it. But not in so many words since, you know, I'm talking to my mum. Anyway, we continue to watch the meteor shower for the next 15 minutes or whatever. And while keeping an eye out for this next satellite to make its sluggish way across the sky, it hasn't even been a half hour yet, when I swear I see another non-blinking plane-like object in the sky in the general direction of the magic satellite chart. So we're like, okay, maybe it's ahead of schedule, cool. And we're all standing up walking around to get a better view. Because, you know, trees and whatnot. And all three of us are staring intently at this satellite, probably not even blinking. When it starts getting bigger, and the sudden realization hits us that it's not getting bigger, it's getting closer. Like, holy hell, it's gonna crash and we're all gonna die. I've never burnt those stupid notebooks from seventh grade. That's gonna be my only legacy. I'm about to ditch my family and book it the hell out of there. My sister-in-law, who is scared out of her mind of stuff like this and anything that's out of her control, is running in circles like in the cartoons. All the while, my mum just starts standing there, chill as hell, when this thing changes its mind and turns the hell around and starts moving away from us and slowly starts to disappear. Minutes later, we saw the satellite we were originally looking for come in from one of the edges of the horizon and disappear over the other. I don't know what the hell that first thing was, but it didn't move fast and direct like a meteor, and it didn't blink or emit noises like a plane. My mum's convinced it was some kind of test flight of a military aircraft, since there's a military camp nearby, and I'm inclined to agree with her, but my sister-in-law swears she felt the air get hot as it moved closer. I did too, and I just chalk it up to adrenaline. Back in high school, my friends and I would always go to one of our friends' houses that was on the outskirts of farmland slash Amish country. The rest of us lived closer to town, and we always left at the late hours of the night. One night at around 1am, I was driving my friend home. While I was driving, my friend was chatting with me about life. When we drove up a hill. When we got to the bottom of the hill, my headlights illuminated this weird white figure on the side of the road. From what I remember, it was big enough to not be mistaken for an animal. And it looked as white as snow. It was a weird humanish figure. And in the few seconds I saw it, it twitched and moved strangely. As we drove past it, my friend and I both stopped talking and remained silent for a few seconds when I asked him if he saw what I saw. Now my friend thinks the supernatural and bizarre are all total bollocks. He hates scary stuff like stories, and he thinks it's all fake, which is reasonable. But having my friend say that he saw the same thing and not knowing what he saw, scared me. The rest of the night went fine, but we did have trouble sleeping that night, trying to figure out what it was we saw. To this day, we still don't know what it was. It freaks me right out. So this happened about two years ago now. I was biking on the Panhandle Trail and this specific instance was just across the Pennsylvania-West Virginia border 
on the West Virginia side. I had been biking since morning and stopped for water. I had just crossed the border and after a few more miles decided to turn back. As I was riding, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something off, so I stopped to look. About 40 yards off the trail, up fairly high on a tree, there was this thing. The only way I can describe it is that it looked like a four or five foot tall owl, but still a bit off from that. Slightly more humanoid, actually, which is what made me think to tell you guys about it. It was sitting in this tree facing me, kind of bobbing its head up and down, almost as if it was sizing me up. Perhaps that's just my mind getting to me more. I'd thought that it's probably just a tarp or trash bag or something stuck in the tree, but the branch it was on was very thick. I'd say at least six to seven inches in diameter. And the branch was swaying along with these head bobs. It was very dark in color. The only thing I could really make out for more than a silhouette was the face was darker, black, than the brown gray that made up the rest of it. It didn't freak me out too much because I assumed it was totally something explainable but it certainly unsettled me enough to get me on a fast pace back home, especially as the area of the trail that I was on was very remote as far as I could tell. Like I said, I'm sure this could be explained away somehow. I don't really believe in these sort of things at all, but man, that experience has stuck with me. And that being said, not that you guys have any reason to believe some dude on the internet. This is 100% true. And I tried to give all the details I could. I hope you find it as cool as I have for the last few years. I love freaking people out with this story. What I am about to share is something that occurred to me when I was young, around seven. I'm 21 now and I still have no idea what I saw. Me and my mum stayed in my uncle's house when we went to Mexico, and during the daytime, it was nothing close to scary. The room we stayed in had a window that covered the entire back wall, so when we opened the curtains, we had a clear view of the road and the woods behind the house. It was around 10pm when I was in bed ready to go to sleep. Suddenly I had the urge to look out the window. I looked up and back out the window because obviously I was laying down so my head was tilted. I saw five lights, all different colors circling the neighbor's house and the woods behind us. In Mexico, there are what my mum called witches or lechuzas, but I don't think that's what they were. I also don't think it was aliens or a UFO. They all had their own motion and speed. They weren't synchronized. I woke up my mum and she saw them as well. She told me to go close the curtains and ignore it. Well, when she was asleep, I decided to get up and open the door, which was on the opposite side of the window facing the front of the house. As soon as I opened it, I saw another light. It was right in front of me. It was not close, but it was straight ahead and appeared to be hovering only a few feet above the ground. It was glowing a yellowish orange. I closed the door, of course, scared as hell, and I stared at it from behind the door. I stayed there for a solid five minutes, and then the light slowly dimmed out. I have no clue what I experienced that night. Has anyone else gone through something similar? What was it that I saw? Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we have a very special video, extra long, featuring the amazing talents of Raven Reads. When you're done here, please be sure to go over to check out her channel. The video in question which we'd like you to watch is all about sleep paralysis, and I'm sure that you will all very much enjoy it. But without further ado, 
it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My brother and I were camping outside of Wasp at the foothills of the Appalachians. Me, him, and two dogs were sitting around a fire at 2am. A rock the size of a basketball came hurling off the top of the rock face that was around 50 feet up in an arch that landed just short of our fire. We thought maybe it had just rolled from higher up and got some speed. But then we heard growling, not like a mountain lion or a bear, much deeper. Our dogs, who were very quiet hunting dogs, began growling with their legs between their tails. We noped right into the tent and got our rifles, because something that can hurl a rock obviously cares about bullets. Another time, my uncle and I were hunting in South Alabama in a giant old pine tree orchard. We stumbled around 15 deer carcasses up in the top of the trees. We just summed it up to poachers and went on our way. Once we were in the deer stand, we heard screaming like a woman, but it was so guttural it made my skin crawl. And was for the first time in my life, I saw fear in that man's eyes. He looked at me in the face and said, screw this, and started packing up our gear. Later on, one of his good friends, a full Native American, explained that it was the sound of a wendigo. I don't know if he was screwing with us or not, but I've never heard a sound like that before, and it took me a couple of years to go back into the woods before or after daylight again. Halloween night of 2014. I was coming home from a party at about midnight-ish to my parents' house. The house sits back about 15 to 20 feet from the road where I had to park. Parents are out cold by the time I got there, so the house is completely dark. As I lock up the car and start making my way towards the front door and very open yard, with few bushes and one large evergreen tree on the left side between the neighboring yard. I notice a tall, seven to eight foot, white slash blue, hazy figure, standing behind the trunk of the evergreen. It appeared to be almost peering out from behind it, somewhat human in form and featureless, except with the exception of its very long arms legs, and fingers. Thinking it's the neighbor's Halloween deco, I pause for a moment to study it, when I notice its head cock from one side very rapidly, as if it were studying me. Stunned, I freeze, keys in hand, as I'm watching this thing take three large strides and run behind the house, which is about ten feet from the tree. The way it moved is what gets to me. It was like someone pulling back a rubber band and snapping it into hyperspace. Mind blown. No trace of it after that. Though I felt watched and fearful of any windows in the house for the rest of the night. When I was about 11, I was living with my grandmother. My bed was in the corner of my room, with the long side against the wall, and right up against the window. I slept with my head towards the wall, and I was usually turning towards the wall with the window. This window was a weird size, and didn't have any blinds, just curtains. The curtains hung in front of the window, so there was a small gap towards the side of the window where you could see into or out of my room if you were standing at the right angle. I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep when I turned my eyes towards the window and saw something standing there looking right at me. It was just a silhouette, but something about the way it was shaped just felt wrong. 
The head was large, the body was a little too skinny, and the way it was bent over just didn't feel right at all. I tried to act like I was asleep, and rolled over ever so slightly to try and get a better look, but it stood back up and ran away. It was tall, at least six foot. I hopped out of bed and ran into the living room where my grandmother was watching the 10 o'clock news. I told her I'd seen someone looking into my window. She grabbed a flashlight and ran out. I followed her and we looked around trying to figure out what it was. We couldn't see anything at all. And after that night, we set the curtains further back so they completely blocked out the window. I just want to know what we've experienced and what it could mean. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area, main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach, and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach. Which was weird, because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette moving very fast. It finally disappeared over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost? Some insanely efficient Olympic track runner? I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it, and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really, really weird. Most newspapers, you know, published strong, solid facts, for the most part. While I was out in Mexico, I was reading a newspaper, and as I got to a few pages in, did I read something shocking. This newspaper had published a paranormal account of a woman. Allegedly, she and her family were living in a house that her father owned many years ago. There was a well in the house, and it was well known folklore that in that well, there resided creatures, fae, dwarves, call them what you will, but they lived there. So as the story goes, one day, for whatever reason, a member of the family disturbed the well, and since then, terrible happenings happened to the family. Stuff would go missing, children would get sick, animals would become terrified of going outside and misbehave, and generally people were not having a good time. Hearing disembodied voices and having night terrors 
waking up screaming in the middle of the night. When her father came over to inspect the family, he realised that the well had been disturbed and that the creatures were coming out. This was terrible. By disturbing these ancient creatures, they had summoned havoc into their household, and it wouldn't stop until the creatures were appeased. So they got together an offering, put it at the base of the well, and fixed the disturbance. And within a day or so, everything stopped, and the family went back to normal. Now this, of course, is an interesting experience to say the least. But the greater picture in question is the fact that it was published in a newspaper with an accompanying image of the well. Does this mean that folklore plays a greater part in some parts of the world and things that people often dismiss as lies in other countries and cultures are considered and simply well known as true and out of our knowledge? I was about nine or ten. It was late at night, and my bed was right under the window. I was just gazing out looking up at the sky, when I saw what appeared to be an unidentified flying object. It was a white orb, rather large, and it shot straight into my line of vision, then moved in a few circles, then shot away. It came back and did the same thing. Only it was closer, and larger, and made no sound. I immediately got creeped out, and walked from my room around the corner, and was about to walk into my mum's room, but the door was locked. Her door was facing the stairs, which went down to the living room slash kitchen. Suddenly I heard someone coming up the stairs, and a snorting sound. I looked down and saw this tall, slender figure walking up the stairs straight at me. I remember saying, Dad? But then I saw that it was something inhuman. I immediately froze in fear. The creature, or whatever it was, was tall, slender, had two slits for a nose, large, black eyes, and got right up into my face continuing to make that awful snorting sound. Kind of like the sound a pig makes. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I just collapsed as it towered over me and bent down, pushing its face right into mine. Finally, I blacked out. The next thing I knew, I was being awoken by my mum at the bottom of the stairs. She asked me how I got there and I said I must have sleepwalked. I'll never forget that face, and that snorting sound. I think I'll die of a heart attack, if I ever see it again. For a few weeks now, my husband and I have been hearing these bizarre animalistic noises from our window. Two nights ago, I decided to film and investigate. I had the creepiest feeling, like I could feel eyes on me the entire time. My heart was racing, and my flashlight kept dimming down and brightening back up. All of that was enough to send me back inside. It wasn't until after I reviewed the footage that I saw it. I don't know for sure what it was, but I know it wasn't a bear or coyote, as they aren't even found where I live. All I know is that it was not alone in my yard, and that was scary as hell. Also, our other neighbour next door, as their house is not seen on video, just moved in and have called the police three times in as many weeks for damage done to their yard, including a large bush being ripped up. For us, Mainly, we've been having our yard ornaments strewn about, including a cement turtle that weighs nearly 60 pounds. This all started around the time we began to hear noises. The neighbouring white house, seen in the video, actually had a break-in recently. 
but I'm not 100% sure which of these events are connected to the video, if any. You'll be able to find the video in the description. My mum hates camping. So my dad always took me and my two sisters for a few days camping in the woods. It's a tradition that his father passed down to him and he wanted us girls to carry it on too. We always went to the same woods, but there's something that happened that made us stop going. One summer, we were walking through the woods. We had deviated off the path to find somewhere a bit more private, as every year we tried to go somewhere we hadn't been before. We had been walking on the path for maybe half an hour, and it was still very bright with the sun high in the sky. That's when we heard something, rustling. At first we sort of dismissed it, but then the rustling grew loud very quickly. All four of us turn around, and this huge bipedal creature that must have been about 10 foot tall, I don't know, it was just running really fast, runs straight towards us. No reaction time, just pure fear. I felt like I was going to die, going to be trampled by whatever this thing was. This creature ran straight past us, and I swear I could smell it and feel the hair brush past me as it made its way across the forest. I followed it with my eyes, but within an instant, it was gone again. My father said nothing. We turned around and got our little butts back home. We didn't talk about it much. My father has never taken us to the woods again, and I don't blame him. I grew up in an old house in the south, kind of in the middle of nowhere. The house was laid out somewhat circular, as you could walk from the living room through most other rooms just by walking in a complete circle, and end up back where you started. When I was around five, me and my younger sister were chasing each other in circles while my mum cooked dinner. I was in front of her and we were laughing and carrying on. When we got into the dining room, in the inside corner, there was a small greenish creature with a dark cloak on. It had pointy ears that stuck out and sharp teeth. I was young, but it was still very small so perhaps two feet. It looked kind of like it had been at the bottom of a pond, very old and tattered. It put its finger up to its lips and was grinning. I slammed to a stop, and my sister was chasing so close that she ran right into me, which pushed us both into the corner, into the kitchen. We both started screaming, and my mum ran to us to see what was the matter but the thing had gone. This has haunted me for years. I'm 25 now, and although I've done tons of research, I've never found anything that really fits what we saw. For a long time, I thought maybe I'd imagined it, if it weren't for my sister also seeing it, or my mum remembering our very real terror, I probably would have just written it off. Are there any ideas that you guys have of what this could be? There were lots of weird things happening in the house when I was young. Disembodied voices, things moving, very strange dreams. But that was obviously the weirdest and most unsettling. We still kind of talk about it from time to time, and it always makes us feel kind of yucky. It was back in about fourth grade. I couldn't have been older than eight or nine. I lived in the country near a small Minnesotan town called Iyota, and it was pretty out there in the middle of nowhere. At about 6.50 in the morning, I got on the bus like I would any other day to head to school. I had an hour long morning ride and an hour long evening ride. About three quarters of the way there, we went down a side street. A kid named Jacob lived there and there were about three houses in total down the street. 
in between the houses were open fields. As Jacob was picked up, I looked on the opposing side of the road and saw three figures like I had never seen before next to a white house. They were black, long, lanky. They looked almost like panthers, but distorted in some way. They were much bigger than panthers, and their faces were almost pointed at the bottom. They looked almost reptilian. It was difficult to see details in the morning fog. They crawled on all fours, and one of them looked to be a bit smaller than the other two. One of the big ones walked ahead a little bit, and waited for the other two to catch up. They disappeared behind the house, and I scrambled for my little blackberry hoping to catch a picture. But as we moved away from the house, there was no sight of them. I thought about what I had just seen, and didn't particularly know what to think. I told my friend Erica about it, and she didn't flat out tell me she thought I was lying, but I could feel it. The house is now gone. It must have been demolished, and it was fairly old and looked to be in fairly bad shape when the incident occurred. Though I am not, and I've never really been religious, I did have a fair amount of strange occurrences happen in my childhood, this being one of the biggest. For the past seven years or so, I have pushed it to the back of my mind, but every now and then it will come up. As I was listening to a podcast mentioning skinwalkers, I thought of this experience, and thought I would share it with you guys for help. If anybody has any clues as to what this could be, please do let me know. I was visiting my cousin's house. I have four cousins, two twin girls aged 10, and then the older brother aged 21, and other older brother aged 26. I was sleeping in the room with the cousin of my age, 21. We heard things falling in the girl's room, right next to where we were. We assumed it was just them playing, but one of them started talking to the other, and they were across the room. So my cousin stepped out of the room to go check, and I watched over his shoulders through the doorway. Right as the girls were explaining that stuff was falling without provocation, a sort of humanoid type thing came bursting out the closet. It looked humanesque, but was much longer and thinner, and ran on all four legs. It ran out the house, broke the front door hinge, and straight through the screen door. We called the police immediately, and they were there within five minutes. They looked in a five mile radius and nothing was found. They gathered DNA from the door, as apparently the thing was cut by shattering wood on the door, as there was still a small amount of blood on it. They ran tests, and it was determined to be inconclusive. They said it was similar to human DNA, but not in the way ape DNA is similar. It wasn't a human though, they knew that much. So to this day, we have had no incidents with whatever this thing is. They still live in the house, have no problems, but we have zero explanation for what happened, and what the thing was, and how it got into the house. Years ago, when I was 13 years old, I went on a trip to celebrate Easter with my mum's family. It was a tradition for us to go have a picnic in the middle of a big field, 40 minutes from my grandma's house. The field is basically in the middle of nowhere in rural Mexico. That day, my cousins and I got very curious about a small hill we could see from the field. It always caught our attention because it looks like a giant took a big bite out of it. I know it used to work as a rock mine several years prior. And anyway, we decided to go investigate and left the picnic. We walked for 20 minutes until we crossed a road and went up a hill. Once there, we started looking for a way to trespass a metallic fence that kept us from going into the actual mine and eventually we found a hole in it. My cousin was recording with her cell phone as we were making jokes 
and acting like normal cringy teenagers. When suddenly she froze and whispered, Hey, there's something in the rocks. And she pointed her camera to the rock wall behind us. At first I thought she was joking, but something about her expression seemed off. So I turned back and there was a human dog-like hybrid looking at us from a hole in the rocks, about 20 to 30 meters above the ground. It had pink, pale and wrinkly skin and a long snout and long ears, white eyes and hands with long fingernails. It had no hair and it kept still just watching us. After what felt like an eternity, the weird creature finally went into the hole again and we started running back to the picnic spot. We showed the video to our family right after being scolded for going so far without saying anything to anyone, but you could barely see anything on the video. After all these years, I still don't know what that thing was, and I get goosebumps when I think about it. The mother of my best friend had a brother working on that mine in the 70s or so, and she claims that he and other workers died there, but the families never got the bodies back. Apparently rocks collapsed multiple times killing the people working and making it very difficult to retrieve the corpses. Well, that's what the owners of the mine said to all the families involved. After a few incidents, they decided to close the mine for good. My encounter with the Fae. This story is one of my first memories. It takes place either shortly before or shortly after my third birthday. That would be the last week in June 1980. My mum and I went to West Virginia to celebrate my birthday with her side of the family. We were living in Aberdeen, Maryland at the time, so it wasn't too long of a trip. My mum's family lives in the small town of Shady Springs in Raleigh country. Shady Springs is nestled in the lush forest of the Irish mountains. One day, my cousin Leonard, who at the time was known as Eugene, decided that he would take me into the woods. I remember he had a rifle on his back, so I'm assuming he was hunting something. Raccoon or squirrel. Now, why my mum or the rest of the family allowed Leonard to take a three-year-old into the woods is beyond my comprehension. But I guess it's a different era. So Leonard took me into the woods, and we walked around for a while. I remembered being in awe of how massive it all seemed. Then again, everything seems larger to a three-year-old. I don't know how long we walked for, since children have a scrawny sense of time, but apparently I became tired or became a nuisance. My cousin Leonard decided to leave me sitting on a log while he continued wandering the woods. Really? You're gonna leave a three-year-old alone in the woods when there are bears and snakes? Leonard, before this, used to torment me with stories about bears, which could explain my little fear about bears. So, Leonard left me alone in the woods. While I sat there for what felt like hours, I was starting to become afraid of the animal noises that were coming from deeper in the woods, and that just seemed to be getting closer. I had no idea how to get back to my grandparents' house, and I was just about to start crying when I looked over at a tree that was about 30 feet away. At the foot of the tree were some little men. I'm not talking dwarfs, more like the size of a squirrel. These men were sitting around the base of a tree and smoking pipes. They wore red hats and had beards. They were looking right at me. They must have realized I was frightened over the whole experience. They smiled and all pointed in one direction. I don't know why, but I decided to follow the direction they were pointing. It felt as if I were walking a very long time, but eventually I returned to my grandparents' house. I started yelling for my mum. She came outside and was shocked to see that I had come home without my cousin. She asked where he was, and I told her that he had left me alone in the woods. Needless to say, he heard about that from my mum, my grandparents and his mother. It wasn't until years later that I told her about the little men who had pointed my way out of the woods. It wasn't until much later, when researching fairies, that I discovered that I was helped by gnomes, or some similar species to the gnome family. 
I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I now know I used to see as a child, when I was around seven or so. A gnome. It wouldn't even have been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up to my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard, a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the window sill outside. I'd sometimes see him in his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. Parents obviously always brushed it off as the silly nonsense kids come out with when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly. Ah, oh, you never did. Never pay any attention to them. Why would they? I even remember my father saying something to my mum like, we don't even have a garden though. And she responded that it was just an active imagination. I lived there till I was 18 or 19. I don't even think anyone in our street owned a garden gnome at all. He never even looked at me, like he didn't even know I was watching, or perhaps he didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I've never spoken to it with anyone, but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked my mum, she still remembers me talking about it when I was little. I know that most people think that this is probably a load of rubbish, but I promise you it's true. Was he real, or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind? Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff, and on more than one occasion? Has this ever happened to anyone? Just so you know, this happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. One time, I was out in the back with my uncle stargazing. I saw what looked like a shooting star, and I said, look. My uncle turned around and missed it, but we saw something else. It was a dark, dim, red, kind of ellipsed shape object. It moved across the sky at a slightly faster than airplane speed, but slower than a shooting star. At this point, it looked to me like a floating amber. I expected it to fall. It went about halfway across the sky and stopped completely for a whole second, maybe two, and then moved at a right angle to the right, twirled around a bit and shot across the sky to the left. It went really, really fast. As it reached the other side of the sky, my eyes began to lose focus. I can't see it anymore, I said. My uncle, who had been following it with me all this time, pointed to it further down. I acknowledged it and pointed to it further up. It was doing a loop-de-loop -loop and twists and turns all over that little part of the sky, and then faded away. I would have thought I imagined it had my uncle not been there. He was not just going along with me, because at times he pointed it out, and that's where I saw it. We have ruled out meteorite, shooting stars, planes and birds and such, because they don't come to a dead stop, don't turn so easily at an angle, don't fly erratically, and don't fly at that speed. It was a UFO. Alien or not, it was weird. Later that night, I heard what sounded like a plane flying low over my house. But it sounded unfamiliar, more high-pitched than a usual jet. I looked out and saw lights, but it was a row of red and green and white in a vertical line flying away from me ahead of my house. In my mind, it resembled an aircraft carrier at sea. But they don't fly, right? Especially not where I live. While I believe in life elsewhere, I don't believe they would pay us visits anytime soon. If anyone could offer any explanation, I would appreciate it. I was about nine or ten. It was late at night, and my bed was right under the window. I was just gazing out looking up at the sky, when I saw what looked like a UFO. It was a white orb, rather large, and it shot straight into my line of vision, then moved in a few circles and shot away. It came back, and did the same thing, only it was closer and larger, 
and made no sound. I immediately got creeped out and walked from my room, around the corner, and was about to walk into my mum's room, but the door was locked. Her door was facing the stairs, which went down to the living room slash kitchen. Suddenly, I heard someone coming up the stairs, and a snorting sound. I looked down, and all I saw was this tall, slender figure walking up the stairs straight at me. I remember saying, Dad? But then I saw that it was something inhuman. I immediately froze in fear. The creature, or whatever it was, was tall, slender, had two slits for a nose, large black eyes, and got right up into my face, continuing to make that awful snorting sound. Kind of like a pig. I couldn't scream. I couldn't move. I just collapsed as it towered over me, and bent down, pushing its face right into mine. Finally, I blacked out. The next thing I knew, I was being awoken by my mum at the bottom of the stairs. She asked me how I got there, and I said that I must have sleepwalked. I'll never forget that face, and that snorting sound. And I think I'll die of a heart attack, if I ever see it again. I've never shared this story with anyone, besides the people that were with me that night, and my best friend that claims to have seen him at a different date that I didn't know about until I described my experience to him. I lived in a small town called Bastrop in Louisiana with my cousin and his wife. There's not much to do in Morehouse Parish besides drive back roads like we've done thousands of times before. Then one night, in 2015, we were leaving a church that we used to clean at around 2am or so. We were in my cousin's 1990 GMC Sierra single cab 4x4. We decided to ride back roads. So as we're cruising, we're talking and listening to Nirvana. But anyway, his wife was asleep in the middle seat when we turned onto a paved road, five miles or so outside of town, and come around a curb. And there it was, something we'd never seen before. I'm an avid hunter and had been in the woods all hours of the day and night. I was also in the army, but had never been more freaked out by something than what I had witnessed. There was something dead in the road, and something was eating it when the headlights hit it. It looked up, and was about two and a half to three feet tall, like it was kneeling over whatever it was eating. It had red eyes, and stood up so fast it seemed like a millisecond. It was about seven to eight feet tall, pitch black, and its skin looked like a bat skin, but was darker, and in one fell swoop, it leapt, and its wings opened up and flew into the woods on the side of the road, that it had been moving over at 50 miles an hour. It was the wildest experience of my life, and I've always been cynical when it comes to the paranormal, but I know what I saw that night, and so does my cousin. It was a very beautiful night in Panama City Beach. The stars were out, crisp and clear, about 50 degrees outside, very calm, no real breeze, and absolutely gorgeous. Not desolate, but not crowded either. It was literally the perfect night. I was at Pier Park, which is a big shopping area main street kind of thing, with a pier at the end of it, on the beach. I walked out a little ways onto the boardwalk that takes you to the beach, and noticed what I thought was someone jogging on the beach. Which was weird, 
because joggers pretty much always have a headlamp or flashlight, if they are out this late. Whatever this thing was, didn't. About the time I noticed they were going really fast to be a jogger, or a runner, or Usain Bolt for that matter. They were right near the water's edge, going what had to be at least 30. Their legs weren't moving. It was just this strange silhouette, moving very fast. It finally disappeared over one of the sand dunes. I'm very, very skeptical, and usually find stuff like this to be completely absurd. I don't know what it was. Alien? Ghost? Some insanely efficient Olympic track runner? I don't know. Me and my girlfriend both saw it and it creeped us the hell out. It moved in a way that followed the contour of the sand, and was really, really weird. Four or five years ago, my friend and I decided to take her dog on a walk in the bush behind her house. We knew the area quite well. There was a creek which we crossed, and explored into a new area up a hill, and down a few old biking trails. The scenery changed quite suddenly. From the old spruce and pines came new growth of white poplar. It was quite eerie. Looking back on it though, although we didn't share it, it was obvious we were both extremely uneasy. It felt like there were eyes on us, which wouldn't be too strange as we were in a forest. There are tons of animals around. We didn't think much of it when her dog started going nuts, barking and growling. We thought it was just a squirrel, but we realized that that wasn't the case when we turned around. At the end of the trail, perhaps 90 feet away, was some lanky, tall, grey, skinned thing. I don't remember the face. All I know is that it was not an animal I had ever seen before. I know we ran, and I can't remember if it chased us. I don't know when we stopped either. It wasn't following us anymore if it had chased us. We made it home okay, and never spoke of it really after that. I never forgot, and started to believe I had just dreamt it, or made it up in my head. I asked my friend, and she remembered the exact same thing as me minus the face. This happened on the outskirts of Prince George, British Columbia in the fall. Does anyone else have any information about a crawler in that area? I dated a guy in high school whose family was from Norway. When he was 10, his family all went back to Norway in the summertime to stay at his mother's parents' farm. It was a working farm that was also attached to a large forest. David was told that he could go anywhere on the farm that he wanted, and into the forest, up some agreed-upon boundary no further line. Of course, being ten, he disobeyed, and went further into the forest. He was walking along, having found a path, when he started hearing someone yelling in Norwegian. He came around a bend, and found what he described as a gnome. The gnome was about the height of a four-year-old. He was adult, had a full beard, and his clothes looked handmade. He had the typical gnome-type hat. I'm pretty sure he said it was red, but I could be wrong. I do know that his suit was in light browns or greens, pretty much forest colours. The gnome was screaming at David in Norwegian, shaking his fists. David spoke Norwegian at home, but this form of Norwegian he couldn't really understand, although to him it sounded familiar enough for him to think that it was Norwegian. The thing that really had him floored was that the gnome was buried up to his knees in the hard dirt path. He wasn't trying to pull himself out, so David did not think that he was stuck. It seemed to him that that was a normal thing for the gnome. 
David fled the scene and made it back safely to his grandpa's farm. When he got there, he sat down on a bench along the wall to catch his breath. His mum saw him running and came and sat beside him. She said to him, you went too far into the woods, didn't you? He could only nod his head. At the time, he told me this. His mother had never said another word to him about it, and he never asked her about it either. It drove me crazy, and I bugged him to ask her more and more, but he never did. I've tried to find him online, as he has a very odd last name, but I never have. If I do, I'd like to ask him more questions about his mother and the gnomes in the forest by their farm. My dad's uncle and his family live in rural Louisiana, but not too rural in a way. Anyway, both my dad, my brother and I travel there, and I came here when I was younger, so it was nothing new, and I was around 15 at the time. The second day rolls around and it's 4am at night. I begin to start hearing an eerie sound that sounded like a trumpet, but I was too tired, fell back asleep and thought nothing of it. Now the third day is when stuff gets weird. While my dad and uncle went out to buy groceries, it was just me and my brother, and my dad's aunt at the house. So being smart intellectuals, we decide to go off down the woods off a beaten trail until we see a big, ragged white house on the other side of the swamp. It looked fairly abandoned, so we go around the lake and see a bunch of old cars with motors running. We immediately go back and tell my aunt, and she thinks nothing of it. That night, we heard loud screaming and chanting coming from the direction of the house. It starts getting closer and closer, until we see a bunch of hillbillies around our house with lighters and small torches. I'm freaked the hell out and proceed to hide. In Louisiana, hillbillies with torches who tell you to evacuate the area are best listened to. So my aunt does as told, and we think they're gonna loot the house. So my aunt and older brother go up to their supposed leaders of this group of 20 to 30 people and ask what's happening. They claim their son has been taken and transformed into a Rougarou, which is like a werewolf standing up. The next day, their son is found brutally ripped apart, with claw marks and slashes all over his body. Yeah, never again. For context, this is Australia. I was travelling to this campsite about 20 minutes past a small town, and had gotten there about an hour-ish after dark. Now I was the only person there, and when I called the off-site caretaker to book, he said that since it was just me, that I could use the day shelter slash kitchen. So instead of setting up my tent in the dark, I decided to drag my sleeping bag inside where I had some actual light. Hours later, I realised I require something from my car, so I drag open the sliding door, and this wasn't a small door, it was one of those big loud ones like you would see on a barn. I was looking out into the darkness, as there were no lights or moon, just the glow from the lights behind me. Now in case you've never been in a situation like this, when the light reaches about 10 metres, there has to be about one metre where it drops off into nothingness. And in this small patch I saw four legs. These were not just normal legs. They were those of a dog, and long like human legs. They were bright white, and stretched up to where they could connect to the body of the animal. But there was nothing there. Then it began to move. The legs walked. They walked in parallel to the building, making sure that they remained in the grey corridor, then disappeared into the darkness. I decided that I didn't really need to get whatever it was from my car, and slept barricaded in the tiny office. To this day, I don't know what they were, and I have looked into it, nor do I know how long they were there before I saw it. But I do know that the thing was smart enough to know how humans see, and where the Great Corridor was from my viewpoint.
this happened to my parents, and if anyone has any theories on what this could be, I'd love to hear from you. So basically right now, my family is living in the house my dad grew up in. One time, I asked my dad if he had any paranormal experiences, and after a bit of thinking, he remembered this story. When my dad was young, he said he woke up late in the night needing water, so he got up to go to the kitchen to get some. Right as he turned into the entrance of the kitchen, he looked in, and by the toaster he saw a little man of about 12 inches high, peering into the toaster. He described him as looking very old with white hair and a wrinkly face. As soon as the man noticed my dad, he disappeared. Like there one second gone the next. My dad doesn't know how to explain it, other than maybe he imagined it. The next bit makes me think it might not have been his imagination. I asked my mum the same question, if she had any previous paranormal experiences in the house. I kid you not, this is what she said. She said one morning she walked into the kitchen and by the toaster, which was on the other end of the counter from where my dad experienced this. There was a little old man. She said that when she saw him, he laughed and disappeared. My jaw kind of dropped, and I asked her to show me roughly how tall he was, and she motioned 12 inches. At that point, I thought it was a joke, but I told her that my dad had a very similar experience, and she actually looked a little spooked. I asked if she had any knowledge of my dad's experience, and she said no. I then told my dad about it, and he thought I was making it up. They both had never told each other. After this whole thing, I researched about the little people and came across the brownies, which are apparently house fairies. I don't know what to think of them though. About two years ago, as a junior in college, I saw something that is quite inexplicable. It was a Friday night, and like most every other weekend, I was driving to my hometown which was only about a 45 minute trip. It was around midnight when I began to see the general glow of lights from my city as I approached my hometown on the interstate. As I was looking at the glow of my town, three vibrant green lights appeared in the night sky, way out in the distance in front of me and well above the city. These three lights were equidistantly lined up on top of each other and were strangely vivid. All three lights zoomed from about the middle of my field of vision in the car, and then to the left before disappearing. It was only about two or three seconds, but the lights quite obviously covered quite a bit of distance in a very short amount of time. After seeing this short but quite amazing display, I burst out in a fit of obscenities. I've always been a skeptic towards UFOs or anything paranormal and have never looked for anything of the sort. But there was no denying that I had seen something wholly mystifying that night that I will never forget. This wasn't a result of some kids shooting a laser pointer in the sky, and the visual display was certainly not from any nearby buildings. I'm completely positive that it wasn't any sort of commercial aircraft due to the fact of the time and because I was living in rural Arkansas at the time. It's very hard to articulate exactly what I saw that night, and as a result, no one ever shares in my astonishment. It was certainly one of those things where you would have just had to have been there. Oh, and I was definitely not under the influence of any drugs. Figured I should just point that out. When I was in high school, I had a dream one night where I was driving with my parents down an old back road in the middle of the night. A star fell from the sky and landed in an open field where I was overcome with a bright white light. Next thing I remember, I was on a cold, very hard metal table, with two grey humanoid looking creatures standing over me. Here's the thing I remember so vividly. I could see the reflection of the lights in their huge black eyes. The one on my right said something in these click sounds to the humanoid on my left, and they looked at each other. 
They were wearing white lab coats. I was in a huge white room, overhead lighting seeming to come from nowhere. An ear-splitting scream came from my right shoulder. When I turned and looked, there was a woman who looked like she'd just given birth and blood was everywhere. I did not see the child she birthed. There was another humanoid creature in the way. For some reason or another, I don't know if I was told telepathically or if it was just a sense of knowing and understanding, but I knew I was next to give birth. Keep in my mind, I'm a 16 year old virgin from high school. Never even kissed a boy, should not be pregnant in any way, shape or form. I then woke up. Nothing weird about my day. I go to school, but in my last period, I heard this girl telling her friend that last night, she saw a star fall from the sky and explode in a white light. I just about crapped myself right there and then. I still have no explanation. But what happened? When I was six, I was out back in my grandfather's house in the woods, and I had a small dog named Nova. Well, I was an outdoor child and hated playing inside, so I took my dog and went for walks in the woods. My grandfather has a shed right at the tree line. This time I decided to play to the right of the shed, maybe 10 feet away. My dog started growling over, and there was a hole underneath it. So I assumed a groundhog lived there. I ignored him and continued playing. Then I heard a shuffling sound and looked over, and I swear to God I saw two short little dudes with little pointy hats on. I don't remember the colour of their clothes, but they were bright and very noticeable against the light blue shed. They stared at me and stopped moving when I saw them. Then I grabbed Nova and ran back to the house and never saw them again. But ever since I've had a ridiculous irrational fear of gnomes. It's so bad that I wouldn't go into my friend's house one time when I picked him up. I literally waited outside the car because I saw his mum had gnomes out front. It sounds silly, but I am now scared to death of them. This happened to a friend and I a few years ago. My friend and I are both gun enthusiasts, and I had just purchased a new gun and wanted to shoot it. I live at the base of a mountain that borders the Blue Ridge Parkway. I own 17 acres, so shooting in my backyard isn't an issue. We began shooting my new gun, and my friend turns to his right and is immediately shocked and says, Hey man, what's that? When I turned to look, I saw something that sticks with me to this day. It was a red-eyed creature, maybe two feet high with glowing red eyes. I did not get a good vibe from it, and its face was terrifying. Even with a loaded gun in my hand, we approached the creature slowly, and my feeling of terror rose. My friend and I immediately turned around and went inside, and did not speak of it for the rest of the time, like we had forgotten about what happened. My friend called me the next day, and asked me why we had not done anything, and both came to an agreement that this creature had influenced us in some way. If anyone has had any similar experience, please share it. Looks wise, it was about two to three feet tall, scaly grey skin, but I was distracted by the eyes. They penetrated through me, and were so intense. Last night, my fiancé and I saw something so weird. We were driving to Charlotte from Florida. We passed by some town, I think it was York, and we were on the interstate. We noticed something that looked like three street lights, kind of in a triangle form. However, we didn't see the pole. It was in a construction zone, so I expected it to be just random construction stuff. We were driving for maybe five minutes and we never actually got closer to the lights. I was keeping a close eye on them because it had now caught my attention. 
A fast light came from the left of the sky that was kind of smaller, zooming across, and then a 90 degree angle swooped down right in front of the three lights. Then the furthest light on the end suddenly got three times its original size and dissolved. AKA got super small all of a sudden while zooming to the top and right of the sky. The two were still there, but then faded and zooped to the top left of the sky. I can't really understand what I saw, but I swear on my life I've never seen any plane go as fast as they went and the angles that they zoomed at so sharply. About 10 years ago, me and my husband were going spelunking in a remote part of Canada, although I don't want to mention where for privacy's sake. We were using flashlights and descending into the darkness. We had been to this cave before, but we were trying to reach a chamber that we had yet to have got to on previous occasions. As we're making our way down, we hit the ground and start making our way towards where this chamber is. That's when we hear something in the cave. There really shouldn't be anything about, other than a few bats, as we're very deep down, and there shouldn't be any rodents here, not any that could have survived the fall anyway. We try and ignore it, assuming it's still wildlife, and that's when we see something from our headlamps. A creature. Tall, humanoid, grey, just running through the cave. We stand there in shock, and without even saying a word, we run back and haul us out of there as quickly as possible. We never returned to that cave. We told our friends about it, and they said that it could have very well been a hoax. But who the hell would have dressed in grey? stayed in the pitch black just to wait for the opportune time to scare two cavers. It doesn't make any sense to me. I live 25 minutes south of Boston. About six months ago, I saw this insane thing. It was about 3 a.m. I had been up late as I normally am. I stepped outside to smoke a cigarette. It was dark as hell, except for the stars and full moon. As I was smoking, I heard this noise of something flying. I look up and see this winged creature land on my neighbor's roof and just sit there like a gargoyle would. I thought I was seeing stuff or seeing something wrong. But then the creature jumped up and flew away, and I could see its whole body. It was the size of a small human, but massive wings. It reminded me of a gargoyle. I don't know what the hell it was, but it was crazy. If anyone has ever seen anything like this, I'd love to hear your story. I used to have this recurring nightmare about this lizard man type monster who could see what I could see out of my eyes. So I'd run and hide and he wouldn't know where I was. But then as soon as I peeked to see if I was safe, he would know. So I'd have to leave that spot and go find somewhere else and it would happen over and over again. A literal nightmare. But here is the real spooky part. I once mentioned the lizard man to my dad, and he got super white in the face, and his voice was all shaky and just said, This dream took place at our house in East St. Paul, the one with the apartments right behind it. And I said, Yeah, that's where I'd always go and hide. How did you know? And he said, Because I have the exact same dream. And I don't know if it was just the way he said it, or just the overall situation of both, but I still get goosebumps thinking about it. It's quite chilling. 
Let me take you back five months when the whole Storm Area 51 craze was happening. It was on the news and I was sitting there with my grandma. Unbothered, she looks at me and goes, you know, aliens landed on our local beach in the 70s. They keep their ship hidden under the sand. That's why we haven't had a hurricane since. Now listen y'all, my grandma is very old school, conservative, religious, and doesn't even joke around. When she said this, I thought she was joking. But she went back to watching the news like she hadn't said anything. And for context, my aunt is one of my neighbors. Later, when I went to check my mail, I saw my aunt sitting on her lawn and went to tell her what grandma said. Again, unbothered, my aunt goes, yeah, that's true. That's why part of the beach is sectioned off. I thought for sure this was some kind of elaborate prank. But later I saw another neighbor and told them the craziness and they agreed. I looked it up and there were a bunch of news stories from the town claiming that the major reason storms won't hit my area, even though we're in a high risk zone for hurricanes, is because of the aliens protecting their ship. Out back of my own 30 acre property, there is a big grove of eucalyptus trees. I was walking out there to get to the river because me and my friends were going to drink some beer and generally chill by the river. But when we walked by the trees that I've walked by thousands of times before with no weirdness, I thought I saw a little kid peeking out from one of the bigger trees. So, I told my friends to look right there where the kid or whatever it was, was hiding. And about a four foot tall humanoid thing peeked out with its pale white like grayish color. It had a weird head and honestly that's about as descriptive as I could be. As the moment I saw it, my hair stood up and I ran as fast as I could back to my house to grab a gun. We still go past those trees to get to the river, but never do so without firearms. I wish I had not been so scared because I feel like I should have filmed it. My family owns a decent sized horse boarding facility. And when we first had it going, we used to do bed checks as a family. Bed check is just making sure all the lights and fans were off as well as looking at the horses for injuries and if they had blankets during the winter. We had just got back from eating out and it was a moonless night during fall. As we stepped out of the truck, this large light gray mass stood up and took off looping towards our pastures. It was about the size of a single cab pickup truck. It made no noise other than hitting the ground as it ran. The only other proof that it was real to us was the horses that were turned out that night screamed and stamped across the pasture it had jumped into. We did a double count of all the horses that night and not a single one was missing. I still have yet to see it again and I hope I never do or at least that there is some explanation for it. This story has been passed down through my family. They called it the Indian's devil. All I know is that my great, great, great grandfather was courting his wife and had to walk 12 miles up the old island road. The story goes that something jumped out of the trees at him. It had the hands and feet and face of a man at the body of an ape. It followed him for miles, mocking him and then running away. The local Aboriginal people call it a devil and always told their children to stay close or it might snatch them. They knew this thing. So I asked Grampy what happened and he said that my great 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 grandpa was so upset that he took to his bed for four days he then got a bunch of men together and they tracked it down and shot it. I was around seven or eight 
And every morning when I would wake, I would go into my grandma's room and lay in bed with her until she awoke. One morning, I go in and get the blankets and lay down with her. I look over and next to the dresser in front of the closet are two six to eight inch little men. I just stared at them frozen because I was terrified. I finally closed my eyes and hoped they would go away. I opened them up and they were gone. I've always wondered if what I saw was real, but I can picture it so vividly, like I can even remember what they were wearing. One had a red shirt and the other had an orange shirt. I'm 30 now, and to this day, I am profoundly terrified of garden gnomes, like panicky, sweaty, and racing heart kind of scared. Any idea what they could have been, or if I have a good reason to be afraid of them.